Good morning, everyone, uh, both physically and virtually. Um, it's been a, an amazing and tough week. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot to be to be at the conference back together. And uh, I wish you a warm welcome at our workshop, which is called Challenges of Flapping Wing Aerial Ro Robots. Um, it is our belief that uh, that we put together a set of uh, inspirational and uh, top-level speakers today. And uh, first of all, I will, I, will, uh, I will present our team and myself. I am Federico Califano. I am assistant professor at the University of Twente. And I'm uh, organizing this workshop together with, uh, with, uh, with all the people that you see in the slide. Uh, we are, uh, we are a team working in the context of uh, an ERC advanced grant, which is called the Port Wings Project, which uh, was awarded by PI Professor Stefano Stramigioli, which will uh, introduce and present the first talk in a, in a bit. Um, so, as I told you, we put together a, a set of inspirational speakers, which, um, which you can see in this slide. Uh, so I will present the speakers one by one. The talk will, uh, will last for 25 minutes, uh, comprising a Q&A session. Uh, so I, I, I wish, to, I wish to, to start this workshop, and uh, I want to introduce the first speaker, which, uh, as I told you, is Professor Stefano Stramizzoli. So without, uh, without, further, um, without further talk, I wish to, to welcome Stefano. Yes. So, um, thanks first of all to the people that are here also physically present, very greatly great, appreciated. So, I want to, to, to give you an idea of the project. Uh, I will not go in detail, but of course, the whole point of a workshop is to be in contact and have questions. So, I will be more than these later, lunch, or whatever to discuss more detail. So, this is more an overview, a mental overview. I want to start with this citation. Uh, the whole things of nature is something of the marvel. And I think, you know, knowing people here, at least in the audience, I know that you will agree with, with this statement because it's looking people who work on flooding flight is an example of being inspirational from nature. And flooding flight is, has been, you know, we uh, started already from, from look, there is something on the screen. Uh, it's been something <coughs> that Leonardo da Vinci or already did you know, more than. 500 years, and it's something that still inspires people like us. We've been working on a on a on a white bird, which is uh, very important. Has the same size, the same weight, flaps at the same frequency, and I think it's pretty unique in certain features. Like it can fly at very strong winds, with five to four and up to 80 kilometers uh, an hour, and. Uh, I will show you a better video later, but he is uh, the person who brought the Tech Transfer Award in 2016, European Tech Transfer Award, spin off through the spin off Clearfly solution. Now the ID has been uh, sold to Arium, the Canadian uh, company, and got also the, the best paper award in the magazine. Well, we, we have ideas of why, you know, bird flies. If in 2D, they have been, you know, and still. One of the hypotheses is that they are based to what you see, what happens is that there is a confirmed inversion due to the separation of the flow on the top and the bottom of the wings. And due to the crossing of these forces, you basically uh, create jet streams which creates the, the thrust. Uh, but this is in 2D. It turns out that, uh, uh, for example, in our bird, this we make the, 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 the wings more rigid. So we get rid of the elasticity to which the things that fly, same shape. So there's more going on. You know, there is the 3D event of the flopping and the connection between the fluid dynamics and, and the elasticity is more fundamental. So I was uh, uh, I'm very fortunate that I brought a lot of money to uh, look into it. And uh, so ERC is the, for the non Europeans, is the, the grant, we can grant a lot of money. But about 2.8 million uh, euros, 2.5 million is uh, for, the, for the project. And then uh, the possibility to get extra money for infrastructure. Uh, we're saying the Netherlands uh, 
know you have yes you can get by us i got that as well so that was great and i could set up a a, a, a great team and tell you more about great in case you're interested this is a, a, a wonderful publication which describes more or less the, the, the philosophy to which of, of the product itself and the one we want to achieve and is, is the audio okay? Keep going. Um, and some of the people are, are here with this in the moment. So this is uh, once again it's my, my dream team. So uh, uh, Rami uh, has also been playing a major role in the the works so a lot of the emails may get a, a communication from Rami. Unfortunately, he went to from the Netherlands to Frankfurt for the visa, spent there, they still had their passport, they didn't have the visas to answer, so he couldn't come. So it's really Anyway, uh, uh, Alexander, Luke, uh, and Federico, and Ricardo are, are here. And then uh, the new person who joined the team is Yannick, who is going to do some deep learning based on the physics we, we, we actually have started, which I will explain very briefly. The project is basically divided in two parts. So uh, you may know this was this you know, old philosopher of Greek. There was a separation of what we call the technical atmosphere. So the more fundamental the uh, stuff that we say, so the theoretical side of which and the, and the technical side. So I want to start with the more conceptual things that we've been working on. These are the, uh, uh, the people working on this, uh, collaborating with, uh, with some other colleagues, uh, among which mostly Frederick Schiller, who's a theoretical physicist that uh, was in Erlangen and uh, I, I'm very pleased I managed to bring the trend, so we're working closely with them. And we published on a, a number of papers, one after the other in Journal of Theoretic and Fluids and, and Physics of Fluids. And I will tell you what this paper was about. I will not go into the details, but of course, if you have questions, I can answer that. So what is the, the idea of this? The bird is, you know, is a compositional part that the body has its waves and the waves interact with the flow. And there is something I've been working for many, many years since my PhD, which is based on portable autonomous systems theory. The basic is, is a unique way to, to, to learn how to model physical systems and their interconnection. I think is the best parameter that should be used for, for modeling physics. And so we want to do basically, uh, you know, to model various parts, but as long as rigid body and normal robotic stuff, I've been doing this for, for many years and using a number of concepts. But when you go to floppy flies, things get far more complicated because you have the wings and the wings interact with the fluid. The wings deform, and meanwhile they flap, this they move up and down. So the pore, what is called the pore, which will be the surface of the wing, is actually basically you want to, to model to be to distribute the parameter system. One is the fluid, you know, satisfies the stokes equations, and one is the wind, which satisfies the you know, continuous mechanics deformation. And you want to couple that all to understand what's going on. So it's, it's a pretty complicated thing if you really want to do it precisely. So, um, so what we did, the conceptual challenge that we, we, we which I envisioned when I wrote the, the, the grant, and we actually already knew them 100%. Well, the first is to, to, have a, a, to understand a, a, a geometrical, possibly curve, according to the way the fundamental open idea of fluid. So, the first, you know, what is the real way that we could describe interconnections for ideal fluids? No friction, so no episodes yet. Okay. And that goes, uh, gave us a lot of insight into the geometry which is needed in order to, to actually define interconnection of the formation of wings and the fluid. Uh, so this brought to, to the first publication in, in the journal Geometry and Physics. And then they extend it to any kind of work action because, you know, when you have a fluid that moves, and then you have back, for example, if you have a compressible fluid, which is normally not what you need, but, or heat or other things, you know, they are adapted in the fluid. And, and, and in general, we would like to cool, be, be able to describe it. Most of the time, when you talk about, you know, all this description that they're good in atoms, Either have a close boundary or an infinite boundary. And, and that's what we need something which has a boundary on the wings and be able to change the boundary. So we need something which is able to describe completely uh, fluid dynamics with an open boundary. And that was not there yet. If it was the next uh, point, the next step was really to 
prove uh, 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 the viscous, so the shear stress in the fluid and the bulk stress in the fluid. And, and once again, we managed to do it very elegantly and uh, uh, to describe it as an extension viscosity. Then, crucial, probably one of the most important crucial things was moving boundary. So, if you know some background of PDEs, normally when you have partial differential equations with sky fields, for example, fluid dynamics, when you move the boundary, that well, the boundary is basically fixed, you know, the boundary condition of fixed, and then you try to solve your PD or CF to understand. But we want a, a way to have boundary not only moving, uh, changing in time as a port, you know, but also in space. And that's something that that's, was a very big challenge, but we yielded it. And we got uh, the next publication also in the Journal of Geometry and Physics. And then, of course, this is very nice, but then we want to do something with it. So we want to go to the merits because once we have the merits, we can learn it, okay, and we can control. Uh, but we don't want to do the merit just uh, by using standard ways. We want to use the good structure we have built without losing that structure. And as you may know, you know, if you look at the computational group dynamics, you know, if you use this method, you can preserve this quantity and all these other quantities. We want something that would preserve all physical quantities and all the structure that we have managed to put into the, the way we design. And that was we succeeded in the linear case where sending up not stokes. And we uh, did it at an artist. We have the first view of the paper, uh, and uh, it's on uh, a highly cited uh, numerical journal. It's called the dual field structure. And we basically are able to do that. So, this is the theoretical um, uh, way. I want to spend briefly what is core base. So, what all the idea behind it. Here's a picture of uh, Raffaello uh, and uh, the academy. You know, academy comes from academia. Uh, which was founded by Plato in 400 before Christ. And actually, it was written, what is written there is in Greek. It was written, means let no one ignorant of geometry enter. Okay, I love geometry, and, and so I run it, run it, I And in this port of Milton, that was a source of inspiration for me, because geometry is something for me has been very fundamental. And furthermore, this guy that you may know, you know, make another statement which says, you know, every theory will be overthrown. You can generate relativity here one day, but I he said thermodynamics will never be overthrown, basically. Okay. And important moving system is all based on that. You know, the concept of energy and power is, is the glue of physics. You know, we, we use it all the time, and, and this is actually the ground of what we do in quantum quantum systems. We describe interaction using what is the concept of force. And and, uh, and energy transfer and what it is about. But let me first put in context of what is a Hamiltonian system that you may have heard before. You know, classical mechanics. The poor Hamiltonian system here. For those of you who know about Hamiltonian systems, Hamiltonian theory basically uses some reduction, a Poisson reduction, and and this is uses a some other mechanical structure. But the point is. You try to make the physics as a whole, complete a complete system, and you want to describe it. In setting important Hamiltonian system theory, you want to decompose it. You know, a Cartesio uh, 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 introduced to us. You've got a semi complex problem, you want to decompose it to solve the part you recompose it. And that's exactly the bottom up approach of important Hamiltonian system theory does. It is open, you know, in Hamiltonian systems here in physics, basically, you say you take the system, you cannot interact with the system, or you could put an input, but you don't care about what the effect is on that. It's like important Hamiltonian system theory that is, uh, is in the core. And it does, as I said before, uh, a completely open boundary, and this equation can be handled very nicely in important Hamiltonian system theory. So basically, the whole idea is based very briefly on the on the concept, if you have two parts that you want to describe, it, part A and part B of your system, uh, you have what is called uh, so they exchange power, and the power is described by two things which are called efforts and flows. And these efforts and flows are such that uh, uh, if you pair them in a way I will tell you, it's like a vector and a co-vector, so like velocity and the force. If you take the, if you apply to them, you get power, and that means the power is one element of the other. But of course, you can imagine 
that it entails here. Like through dynamics, you know, the networks, the, the, the flow would be, for example, all the, 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 the vector fields of velocity on the wave. Okay. And the effort would be something related to pressure on the waves, right? So it's a PD, it's a distributed system. But still, you can define this very, very precisely. I will not go with the, 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 the details. So, this is an overview of the kind of things you can do. For example, electrical domain of current and voltages, you run the velocity in force, the angular velocity in force. But then, when we go to continuous mechanics, you get something which are called tensor value uh, uh, n forms, n forms, which are, let's say, uh, are needed in order to be able to describe shear. Because, funny enough, if you have something, for example, interconnection on the solid and the fluid, on the boundary, a lot is going on because of the you know zero slip condition and the contact of the two things, a lot is going on. And we need some new geometry in order to describe it. We don't have the time to talk about it, but we have a book that describes this theory, the book that we published many years ago, and there will be definitely a new book coming with the insight that we got now. Um, I will skip this uh, in, the, in the interest of time, just to give a more formal definition of, uh, for a second. So just take a so if what is flow is a function from time to a vector space B, and the network is a function from a time to the dual of the vector space, and if you pair them, I like force this to be, for example, the space of, of, uh, of velocities, and this will be the space of forces, and then you can understand that you have power as a function of time if you apply one to the other. And let any so the, the way you work, you basically compose, I will skip this for the interest of time. And uh, uh, for those of you, those of you who have some background work in, in analytical stuff, uh, in order to describe this and to bring this concept to fields, uh, in all dimensions, in a coordinate way, applicable to all physical domains, uh, possibly in curved spaces, uh, and what you actually uh, need is, uh, we use is actually external calculus. And, and thanks to that, we have been able to do all I said to you before. And, uh, the step we needed to make is to go from what I call scalar valued differential forms to something which is called uh, our tensor values differential forms. In case you're interested for that, I can spend time later, but this is very technical, so I don't want to go in there right now. So let me just go to the more practical side of the of the of the projects of what we have been doing from a more uh, practical side. These are some of the publications. These are the team. So uh, uh, Ricardo. Uh, uh, Alexander and Luca are here, and we have an even better picture coming up from them. And so, what we are working, uh, uh, we, we have basically three things we are working with uh, on, a, on a practical side. I want first to talk about the work of Alexander, which is a functional structure and service with uh, 3D printing. So, uh, one of the things we, for example, you know that birds have, of course, compliant sensorized mates. And, uh, and the stiffness, as I said also before, the way they morph, the way they, and actually there will be very nice talk of uh, uh, friendly colleagues later on. Uh, more on the topics of morphing and stiffness, which is a very important issue in the right? And, uh, and sense air and, and information. So, what we want to do is really to look into this, okay? And, and try to, to, to embed it with printing. Now we, we, we have both, we have uh, um, purchased a the foam cutter in which we are going to embed materials for, for this uh, purpose. What you see here is, for example, uh, something that uh, 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 creates some embedding sensing of the formation and actuation, and in order to create resonance. So you can basically to optimize the, the motion of this slip by minimizing the energy you put in. So to not to use a natural motion and tune, if you wish, the limit cycles you can get. Okay, and this is uh, something that, that uh, Alexander and Federico there have been working on. Uh, other things more on sensing. So, can you basically build some sensing, 3D printer sensing? Uh, and this is done by you know combining materials, uh, you know polymers which are not conductive with some 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 you know the, the black lines you see there, the big graphite based kind of material that you basically can can measure the the the, you know, the big, now, what uh, uh, Luke is the most expensive, I would say, he's the most expensive guy of the team. <laughs> and he's working on the uh, real on, on measurement through the dynamics. And of course, to do that properly, you need a lot of 
good hard work. So this is our wind tunnel. So this is uh, the section the measuring section. So what we basically are trying to do is uh, we bought this very expensive toy, uh, which is bubble injector. We'll come that in a moment. It was 250,000 euros of investment. And then with the laser, so that the, the wings are placed at this point of the section. Uh, the inflow is here, the outflow is on that. And we have four uh, high speed cameras, 70 kilohertz, in order to, to, to see the bubbles. And there is diffraction of the laser so that we can measure the volumes, basically. And this is the way the setup looks like the four camera and, and the laser shining there. And, and this is more or less how it works. So we have these bubbles, which are about 100 microns. And they have a buoyancy which is compatible with the flow, so the measurement is not influenced. And, and, and then you have these four high speed cameras uh, in order to measure, measure with the flow. Uh, and these are the kind of things you can get out of it. And uh, so Luke is really trying to understand from this measurement, try to protect the flow and vortices. And, and, and uh, this is something that we set up re pretty uh, uh, recently. And the first very things are, are coming out we will be coming from the future publication. What Ricardo is, is, is working on, I will only to tell you one thing, because he's working on a very cool picture we cannot disclose yet. And but it's work on smart mechanical design. And uh, in the wind tunnels, what we want is basically the such the wind to be able to fuel the wind. And the way that now works is actually the wind says a, is a, is a moving, the wind motion, and then it can change the angle of attack. And in the period, how that changes, and you know how uh, uh, it's, it's fundamental for the flight. So we want really to be able to tune that in the wind tunnel and to see what aerodynamics and force and thrust and wind effects are. And uh, this was an old setup that we had, which you know we weren't able to, to tune everything in real time. And this box, which has an also lot of nice things inside that uh, we will be published soon. Is, is actually able to, to do this at the frequency realistic that we need and, and it's going to be put in the wind tunnel in the separation I told you before. So close up, I just want to tell you what our, our future step will be. From a theoretical point of view, uh, we are finishing up the, the, the portable twin description of the formation. Uh, you know, Mars and Jerry Mars and other people have been people working on this stuff, but never in portable twin an open boundary way. And we 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 yield it, so we are writing things up. Um, we want to have wave extraction microscopes, and because we believe that that's the way to also understand how to handle turbulences, that will be a major uh, conceptual contribution. So that's something we have a pipeline, and then apply machine learning for control of the bird after this fertilization that I said. And and the last thing which finishing up is also to bring this. Dual field methods are introduced from a linear case, uh, which can be applied, for example, the Maxwell equation and other stuff, which are not important for the dynamics. So, the fluid dynamic case where you have a nonlinear PDE, uh, where you have a fraction of, of the rotation. Um, and then some other stuff. On engineering, a uh, more point of view, the setup is almost finished and we'll be able really to do a lot of data acquisition, which you will pick up a lot of insight. And, uh, and uh, we are working on new synthetic wings. This is pretty cool things that uh, the car is working on. I cannot disclose it yet. And a lot of fluid dynamic experience. So then we'll find that everything in place to not only the theoretical stuff, but also the practical stuff, and then try to match the two. And I want to conclude, um, and of course, to, to, to allow you about the cross, I want to conclude with video that you may have seen before because uh, it's an old video, but it's still very cool. And then I will finish up. Working in aviation, waste management or agriculture, one knows that birds can be of great nuisance. Birds spread diseases, pick up waste and pollute the surroundings. Nothing, however, tops the risk of bird strikes in aviation. Clear Flight Solutions has the answer to your problems. The Row Bird. The Row Bird is an environmentally friendly solution for all your bird-related problems. It is a flapping wing robotic bird that not only looks like a bird of prey, but also flies like one. We have many years of experience in unmanned aviation and bird control. Our certified pilots are experts in flying our rowbirds. 
As safety is paramount, our Robirds are equipped with state-of-the-art autopilots, GPS, and geofence systems. We make sure that the pilot in command is always in control. The instinctual behavior of birds when confronted with a predator is flocking together for maximum safety. By flying around the flock, the pilot can remove the birds lastingly in the direction of choice. Shortly after this, birds will start to recognize the area as a territory of prey and will start avoiding it. By mimicking nature, Clear Flight Solutions creates a unique bird control system that birds will never get used to. We make sure your skies stay clear. Very corporate video, very organized. I like very much actually. So I want to conclude by thanking Albert Einstein, because I think that's the driving concept behind the project. Because true knowledge comes from a deep understanding of the topic, and it's been rewarding. And that's the way we structure the project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stefano, for the nice talk. We have time for a, for a question. Then we will try to realign with the nominal schedule since we started a bit later. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> very interesting uh, presentation. I was wondering, uh, with your new type of model, I guess it is, uh, if you run it, uh, it works it's much faster than current computational tools or is it the goal that you also get this question? Yeah, it's also run faster with simulators. Uh, it's a very good question. So the, the, the point is not that it's, it's, it's going to be fair, uh, faster per se. The issue, which I think will be making faster, is the fact that by construction preserves all the things that want to be said. Okay. So we, I believe that if we describe by using less uh, sparser grid in the discretization, we will get better results because of that. So what I, I, I think is that the speed will, will come out from, from that concept. The fact that you know we 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 do not have, we approximate the physics as best as we can, and also at the discrete level, thanks to the, the methods which is which is done, which I can tell you later more about, and therefore it will go faster. And one that is done, you have seen the, the phenomenal talk of, of Mar and Marco Rutte, and you know the physics uh, that is there, so that will be the physics which we are there, and then if it's fast enough, we can learn it. That's great. Second is about, yeah, the question is about uh, how to use models. Models are very good to design, very good to predict, very good to design trajectories, very good to plan. But I was wondering, because you are also expert in control, if you plan to use some kind of these models, they are in pay for control or they are other kind of models. Or you started from the aerodynamic models and better to try to use some way, or you started from other kind of dynamic models. So, uh, uh, very good question. So, everything I've been doing so far in control has always been that uh, uh, in, in robotic and control. I always use this portable linear way of thinking. By the design of the control. So I look at the controller, which has a physical meaning, and I can describe the control action on the physical system as a physical design that you need to break. So, you know, control classically, you measure things and you calculate and act. And the way you do it is non structured. So, what I, what I do in the important component based control, if you wish, is you have a system which you model the portable component. You want to develop a controller that looks like that because you can then get inside from the physics and use the controller to have this inside from the physics. So that will be certainly the next step. The problem is that, of course, the PEs are very complicated. So we need to do this issue of reduction, maybe some learning, or part of it. what we cannot do in this framework, we do it with learning. But also in the learning, with something actually we're doing with Federico, we can learn the physics somehow, structural. Uh, so We'll answer it yes, we are using this physical structure also for the whole very, very good. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I will ask you to uh, ask the question in this microphone here. I mean, I think I'll probably put this one. 
Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. My first question is, um, uh, in general, in aerospace, we know that uh, rotor crafts are not so efficient, and fixed wing or conventional aircraft are more efficient. Uh, so how do you situate such uh, flat wing wing configurations in terms of efficiency with respect to classical uh, aircraft? Well, I think that overall falcon wings can be more efficient because you can shift with you know, you can use and scavenge the energy by doing soaring from the environment as well. So, I mean, if you keep on popping all the time and you don't do it properly, then you can waste a lot of energy. But if you understand the physics, and that's one of the goals, and you can actually, at your advantage, uh, flop and, and get the thrust out of the system in an optimal way. You cannot do it with propeller because you, you basically create a lot of uh, extra shear, which is dissipation, uh, which is uncontrolled if you wish. So flopping flight, in principle, can be much more efficient than, than other, other kind of flights because the thrust is, is generated in a, possibly can be generated in a more efficient way. That's what I believe. The uh, second question is uh, related to control. In general, with control, especially for aerial vehicles, we consider that zero, zero dynamics are a problem. Uh, it's more of a constraint. But I read uh, many articles that birds do somehow take advantage of the zero dynamics and gain a maneuverability. Uh, have you been able to, say, to gain more maneuverability? With respect to automatic yeah. I mean, it depends how you define the zero dynamics in that respect. But uh, I think, from uh, you know, uh, one thing which is which is known is that uh, uh, if you're if you fly if you fly a plane, you you rather don't have flow separation, right? Because then it's not very good. <laughs> Flapping birds, basically, you know. Uh, so if, if the plane goes, the angle of attack becomes too high. You have flow separation stall and you fall out of the sky. Instead, what birds do all the time is nothing else than that. Because by, by changing the, the pitch, they create these vortices. And that's a way to create the thrust. So, in that respect, I know that is related to that. Uh, it is, uh, birds are, 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 you know, it looks like that birds really uh, uh, use everything which is out there, you know, to, to, to propel in the sky, so to speak. And when they fix the wing and they glide, okay, they can't even, you know, use the, the thermal wings to walk them down. And that's what is so fascinating. From a, a control point of view, it depends how you define the zero dynamics, but these are zero dynamics defined with an output. And, you know, what is the output here? It's not clear. So, uh, and I, I, in the Portland Antonio way of thinking of control, it's not just the output, it's always empty sport. So it's a different context for personal control for others. Okay, then I will thank again Stefan for his talk. I must proceed, we have a slight kind of schedule, but we, we will realign after the first coffee break. So, next speaker is uh, Dario Floriano, Director of the Laboratory of Intelligence Systems at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Los Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to speak this pleasure. I am a bit of an outlier here because the, uh, the presentation won't be about flapping wings, but it will be about morphing wings, which is um, a property that uh, um, many flying, um, or I guess all flying, many flying uh, uh, animals have, insects and animals have. So in my laboratory, we, um, we do research in, in flying systems, but not only this one. Um, areas of research that uh, go from, from the development of sensors and processing of visual information by inspired ways, including machine learning, um, all the way to swarming, although we do not do swarms of flapping wings, which is what probably we do, uh, uh, we mentioned or, or is in research. Uh, so we do uh, swarming with uh, fixed wings and, and uh, moved copters. Uh, and we spend a lot of time also looking at materials, the construction, mechanical design, characterization of the drones, and all the way to multimodality. Systems not only fly, but also perch, walk, um, hop, um, and the different things. So we'll cover some of this today. 
And um, uh, my talk will focus on, on folding wing, wings. By wings, I mean uh, aerial surfaces more in general. And now, and I will focus on three aspects of why uh, animals fold wings and how we can use them to build uh, uh, products that have uh, increased capabilities. The first one is um, folding for uh, reducing the uh, space, uh, the, the, the area of the wings. Many of these animals, uh, when they are on the ground and when they are in trees, uh, do not want to have their wings fully open because that would interfere with the, the surrounding environment. And um, it is interesting to see, so there are different degrees of folding, but uh, coleopter in particular are quite interesting because they, uh, uh, their folding uh, mechanism, or their folding principle, consists in um, a relatively slow folding of the wings against the body, and very rapid release of, of the wings when they take off. Um, so what is it uh, animals do is that they store elastic energy in the folding um, regions of the wings as they fold the wings. And it's, uh, they block these wings with some protective structures called the elytra. As soon as the elytra open and release the wings, the elastic energy is released very rapidly the, um, the wings uh, open up. It's not for all the coleoptera, but uh, for many coleoptera, that's the case. And so uh, they achieve very high folding ratio, and which is to be found by interesting that wings are quite lively. And so um, with a, uh, uh, um, let me see that I can get a screen. So uh, the, maybe I'll show the video. So this is the work of uh, a brilliant former postdoc of mine, Stefan Lynch, who is now uh, assistant professor at age three. So he identified two folding patterns in coleoptera on the species of coleoptera, one against the uh, folding pattern against the, the body of the of the insect and one with the periphery, and he designed an origami a wing that reproduces those folding patterns. So what you can see is the slow down um, uh, uh, video, you can rapidly um, uh, unfold the wing, and once the wing is unfolded, um, it is sufficiently stable. The folds are sufficiently stable to withstand the around forces required to provide lift and make this uh, storm controllable. So, we extended this principle to many types of drones, not only uh, wind drones, also foldable um, quadrotors and other types of drones. So, that's a very interesting concept for reducing uh, space for the group of all then the question is how to protect uh, those wings, uh, those folding wings. And uh, as I mentioned earlier on, um, uh, Coleoptera has this elytra, which are wings that are relatively rigid. They form against the uh, uh, main wing or in wing, as they are called. They provide protective, um, protective uh, role on the insects in the ground. So, uh, this work by uh, Harry Wurtzis, who's a PhD student in my lab, and, and William Stewart, a postdoc. They designed uh, these uh, coleoptera called Hercules. This is the name of my lab, laboratory intelligence system. Uh, they designed this, this robot, which has this protective uh, uh, elytra on the, on the, the protective swollen wings. And, um, and I will show this uh, to you in a moment in this video. So, here the concept is to look not only at these elytra as protective surfaces, but also to see whether they can somehow pay off. For their added mass in terms of value and dynamic yield. So here you see the elytra in, in this insect, in this particular type of insect, and uh, you know, it comes in many different uh, shapes. Um, they have different um, uh, protective roles. But here you see our drone, it has the two elytra that um, uh, fold out. The elytra are made of a very light material that is capable of withstanding very strong shocks. And uh, it uses these uh, uh, the two propellers on the back. So when it's on the ground, uh, it, uses, as it uses wheels, and then the propellers on the back generate the thrust, uh, both for propelling on the ground and for propelling uh, flying in the air. So, so it, okay, that's great. It protects the uh, the uh, possibly fragile uh, winds from from collisions. But the question is, what is the um, the cost? What the advantage of this elytra? And what you see in this graph? Um, well, it's not so good, but essentially we are looking at the uh, lift is a, a 
coefficient and the drag coefficient of these uh, of these uh, probes. And we look at uh, four different configurations. Um, we have a, um, uh, a very simple theoretical model in violet. Then we have uh, uh, these the green you can see is uh, the heat ring uh, and the ultra. Then in orange we have uh, only the ultra, and then in blue we have only the heat ring. So we look at the different combinations of, 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 of systems. So to make a very long story short, if you um, um, if you have the elytra on top of the of the of the injury, yes, you have an increased drag. That's that's not so good. But these elytra on top of the injury provide additional lift. And so, if you look at the theoretical model and the, uh, the real model of the elytra with the hing wing, it provides additional lift compared to a system that has only the uh, hing wing, the main wing. So if you look at this particular design for this very high angle of attack, the ultra pays off to some extent for its side mass by providing significant additional lift, which allows it to continue to fly. But uh, as I mentioned, um, ultra is also useful for connecting uh, the insect that flies uh, when it falls on the ground. And then uh, it also speaks to a bright itself, as you could see in the model recently. And so we said, okay, can we use Elytra to upright uh, a victory drone that falls to the ground, maybe upside down as in this case? So you see it's a slightly different design. In this case, uh, we have these Elytra that allow the victory drone to upright itself. And then they get back into an aerodynamic uh, position and, uh, and off the drone flies. And again, the other question is okay, that's great, but what is the uh, aerodynamic cost and benefit of this? And for this particular design of, of the of the antra, uh, the system to begin with, long story short, um, the antra provide additional lift or lift, lift to drag ratio in the uh, regular flight regime, so the cruise speed. When it comes to high angle attack, uh, they are slightly uh, less efficient in this particular design. And this is scalable, so we look at uh, uh, systems that have different types of thing uh, that um, uh, extension in this particular case, and uh, it works for a uh, So that's a very interesting concept of, of uh, flotability for protective um, uh, uh, Now, uh, as you know in this community, um, birds fall to wings, uh, not only during the floppy motion, but also they reduce or they expand the aerial surface uh, to fly uh, at different speeds so they can reduce their uh, track uh, by forming the wings. And so one of these very early, uh, first that we worked with it, with again Stefan Lutcher and Tim Luca, but the PhD later on from Brown University, um, we explored the possibility of using artificial feathers for changing the aerial surface of, of uh, uh, wing drones. And uh, in particular, uh, the interesting aspect here is that you do not need any longer aerons uh, uh, to control the anatomy uh, of, of, of the aircraft. You can simply uh, asymmetrically change the aerial surface of the wings, therefore generating uh, higher or lower lift, causing a, a roll motion. And uh, that's a very interesting design that uh, uh, for we use essentially what's about the um, why feathers? Well, we consider different designs too. We consider membranes, for example. But membranes, when it comes to folding, have additional problems at this scale, at least, that result into uh, inefficiency uh, due to this or material that cannot be absorbed. Um, so, certainly, membranes are interesting for bath like designs, and they have been used but for this particular case. Uh, uh, we haven't seen uh, in the So we find feather very interesting. And, uh, and again, as uh, Stefan was saying earlier on, feathers offer great opportunity for embedding additional sensors and for manufacturing them in different shapes and uh, uh, as they are distributed along the, the surface of, of the wing. Um, now, as many of you know this video from BDC, um, uh, birds of prey uh, not only uh, uh, for their wings but also the tail, and they do it quite aggressively uh, to uh, rapidly change the velocity vector, for example, for um, uh, rapidly, for example, turning around obstacles. You can see here, aerobraking, 
and passing through narrow obstacles. And that, that's really what captured our attention. We said, okay, how can we um, uh, leverage the morphic capability of, of these uh, aerial surfaces to produce a more agile uh, uh, fixed wing drones that eventually one day would allow fixed wing drones to leverage their larger endurance and efficiency and still fly in confined spaces as uh, what up to do today. And um, uh, our follow-up of that, of that line of research uh, is what we call the uh, East Hawk, uh, which is inspired by uh, the uh, North and Coast Hawk. Actually, the drone has been uh, designed by Nindy and Rita Janic, who is a PhD student in my lab. Uh, Mir Ferrishman is now uh, an assistant professor at the NTU Singapore, Dave Stephan, and Jabir, my colleague, working in aerodynamics, Flavio. You know. So um, we not only uh, in this new design, we allow the main wing to extend forward, uh, which is quite helpful, it turns out, for some aggressive maneuvers. And we also added the morphing capability to the, to the tail. Um, so the tail can, uh, uh, can change the pitch angle, uh, uh, the EO angle, and, and can expand or fall. And, um, and so here you're going to see uh, in this video the, uh, the capabilities of this drone. Um, you see in this video, we only morph these wings in a binary state, so fully open or completely tight. As a matter of fact, they can continuously expand between closed and open. Uh, the problem is that this type of aircraft are extremely complex to control, and, and uh, we simplify the problem, so we don't even leverage the full capabilities of the drones. We simplify the problem by using these uh, sort of binary uh, control commands. So, so here is the, uh, the RISOC, and, uh, and you can imagine all the possible combinations of, of uh, aerial surfaces. So the question is, what do these different combinations um, give you uh, for different flight conditions? And so the first thing is, is that you want to increase the maneuverability of, of the aircraft. And uh, uh, increasing the maneuverability mean, means uh, increasing the ability to change the velocity vector, the direction where you're flying. Now, you can change uh, a better the velocity vector if you can produce higher linear accelerations on the aerial surfaces. And these higher linear accelerations on the aerial surfaces are produced when you have a higher uh, lift and drag coefficient. So the question is which type of configuration gives you higher uh, lift and drag coefficients? Uh, now, you see uh, uh, different colors here. Each color corresponds to one of the configuration. Uh, the red being the fully expanded tail and fully expanded uh, main wings. And, uh, and you can see that uh, uh, for different angles of attack in the X axis, we produce higher lift and drag uh, uh, coefficients when we have fully expanded tail and fully expanded wing, which is expected, but uh, I think we had to measure it. And it goes particularly well for high angles of attack to have a uh, clear, uh, uh, above 12 degrees, you have a clear. Uh, positive effect of these expanded wings. The second thing you want to do is to uh, increase the agility. So these, these are terms that uh, uh, we found from the literature, but let me define what agility means here. It means the ability to change the angular rate, which is essentially the pitch and the roll coefficient. So you want to change it as fast as possible. Then the picture is slightly more complicated. Um, now, um, what you can see again, the, the four configuration on the left, and we can see that, for example, uh, if you look at the top, uh, we have for the uh, uh, pitch coefficient, we can look at the angle of attack. Um, uh, we can look at the pitch coefficient against the angle of attack. And you can see that when you have the tacked wings and the fully expanded tail, you have a higher pitch coefficient and very low angle to the negative angle of attack. If you uh, look at the configuration instead, when you have fully expanded wings and, and tucked tail, you get better pitch coefficient in uh, the medium to high range angle of attack. And if you have a fully expanded tail and wing, you have better lift coefficient when you are at the uh, cruising speed. And so now, if you want to have always the better pitch coefficient, depending on your angle of attack, you can choose your walk configuration. So you can see down here. Uh, picture on F for different types of attack. You just choose when you find any type of attack, you choose uh, the green configuration, then you can open up your wing and tail, and then if you increase the angle of attack even further, you just tuck your tail, you just keep the wing fully expanded. 
Uh, same thing goes for the wall coefficient. The wall coefficient uh, with the different cases in values are negative because we are producing a turning moment uh, in that direction. But essentially, when you have a fully expanded ring and attack, they, they generate the uh, highest wall coefficient. And so um, the other thing you want to do if you want to have an agile platform is the ability to uh, change the pitch stability. So um, pitch stability is, is what is the capability of returning to the twin cruising flight and of that naturally most aircraft on which we fly are designed when they are perturbed to go back to the twin angle. And you achieve that if the, um, uh, the center of gravity is positioned behind the if the top aerodynamic forces generated by the aircraft are positioned behind the uh, center of gravity, then you have a stable aircraft that returns to the twin angle. Is that the instability is generated when the top aerodynamic forces are positioned in front of the center of gravity. And of course, by changing the, um, the, the wingspan, you can move your, uh, your the top aerodynamic lift beyond the wing front. And so you can decide, uh, depending on the different configurations, where you want to fly. So if you want to fly, for example, to a st stable flight, um, so here we should look at the gradient, by the way. This, when you look at the stability, we'll look at the gradient, so the, in what direction changes the, uh, the, the pitch coefficient. And so what we want to have is negative pitch coefficients give you a stable flight, is a positive pitch coefficient in the unstable flight, the ability to probably change the velocity vector. And essentially, depending on your uh, configuration, you can change at which angle of attack your aircraft is stable. When you are in this configuration, which is a uh, tack wing and open tail, you are essentially stable for anything above uh, five degrees uh, to an angle. If you are in fully expanded wind conditions and tack tail, you have a region of the point of transition from unstable to stable, which is at about 20 degrees. And uh, if you have the full expanded that will maintain, you will shift this point of transition uh, down to it. So depending on the flight conditions, you may uh, decide where, uh, where, you, where you want to configure your wings, depending on whether you want to be stable or unstable. And then there is another question, which is about power. Uh, do these morphic capabilities give you uh, better endurance or power. So here, uh, the power is, measured, is measured in terms of required uh, watts uh, for flying. And we look at the three different configurations in these cases, we expanded and uh, um, uh, 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 duck. And uh, to make a long story short, essentially, we can change the configuration of the aircraft to produce, um, uh, to, to be in the region of minimal energy expenditure uh, at different flight speeds. So you have the flight speed on the X axis, and then you have the, uh, the power required on the top axis. So depending if you fly slow, for example, you are uh, in the uh, fully expanded uh, configuration, and then you, as you increase the uh, flight the speed, you want to go to the back configuration with the transition point. Finally, one thing you want to do uh, to measure the agility of these aircraft is uh, to test them. And so uh, one maneuver that is quite important to show the agility is that we need to pitch up at the, uh, uh, the smallest possible radius. And again, I don't take much time here, but if you, this is if you look at the horizontal distance uh, of, it, of, a, of the aircraft flying in this direction, we look at the pitch up number, so we pitch up manually, from actually it's not manually, but it's a control command that is given. And when the wings and, and the tail are attacked, you see that it takes a long time uh, to a long distance to, to pitch up. Instead, when you have a fully uh, extended tail and wing, you pick, you, um, you reach the same uh, turning radius at about half the distance. So let me show to you the uh, flight test of this vehicle. So there is all the, uh, all, the, all the numbers. Now you see the vehicle flying, and uh, you see the configuration of the wings um, in, in the inset on the top left, top right, excuse me. So we can change uh, the configuration of the wings depending on the, on the flight regime we want to be in. I should say that the drone here is celebrated by, by Enrico, who is a great pilot, and, uh, and, and it, it is a challenge because you have so many degrees of freedom that you have to control, with the remote control that, uh, that 
even if we just leverage a few co configurations, it is complicated. So what we are working on at the moment is, of course, to do it automated. And just as Bert's use vision, we are working on using vision, IMUs, uh, and other sensors on, on the wings, uh, obviously, uh, to produce the stability and the achievement that, uh, that we want um, this drone to, to have. So we are working here with Valentin Luz, with the WS Campbells in particular, um, to look at uh, some of the approaches that um, uh, could, um, we could transfer from the work of quadcopters to the work of, of Fuxians. I want to give you a finish a glimpse of what we are under research we are doing in the lab. So I showed you in what I call the cruising flight, so the agile cruising flight. Uh, what we are looking at the moment is doing aggressive maneuvers, other types of aggressive maneuvers in particular, a perch landing. We arrive to a location, we rapidly increase the velocity and, and perch. Or uh, we have shown you the pitch up maneuver today, and we have beautiful results in the new version of the drone that we submit uh, this weekend, hopefully, uh, where we can increase the turning radius dramatically by any. Leverage a new type of uh, folding that we observe with birds. Um, another thing we are doing, working on, is, is grasping. We'll show you uh, preliminary results. So, we want to do grasping in flight without so stopping. And last, uh, also stop it. We are working, as it's something we are working on appendages that can also not only grasp, but also be used for walking, hopping, uh, possibly jumping. Um, uh, so let's look at grasping and flight grasping. That's what the birds of prey, this is the movie you can find on YouTube from the Slow Walk Company. Um, in particular, if you look at the uh, slow down version, you see that there is this walking maneuver and rapid grasping that does not destabilize the, the bird as, as the object is picked up. So there is no uh, perturbation to, to, to the bird. Now, of course, Fabricating this type of uh, grass person, the, the agility of the birds is still a uh, fight for us. But we look at the principle of, of say, okay, what do we need here? We look at the lightest possible system that is triggered without uh, without perturbation of, of control. And so we look at the concept of uh, bistable uh, systems that um, this that have a uh, loaded uh, energy in, in the in the gripper whenever they encounter force. For example, they touch an object, they grab the snap on the object. And um, um, first, we tested it uh, on a quadcopter flying indoor. You see there is an object suspended on, on, two, uh, on two small uh, uh, cubes, and uh, it's sufficient just a few grabs of force to trigger the uh, mechanism. However, the aerodynamic force is normally experienced by the gripper to not uh, trigger the, the closing. And um, we then put it on the aircraft, it's not yet our. Um, Inspired or just want to see the measured forces at the impact, uh, and um, uh, just here we see uh, the drone flying through and, and grabbing an object. Um, essentially, the drone is absolutely not destabilized by, by the obstacle. So, what we're working here, <coughs> excuse me, here is a little bit where we use vision. This time here is a remotely operated, so we have a precise uh, target uh, hitting uh, with the uh, onboard vision. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's the end of the story for today. There's maybe more, but I'm not sure if time is. Um, I'm hiding that space of many, but if you're interested in, in this line of research, just don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dari, for this very, very nice talk. Um, we are a little bit late, but we have time for a small question. Yeah. Uh, my first question is about aerodynamics. Do you think that the coefficients would be uh, subject to aero propulsive effects, which means would they vary with the uh, thrust level of the propeller? Okay. So I'm not an aeronautic expert, and that's why I hope with other people are more expert. But is your question uh, about the perturbation generated by the thrust, or is are you talking about different aspects of different speeds? Uh, well, the coefficients curves you were showing, I would expect them to increase or decrease with respect to uh, the level of thrust. 
that is defensive. Just, the, just uh, the effect of the reduced flow. Probably the effect of the reduced flow is, is important. Uh, we do not, uh, so we put the aircraft in front of the roof of tunnel. We don't have the, the thrust uh, generated. So that is an effect we need to make sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might, we might uh, answer the question online. We have really to go on. Thanks again, Dario, for the speech. Next speaker, I'm very happy to, um, to present virtually. Uh, David Lansing is uh, from the University of Groningen. He's an engineer, a zoologist, and a roboticist, and uh, is a very, very inspirational speaker. I'm very happy to, to, to present him and I, I invite him to take, to take the lead in, in our Zoom connection. So uh, thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to present uh, from, all the way from the Netherlands on my research on bio-inspired aerial robotics. Um, I also happen to have two uh, positions for PhD students one uh, interested in bird flight research uh, would be very welcome to join our team uh, to strengthen uh, that part of our research. And another one would be on uh, aerial uh, ro robot design. Um, and I hope to show you today how these two uh, different branches of research come together in my lab and how that enables us to uh, design new types of aerial robots. So um, let's see. Here we go. So the way I uh, look at uh, bio-inspired aerial robotics uh, is that it equates to multi-physics aerospace design. And basically what we're trying to do in my lab is to discover the biological principles that enable animals to excel and then translate these into new aerial robot designs. Um, some examples from about uh, a decade ago or more is uh, the Delphi on the left. There's a Robo Swift that has morphing wings from 2007. And then uh, I'll actually present quite some work today on what we're currently doing, which is biohybrid uh, aerial robotic design. Um, and you're seeing the pigeon bot on the right. So why are we uh, currently very excited about how birds fly? Uh, that is because birds succeed in complex environments in which robots fail. Uh, take, for example, this street canyon. Um, it's very difficult for a delivery drone to find its way here and especially to deal with the gusts that are coming from every corner uh, when it's windy. And uh, the Netherlands is, for example, a country that's very windy, but also in New York, you would find these gusts to be very strong and challenging. But any pigeon can fly here. So how much visual information do birds need to actually fly through gusts? It's not known. Uh, another feature of birds is that they can just perch anywhere, even on surfaces that are engineered and they had no time to adapt to through the process of evolution. Uh, so their perching and grasping mechanism is remarkably versatile and robust. How does it work? Uh, and then uh, another feature of bird flight is that birds can just fly almost anywhere, also in trees themselves. So how do birds actually fly in trees? What enables them to do this and how does it work? Um, and then finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about another feature of bird flight. And uh, this photo that I'm showing is unfortunately fake. It's something that was constructed uh, by uh, the photographer of this uh, swallow to explain this photo that's real. This is a barn swallow flying at high speeds through a slit. And if you look closely at the bottom uh, corner, then you'll see that actually the wings are soft and deforming and touching the walls. I know of no aircraft or aerial robot that can do this. Um, and I think this nicely illustrates why we can still learn a lot from birds and it's worthwhile to figure out how birds do this to then translate this into better performing aerial robots. Uh, so the process that I use to uh, make advances is that I start off with biological questions using biomechanics and other forms of biology to really understand how birds accomplish this. Um, and for this, we select bird species that can do it basically and that we can easily study. Um, then another key factor is that we develop engineering techniques to do, do a systems analysis. Um, and it's really essential to have these new techniques because we want to make measurements to measure how birds and other animals accomplish certain behaviors. And uh, you'd be surprised how little we can measure with current technology. So 
there needs to be a lot of advancement in that area as well. And then when we understand how uh, animals are able to perform so well, in particular birds, uh, we develop robots because these robotic models enable us to embody, test and translate the findings to uh, applications, but also actually to do some tests we could never do in a bird. Um, and so taken together, I look at how the interplay between evolution and physics shapes the avian flight system. So let's start off with how much visual information do birds need to negate gusts? Um, to study this, we actually considered three visual environments that you'll recognize um, because they are very simplistic and also representative for robots. Uh, on the left, you see a cave environment. We only provide a point light source and it's really in the dark. To film in this environment, we actually needed to use infrared uh, light. Uh, then we have uh, in bright, uh, under bright light conditions, a lake environment where we provide a horizon, a clear horizon. You could imagine that a visual horizon, um, you know, could be important for flight control. Pilots need it, but also actually many uh, autonomous flight systems based on vision uh, do horizon detection. So we thought this would be an interesting manipulation. And finally, there's a forest environment and anyone working on optic flow would recognize the stripes. And actually the stripe width has been optimized for the visual system of the bird that's flying through it to maximize optical flow in the retina. And then we uh, tried three um, gust uh, situations. There was a still situation, there's no wind. There's a gust coming from one way um, in the middle. And then there's the shear, the wind shear condition. And uh, the wind uh, speeds are such that when the bird is flying, they, it experiences uh, airflow effectively with respect to its own body frame under a 45 degree angle. So this is a very significant gust compared to the speed it's flying at. Um, and the wind shear should be particularly, uh, particularly challenging. Now to really figure out how birds do it, we, we actually trained them in the uh, uh, forest environment because it has the most visual information uh, while it was wind still. And then we uh, provided uh, random, semi-random, uh, so beforehand determined uh, combinations of these. Uh, and the birds basically, yeah, uh, had no time to adapt uh, to it before the experiments. They also had no experience with flying in gusts uh, and they were bred actually uh, at the facility. Uh, so they have no outdoors experience. Um, th these were lovebirds that we trained. Uh, you can see the mocap system that we uh, used relied on markers on the head and on the body, enabling us to free track them. And the remarkable thing, thing is, and this is what I will summarize here, is that they can actually fly perfectly fly under the most complicated conditions. So the bird is going to fly from the right to the left, um, and there's a gust coming under 45 degrees effectively compared to the bird's body. And you'll see it actually turns into the gust um, and flies on, turns again into the gust while its head is fixated at the target perch. No problem. And the only reason you're seeing this is because this was filmed in infrared. Um, this is under full moonlight conditions with black walls uh, and only a point light source. And basically what we found was that the birds can maneuver equally well through all these conditions uh, under all three visual conditions. Um, and so uh, we don't see a difference basically in their performance. And the way they do this is that their body orients into the gusts, um, their head remains uh, locked onto the target, so fixated, um, and they do this by twisting their neck. Um, and this is really essential. So they keep their head fixated on the goal and that enables us to understand how they do it. So. Uh, they have a 3D stabilized head uh, that we, uh, we measured how they do this. You can see it in the article um, that they fixate on the goal um, while actually their body passively, and this is very important, it, birds don't have a vertical tail, but regardless, the body passively rotates into the wind, uh, our data shows. And uh, uh, so basically there's a slip angle. And uh, uh, while the bird is doing this, there is, of course, some uh, damping going on. It's called flapping uh, counter torque. And then finally, there's also some proportional control because the birds choose to slip at an angle of about 15 degrees that you, we can only explain with proportional control. Now, uh, when we fit this model to a very large number of flights across all these conditions, so 20 flights per condition uh, for three birds, uh, so nine conditions uh, in total is a very large number of flights. We see that this actually really fits the model well. 
Um, and what ter it turns out that birds can infer the uh, relative wind angle via neck twist. So they use proprioception. That's what we found from uh, these uh, data. And uh, the weather vane effect that we discovered, so basically uh, the ability of their body to turn into the uh, wind passively is something that we verified with an ornithopter. So flapping bird model, no tail, an open loop, and uh, we were able to actually show that this corresponded to the behavior we found in vivo in the birds. Um, and so it's really the passive uh, properties, passive aerodynamic properties of the flapping wings that actually behave like a vertical tail. So you, although the bird doesn't have a vertical tail, when it flaps its wings, there's actually a weather vane effect uh, that's caused that enables them to automatically uh, go into the wind. Okay, so how much visual information do birds need to negate gusts? It turns out that a single point light source provides sufficient visual information. That's a lot less than people would have expected, I think. It was quite surprising to us. Um, and this gives inspiration for developing robots. Uh, basically, the visual horizon can be replaced with an inertial horizon. And the uh, wind direction can actually be inferred with respect to the goal, because if you have flapping wings, they orient automatically into the gust. So if you fixate uh, the head or the visual system on the goal, then you know the relative wind uh, direction, which is very helpful. Let's go back to uh, biological questions. How come that birds can land reliably on different surfaces? Now here you see a video of uh, one of our birds, Gary, uh, just landing, landing very nicely on a branch. So how does Gary achieve this? And also his friends, because we, of course, tested multiple birds. We tested uh, these specific parrotlets for different types of surfaces, uh, not only natural branches, uh, but also artificial ones, including foam, which is squishy, which birds actually don't like as much, um, and Teflon, so super slippery. And we also measured the surface roughness profiles, etc. And then we tried also uh, for the birch uh, profile, uh, we tried three different uh, di diameters um, and they dis are distinguished by the fact that on the smallest, the feet can completely wrap, uh, the intermediate, the feet wrap, and the largest, the feet can't wrap actually, it's uh, properly. And it's uh, very difficult if you would scale this to your hands, uh, for example, with water bottles or circular cylinders, and if it would have been there, I could have uh, brought some, uh, bring some, could have brought some props so that you could have felt this, but you'll notice that actually it's very difficult to grasp these large diameter um, perches. We measured this actually with instrumented perches, so we could measure the torques and the forces in 3D. We filmed, uh, of course, in 3D at high speed, and we split the perch so we could also measure the squeezing force, so we could actually see how the birds deal with uh, these complexities. And the remarkable, the remarkable find is that the birds approach all these birds, uh, perches in the same manner. So it's very stereotyped. Um, and then the surprising thing as well is that actually uh, birds can land just fine on Teflon. We couldn't see any difference actually in terms of perching success. The only thing is that on Teflon, Teflon they will slip a little bit. You uh, can see this, but they are able to adapt and perch just fine. Uh, so it's very robust. Uh, and the way they do this, uh, they have a stereotyped approach to the uh, perch, but then uh, as soon as they touch the perch, uh, their grasp becomes surface specific. And I would like to highlight some features of how they do all of this. Um, so they use claws to find asperities on the surface and they can do this remarkably fast. Uh, within about one to two milliseconds, they can slip from one asperity and find another one. How do they do this? Well, of course, no muscle uh, can contract without, within a, a millisecond. So it's really with tendons that are pre-stretched. And this is an important feature of uh, the way they grasp complex surfaces. And then another feature of how they do this is that they change the claw angle uh, with how hard uh, it is to grasp the surface. So the large diameter is the most difficult to grasp, but also Teflon is very hard to grasp. And you'll see that they actually will claw, they will change the angle in their claws, so curl their claw more um, so they can find asperities better. Another thing they do is they actually squeeze hard to grasp surfaces less. And you could imagine, you know, squeezing a large diameter Teflon perch yourself or cylinder 
uh, with your hand and you'll notice that actually it will slip away. So this is to prevent slipping. Uh, so how do birds land reliably on different surfaces? They land stereotypically and then adapt food surface interactions upon contact. And what is the inspiration that we got for robots? Well, curl claws more and squeeze less on harder to grasp surfaces. And we're actually very interested in applying this into new uh, aerial robots, uh, uh, robots that can perch, but also graspers in general. And so here I'm presenting one of the robots that we developed. Um, this was uh, developed by my student, Will Roderick. And you'll see a robot on the right that can perch on real branches like a bird can. And actually it's very dynamic. Within 20 milliseconds, it grasps a branch without having uh, measured it in some way. So, you know, the, almost the entire mechanism is passive. There's some active elements in them that are critical, uh, but there is no beforehand observation of the perch properties. So it's really the mechanism that can deal with the uncertainties. Now, uh, the way the mechanism works is actually uh, quite sophisticated. Um, what happens is that uh, there's a spring inside that's pre-tensioned uh, beforehand. And when uh, the uh, feet actually uh, make a controlled collision with the perch, uh, then um, the ankle joint falls. Uh, and that way the collision energy is transferred into tensioning the spring further. And then when uh, the ankle joint reaches a critical angle, actually there's a small uh, a quick release that then lets the spring actually uh, put great grasping forces on the feet. Uh, now, then uh, the robot continues actually to collapse with its legs, uh, but while doing that, it's actually special toe pads uh, that provide reliable friction. They're actually soft and wrinkled. They're very specific in their design and they're essential to the success. Without, it cannot perch very well on complex surfaces. There are actually also these claws that provide very high reliable uh, uh, a very high reliable friction force as well on asperities. That's also critical to add. Uh, and while it's collapsing further, at some point, uh, the, uh, there's a lack, uh, locking ratchet that once the robot has come to a full standstill, uh, make, make sure that the uh, robot uh, can uh, continue grasping passively. It can also release again and then uh, take off. So, um, that's sort of in short how the robot works. What's uh, interesting about these types of robots is also that you can do experiments that you could never do in a bird. So here we exchange the foot morphology to answer a question that biologists had, like, you know, is there a significant difference in perching performance if your foot morphology changes? And we found they perform about equivalent for normal perching conditions on real branches. Um, so let's then move on to our next uh, biological questions. And that one is on how birds can actually maneuver in trees uh, to fly around obstacles. And how do they use force vectoring for this? Well, um, if we think about the forces that birds generate in flight, uh, their wings generate lift and drag. And of course, the tail also generates a little bit of lift and drag. And you have to combine this, but it's really their wings that's most important. And if you look into uh, the Codex uh, of Bird Flight by Leonardo uh, that I had the ple pleasure to see the original of, you'll find these wonderful drawings of flapping wings where Leonardo already uh, explained to us how the flapping wings work. It's actually remarkable because these diagrams are the same diagrams that we make today in our papers to explain how flapping wings work. So, um, and then it was actually Michael Dickinson uh, at Caltech who made the first recordings of the 3D forces that flapping insect wings generate or animal wings in general uh, generate uh, by making a robotic model. Uh, but like, it's great to make a robot model, but then you still haven't measured the real forces. Uh, and this is something that we recently accomplished. My student, Diana Chin, actually did this. And as you can see, there is also an evolution in uh, smiles. Okay. So how does she do this? So she developed uh, this uh, aerodynamic force platform. It's a little bit like a force platform for terrestrial locomotion, but then for aerodynamics, and you can find the details in the various papers that we wrote on this technique. Uh, also analytical proofs, how it works. Uh, but basically with this setup, we can measure the aerodynamic forces, directly time resolved of any flapping wing, could be a robot, could be a bird, doesn't matter. And we also measure the forces on the perches during takeoff and landing. And here you see the first 
uh, in vivo measurement of lift and drag force in a bird. In green, the weight, in the blue, the lift, and in red, the drag. And note that the red drag factor actually points up upon takeoff. And that's remarkable. The bird actually supports its body weight with drag for 50% during takeoff, which no aircraft can. So drag is useful in birds. And then upon landing, you'll actually note that the lift factor is pointing backwards. Uh, and so it helps the birds to break. And that's really with the last beat, uh, about 25% uh, contribution to breaking. Okay, um, so we analyzed uh, these wing beats. Here you see time resolved, how the forces actually develop the lift and drag forces in a wing beat. And here you see it quantified for the first wing beat, you see that the vertical force, net vertical force contribution by drag and red is about the same as lift. Uh, so 50-50, and it's really remarkable. You would not find this in any aerial robot or aircraft. Uh, and upon landing, uh, actually lift is pointed backwards to help breaking. Okay, so now we can use this technique to see how birds actually maneuver around obstacles, which we did. And here you see some trials where the birds are maneuvering around obstacles over and under. Uh, and what we found is actually that they uh, combine a very large range of body angles and stroke plane angles, as well as uh, force factoring angles with respect to the uh, stroke plane to actually uh, um, uh, maneuver around obstacles. Um, and especially the force factoring is uh, remarkable because it wasn't thought that animals would be doing this. Uh, it was thought they would fly more in like helicopters, but they really don't. What they do is they change the lift to drag ratio of their wing to point uh, the force factor backwards. They do this by increasing drag. Uh, or by increasing lift and reducing drag, they can actually point it forward and they use this actively in flight. Um, the paper just got accepted. You can see it in the interface in the following month or so. Uh, so how do birds use force factoring in arboreal environments? Uh, well, it turns out they can reorient their stroke plane by 100 degrees, which is really a lot. Uh, and then they can also uh, manipulate aerodynamic force by about 30 degrees, which is also a very large range. Um, and what we are learning from this is that we could combine bimodal locomotion with aerodynamic force vectoring to locomote in trees, which is something I'll be working on in the near future. Um, and then finally, um, how birds do uh, morph their wings. And we actually measured this by uh, figuring out how feathers move with respect to the skeleton. And it turned out to be surprisingly linear. That's the main find you can see in these graphs. Um, it was much simpler than we expected. And then when we saw this, we realized we could actually recreate this in a robot, a biohybrid robot with real bird feathers. And you'll find out why this is relevant uh, quite soon. Here you see uh, the biohybrid robot morph, it's called PigeonBot. And by morphing asymmetrically, it can actually turn. Uh, here you see it doing it. Um, so that's one interesting aspect. And the way we do this is actually an underactuated under mechanism is we have a wrist joint, we have a finger joint that move uh, like uh, a bird's uh, uh, wrist and a bird finger would actually move. And then we have an elastic ligament that mimics uh, the tissue that we found in birds and redistributes the feathers passively. Um, and this might sound tricky and uh, uh, not accurate, but it's actually surprising. Here you see the uh, how the servos that we, and these are tiny lightweight servos that we embedded in the, in the um, uh, robot actually move. And what you'll find is that each feather really follows the servo motion very accurately. So even though there are oscillations in the servo motor, the feathers will have the same oscillations. Uh, and this has to do, of course, with the bandwidth limitations of this servo. Um, and the reason why it follows, uh, follows it so closely is because the natural frequency of the system, the feathers and their elastic bands, is 10 times higher than that of the servo motor bandwidth. Um, and that's why we get an extremely high reliability. Here we repeated uh, morphing many times and you'll see a very small standard deviation. We can really uh, control the position very accurately. And here you see it that static and dynamic wing motion uh, results in about the same errors, which are very small. And it shows that the transfer function is really stiffness dominated. There's no inertia effect. There's no damping effect that really matters. Uh, one thing we found in the robot is that it can actually steer by just moving its fingers, so its second digit, over the amount that a bird can move it, uh, so the range that we found in a bird skeleton. And uh, this can be used to uh, turn left or right. 
And then another thing that uh, we tested is actually how important is it to have these elastic bands, so the ligament versus feather contact uh, in this biohybrid uh, wing. And we also test this under high turbulence. And it turned out that both the elastic ligament and feather contact is essential to make the wing more reliably in high turbulence. Uh, why is this so? Well, it turned out that when we were sliding feathers over each other, we found out that they generate very high locking forces of 20 grams. For a bird, that it's about 300 grams. It's very high, actually. We were not expecting this. And where was it coming from? Well, it turned out that there is this uh, sort of directional Velcro between the feathers, now not within a feather, but between adjacent feathers that enable them to lock probabilistically and directionally. Uh, and it's actually a microscopic mechanism that required nano CT to unravel. Here you see a 10 micron 3D hook, a low bait cilia hooking on um, a hooked rami, that's a 2D hook. Uh, and so in green, that was actually the lower feather and in gray, the upper feather and they lock together probabilistically. And it's this 3D hooking mechanism um, that functions like directional Velcro, of which there's no engineering or other biological equivalent that enables bird wings to distribute the feathers passively with elasticity and still maintain control and prevent gaps because as soon as the feathers spread too far apart, they lock automatically uh, very reliably. And we tested this to work well. Uh, and with this, um, we're at the end of my presentation. Uh, so we learned that feathers are coordinated via elastic compliance and directional Velcro. And uh, we also got uh, some inspiration for robots. I presented the first by a hybrid robot with soft morphing wings and uh, one that's capable of rudderless flight. Um, I want to thank all my students and postdocs for their amazing research. I would like to thank all my collaborators and also the funding. Um, and then finally, uh, if anyone is interested or knows a student looking for a PhD uh, uh, position, working on robots like the ones I just showed, but then more advanced, please contact me. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, David, for the, as usual, very nice talk. Um, I think everyone enjoyed it here. So uh, do we have time for a small question before the break? Yes, Anibal. Anybody, could you please use this microphone? So, thank you very much for your inspiring work. I learned a lot from the presentation, so thank you very much. Uh, I just was wondering, uh, we have many detailed questions, but there were no uh, general questions, which is the following. How, how important do you think that it is the Autonomy in all these birds that been closing the loops by using perception of the environment and planning the trajectories and everything fully autonomous is uh, what do you think is important for practical things or many things can be done just with a very expert pilot and very good, uh, let's say, low level control and morphing design? What do you think? Ah, yeah, if I understood you. More than a question, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I understand you, thank you very much. If I understand your question well, it's about how important uh, autonomy is versus passive solutions. Yeah. And uh, what I can say about this is that I definitely think autonomy is important and uh, expands the uh, range of use cases. But one of the uh, critical errors, I think, in robot design is thinking that Autonomy solves everything, which is just not true. Machine learning is not a solution for a problem, but is actually a way, from my perspective, uh, from stepping away from solving the actual underpinning problem. If you can use a combination of machine learning and AI um, with smart body design in which there are passive solutions, then you would perform much better. If you would only use AI um, or uh, machine learning, I think you would not be able to solve many of the problems that birds uh, solve. Because if you look at their functional morphology and also the behaviors that they evolved to perform these complex behaviors uh, at a level that no robot can, you'll find that if we would give them, you know, a bad body, so to say, they could not do this at all. So, you know, you need a very good body with a very well-tuned design and you need a good brain. It's, you need both. 
And what we're finding is that many of the advances that we can hit, make here in, with robots um, are already significant if we don't solve the AI problem or the ma machine learning problem, but first get the body right. So what we do in my lab is we do it both. Um, like I showed in the last robots, uh, is it is autonomous. Um, it doesn't require a very advanced algorithm though, because we were very thoughtful about uh, how to design the algorithm for flight and turbulence. And of course it could perform even better with machine learning and we will be doing this in the future. Um, and I also think vision-based flight control is essential uh, to really expand the use cases and do even more cool things. Uh, but if the underlying mechanics and if the underlying sensing and the underlying integration and models uh, are skipped, then you would not be able to achieve what birds can. That's what we're learning from studying birds. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add that we agree and I also like the autonomy but based on physics. This is a very, very, very quick. Yes, no, uh, the chairman is, is uh, chased me out. So maybe very, very quickly. Uh, and first of all, thanks all for an excellent talk. Uh, in the definition of lift that you use, and uh, one of the things you showed is that in a classical one, because of course we are not in steady aerodynamics, so that you know the force you can decompose your you just decompose the, the totally integrated force each instant of time with respect to the angle of attack. So the basic definition is that what you use, is it right? Uh, yeah, the, the lift that we measure and the drag that we measure is really with respect to uh, the speed, so the uh, the way it's defined in aerodynamics. Yes, yeah, exactly. For the standard one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David, for the talk. Thanks, everyone. We will do a line with the coffee break and we will convene at uh, 10.45. Next speaker is, um, is Anibal Olero, food professor at the Ingegneria del Sistema Sia Automatica Department of University of, University of Sevilla. And uh, I am, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, to this speech. So, this, uh, this speech is called Griffin from Fully Autonomous Planning Wind Flight Manipulation. So, thank you, Federico, for the presentation. Uh, yes, this is the title. Uh, of my talk, and I will uh, uh, wait a minute. This is the outline. So, uh, Griffin stands for General Compliant Aerial Robotic Manipulation System Integrating Fixed and Flapping Wing to Increase Range and Safety. So, there are strong words here. So, you can see that, wait a minute, we have a uh, manipulation, so we need payload. But at the same time, we want to increase range and safety. So this is uh, something that we know difficult. So you can see the photograph that David Escaramuza take uh, last Wednesday after the dinner, just to remain briefing. <laughs> and then we have these uh, three points of the outline. The, the prototype, you can see a couple of them in the photograph. Then uh, I will talk about the fully autonomous flights and finally about the person and the, and the manipulation. So let's go. Um, I don't know why I'm not able to pass the slides. No? Okay, I will try with the mouse. So the challenges. So the challenge is, is to build pro relevant prototype. It's not trivial. This was a long discussion because we want to test both in the indoor test bed 20 meter and also outdoor. And we need a payload and we need maneuverability. So I will have this discussion later, but then we also want to model and to control these prototypes. And then we want to close the loop by using perception and planning. So just to start, I, I will recommend this uh, film that I don't know if you, it's a Spanish-French film, it's called The Brother of the Wind, and the, <clears throat> the director is uh, Gerardo Olivar. It's about wind, it's about eagles. It's just about eagles, but it's not a documentary, it's a film. So you can see here some eagles, and they, they, they glide a lot in addition of flapping, and they can have perception, 
Pershing. So all these, there are many Pershings, many perception functions, many planning functions. And later, in addition of the, these functionalities, we would like to have manipulations. So that means interactions with the peak or with the lens. And then we want to maintain the equilibrium at the same time that we are manipulating, which is something that is uh, also very, very complex. So um, this is the list of prototypes. So we have first this, the first prototype that is in your uh, yellow, that is in your video of the workshop because it was uh, more than two years ago. And later we define different prototypes, we construct new different prototypes. Some of them coming from more robotic people. You can recognize the top right because this is some people that want to work in manipulator, then then they put the wings, just adding wings. This is flying, but it's not very efficient. Then we went to the other prototype that you can see there in the second row, in which we are flying now uh, with different characteristics. And in the last year, we added also a number of uh, clothes, a number of mechanisms to be able to perch and to manipulate. So one of the more elaborate uh, uh, prototypes for this one is about 500 grams. It's about uh, 1.5 wingspan. But it's able to carry uh, 500 grams in paper, including also the electronics and so on. So I will show you the video summarizing the characteristic of this prototype that was presented the last iCraft last year. So important uh, to be very easy to assembly, important to be low cost because we built many different prototypes. Could be built in short time, but it's also significantly better than the previous one, more robust. They can crash, we can be small enough. Very important also to stabilize the, the, as you have in the previous discussion, the tail and the wings. The wing is uh, cumbered or flat, and we have also this uh, stability. And you can see some of the characteristics of the amplitude uh, and the diagonal angle, you will see, you will see later. Then the electronics is uh, the navigation system, battery, the motor, brushless, and the navigation system. And then we have an onboard computer, a CADAS, uh, in addition of the nano pipe to process in real time the images and compute the flight uh, trajectories. So you can see here, including the, the weight, the total weight. So the features are like this. So we can fly between two and six meters per second. Uh, we like very much the maneuvering, so we will see more maneuvers later, but that's also depend on the payload, of course. So with the uh, 450 at that time, we can sustain the, the flight. But we can also maneuver, as uh, we will see immediately, with different uh, angle of attack. So in the experiments, uh, we have uh, this. But also with the maximum payload, you have this depending on the payload, we have the different trajectories and the different payloads that, that can be analyzed in the paper. You can see how it's uh, maneuvering in a more detailed way here. Now uh, we are also maneuvering lateral control, so we are able to do that in our 20 meter uh, test bed. And we also have outdoor flights. So the outdoor flights can be done in some facilities that we have near, near the, the building, near our building, so we are able to fly without uh, any permission as well. So we can fly every day. And finally, I would say that this is impact resistant because we built many of them. But in any case, I think that it is convenient that they, they can crash without uh, necessarily uh, breaking any parts and so on. So it's impact resistant. Now let's go uh, to the next. So obviously we wanted to model and then we model by using our dynamics models and our uh, aerodynamic models. So uh, the dynamic model will be the same for the uh, wing and the data, the, the main body. But for the for the <coughs> aerodynamic, obviously we design uh, depending on the gliding and the flapping phases for the wing, and also we have a detailed model of, of the tail. Uh, we use previous results of some of uh, our researchers. And we also compare with the, the other semi theories in such a way that they have a number of papers with many results that we can use and we can compare. 
So we use all these to build our first models, and then we improve it um, and we tune it, our models using the fly in the, in the test bed with millimeter accuracy. So we have computational dynamic and then aerodynamic is a classical in floppy wings. We also validate in the wind tunnels the, the, the tails and so on, and we have our models by using their nonlinear models using Volterra identification. This is in this uh, paper recently published. And you can see the most uh, significant conclusion here is that when you compare with the Theodorsen theory, they overestimate the, the lift. However, our lift, which is uh, given in this figure, is almost the same that we compute in the real flights in the test. So the model that we did it performed almost perfectly the flights in the test. So this was a result that we have. But again, we wanted to have more payload, how to analyze, how to design flexibility, more flexibility, more joint, passive joints. So this is about flexibility. So we designed a number of uh, techniques, the open source uh, by using the vortex latex method. And we put uh, some uh, markers in the wings, in all the wind, and then we compare the motion in the motion capture system, and then we compute the <clears throat> how is uh, this behave in this. So we were able to characterize this uh, this flappy. So we submitted this, and we obtained some some results recently. Even we were able to fly, and then we also want to control. I will show later the morphing stuff. So the morph because. Obviously, we want to increase the control properties, not only using the tail, but also as, uh, as uh, Dario and also David presented, we want to have some, some morph. So folding asymmetrically, we can do, but that's also the pain of the maneuver. So we did some work here, and then we have submitted to the robotics and automation method in such a way that with relatively simple morphing asymmetrically, we can increase the control and then we are able to perform some better some maneuvers, but of course we want to work symmetrically also to, to increase gliding performance. And we did some flights indoor and outdoor again, and we are able to increase from 400 grams to 800 grams the payload. For us, the payload is very important because we have to carry many things. So this was uh, good in terms of, uh, of results, of practical results. And here is the paper that we submitted. Okay, and then the second is to add a joint in the in the in the wing. So we have a passive joint there, and then you can see the results because it's interesting to see how we can improve the lift again. Improve the lift, and then uh, you can see that the, in the downstroke you you increase significantly the lift, even if it is it's not compensated by the the, the upstroke because you can see that the, the mean lift increased significantly. Now, the problem is to select the parameters. So we have to select this angle phi and this uh, distance. And we have a lot of analysis to optimize the selection and then to, to have this new design that we have with the... The moment is flying in the, in the test. So let's go a little bit faster because. And finally, about the tail. About the tail is very interesting. We have the comparison of different tails, which is the classical delta, the classical inverted T, and the V tail. So in the last design, we have the V tail, which is a little bit better than the, the classical inverted T. We know how to perform better with the inverted T, but uh, we need also to have more. Uh, maneuverability at the same time that we maintain the stability. And we found that this detour has some advantages. You can see the details in this, uh, in this paper that we presented in IROS uh, last IROS. And um, well, concerning the fuselage, just a comment, essentially, it's intuitive. If you go to very fast, 
if you increase the velocity, fuselage is very convenient, but flying relatively uh, low velocity, two, three, four meters per second, it is not very important. But in any case, we put the, the fuselage and then we increase a little bit the performance. Then for the control, and I am not I have no time to describe what we did in control, but essentially we are applying some Lyapunov based nonlinear guidance and we adapted the parameter in Angela for concentrating in the maneuvering of uh, Pershing, so landing and Pershing, and then we try to optimize the parameter. So we have some results in that, that I have no time to describe. Um, yeah, finally, I would like to feel like this part with this experiment. You can see how this is. Again, the maneuverability, I wanted to have this go up and then fly in horizontal mode. And this is what we did. Well, there is a little bit uh, leap forward, but now it's fly, flying kilometers, flying kilometers. And now the problem is, how is this the, the power compared with the friction? So we put a couple of uh, small propellers and then we compare the energy, uh, I mean the, the box multiplication of the intensity by the, by the voltage in flapping and fixing mode. And we were happy when we have seen that. So it's 200 watts in fixed wheel and only 65 watts in flapping. So that is very good results in terms of, you can see in the down uh, figure that the oscillations correspond to the flapping. But uh, in fixed, we have more, we need more now. It's fixed wheel, we need more power. However, I am not sure. I am not very sure about this because, okay, finally you possibly need to optimize, you possibly need to optimize the design to fly better as fiction. But anyway, the results are interesting. Now, uh, we close the loop by using the event cameras. So here the discussion, should we concentrate more in the application of more sophisticated control law or should we go to improve the perception? So we decided, second, we improve the perception by using event cameras and closing the loop by means of the event camera. So right now we have a pretty fast closing the loop of more than some hundreds Earth. So now this experiment was 100 Earth, but now we are closing to and 300 Earth. So that means that we are able to, because um, perception people develop this uh, processing asynchronous processing of the events of the event camera. This was presented in this workshop, and you will see more details later in the presentation of Juan Pablo, which is immediately after mine. And then we close the loop by using the, as you can see here, uh, with the line detection and tracking, then we use the visual point to close the loop at that time between 100 and 200. Now, I repeat that they are close, we are closing the loop up higher, more than 200. And then again, the, the control is to control the two variables in the T, uh, T inverted T configuration is the, the rather and the, uh, the two variables that you can see for the horizontal and, and, and lateral control. So here you can see that uh, we fix the, the position and the guidance is, is good. So we are going, we are closing the loop with the, with the event perception system. Well, um, interesting also, I presented yesterday, this, uh, this paper is from Juan Pablo, that he provides more details, so you can crash, but if you're able to detect in real time, you are able to avoid, you are able to avoid by this uh, closing loop system, by means of a very, very simple control law. So this uh, using just a volume to characterize the, to characterize, sorry, using a volume to characterize the, uh, <clears throat> the flapping wing and also a volume to characterize the object, we are able to compute this volume, the intersection of this volume. In practice, you only need to compute a couple of angles and to apply these angles for the two control variables in the control of the tail. And then you are able, if you blow the loop of almost 300 Hz, you are able to avoid at, with light good lighting condition and bad lighting condition that be dark, indoor and outdoor. So Juan Pablo can also explain more. But let's go the last minutes to the, 
and to the manipulation. The manipulation we want to have from the beginning. So we have been expertise on manipulating with the multilateral system, as you can see on the right. But now we want to have also manipulation capabilities in our works. How to do that? First, we need the payload to do that. But, uh, and why? This is why the concept is the following. So we want to perform inspections, for example, in some places where the conventional multi-rotor system cannot enter, for example, ATEX and so on. Without propellers, it could be more possible to do that. We can also fly over people without propeller. So this is also more safe. And also we want to interact physically. So the idea is to, <clears throat> to have uh, the possibility to purge and then manipulate. So we also evaluate the possibility of uh, grasping flying, as uh, for example, Dario mentioned this morning, but now we are concentrating in person and later manipulation. So the idea is to be able to close the loop with this. So I am not going to detail here the Pershing results because the Pershing results are the subject of a paper that is right now submitted. And then uh, I would prefer to skip this explanation just to let you know that we are working in high speed and force uh, uh, grasping and tolerant to misalignment. And also we are able to close taking into account the, the perception. But I will not uh, give the details of this. We are developing the clouds and we are developing the manipulators. Um, you can see how is the person here. Here you cannot see the details. So this kind of the experiments are included in the paper that is here. This on the review, so I will not give the details. No. In parallel, we are developing a bio-inspired clothes because the previous one was based on spring and so on, but now it's more bio-inspired by using shed memory alloys actuated. So we want to grasp and to interact with people by using this uh, new clothes. So you can see here how this is uh, being developed. And we also integrated in the first prototype that you can see in the, in the upper side. So this is the part of the class. And finally, I would like to show why manipulation. There are different ways of manipulation. So if you want to maintain the stability and you have a <clears throat> passive degree for freedom, just friction in the base, it is difficult to maintain the degree. But we want to maintain and even more, we want to uh, perform a trajectory in the tip with the effector, for example, to perform a inspection at the same time that you maintain the key. So we did this and we control this uh, prototype to perform a given trajectory maintaining the, the key. So this uh, obviously depends on the flow and the, the friction in the base, but this is something that can be already performed as you can see here. Now, in parallel, we are also adding uh, a peak. At this peak is uh, with a beam, flexible beam, as you can see here. The problem is using the information from two extreme rods, just detect the time of the contact, the, the position of the contact, and also the force exerted in the contact. I presented uh, last Wednesday here. And you can see here how uh, this can be performed, just estimating the force and the position in real time by using the model that we develop this beam as a part of the flexible manipulator. So we are able to, to be able to grasp objects of different size and different softness or hard. But in all the cases, we are able to detect and estimate in real time the position and the force, so we are able to to grasp essentially, as you can see. Okay, now just finalizing, we are installing now new manipulators to be able to perform more sophisticated things with this manipulator. So this is the size that we have. These are already flying. You can see that it's flying now. Um, so we think that it's we did some. Expert, we did some experiment, for example, picking picking leaves, as you can see here. Now, the last uh, 
prototype that we designed is with two arms. One could be useful, for example, to have a scissor and the other to maintain the, the lift. So we are performing some experiment with this. I will not show even with the visual feedback. So we are performing this. So right now. So but let's go to my conclusion because spending my time. So finally, my conclusions are the following. So first, we need to integrate a lot of things. So we develop many subsystems, but we want to integrate many things. And then uh, in addition of this, we think that uh, energy efficiency depends strongly on the wind, and this needs more research. Um, we also want to perform some particular autonomous mission related with application like logistics, search and rescue, inspections, and so on. Even we would like to have two flying at the same time, uh, even two manipulating cooperatively after purchase. So this is what uh, we want to have. So if you want to have more information, but first I would like to thank all the members of the different team. I would like, this is a significant work from my point of view, so I would like to thank all of them. Please go to the site and follow us. Um, we are trying to update as much as possible on this. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Anipa, for the nice talk and the impressive amount of experiment you presented. A small question, yeah, Dario. You, 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 I think you might uh, ask a question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was wondering what that is going to change the situation in the center of gravity in the aircraft. We measure uh, this in some of the design, we are able to to have a separation of the center of gravity of a few centimeters or even below one centimeter. So we always try to maintain the center of gravity in the same position. And then um, this is a design uh, concept. For example, here uh, you can see the manipulator at the left. I think that, yeah, uh, is almost uh, not modifying the, the, the center of gravity of the platform. So yes, we consider this and um, this is one of the parameters of the design. So here is millimeters. I don't think that's time for second question. We are uh, unfortunately out of schedule. Then I would like to thanks again, uh, Anika, for the talk. Okay, we we have now on schedule a series of uh, virtual speakers which uh, which presented their which submitted their work and will present the, their work in a ten minutes talk. So the first one is um, Juan Pablo Rodriguez Gomez. I invite him to I invite him to to connect and take the lead on our Zoom recording. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, we see you and we hear you. Perfect. Okay, just give me one sec. I'm finishing one thing here. Okay. Uh, so, hello to everyone. My name is Juan Pablo Rodriguez Gomez. I'm a PhD student at the GRBC Robotics Laboratory. And currently, I'm doing a research stay at the Technical University of Berlin with Professor Guillermo Gallego. And today, I am going to present our ongoing work on stabilizing event data on flapping wheel robots for simpler perception. Uh, okay. So the motivation of this work is about analyzing the challenges that we have for visual perception of flapping wheel robots. And among the different challenges that I found, I would like to highlight three of them. First is the limited payload that we have on these platforms that, of course, uh, limits the number of sensors and types of sensors that we can put on board. Second, the power consumption, uh, given by the fact that these platforms just can carry slim uh, batteries, so they cannot fit uh, big electronics and so on. And finally, the vibrations that are produced with the flapping motion. And this is particularly important in large scale flapping robots like, like EFLAP here. And this indeed affects a different, different type of vision sensors, such like uh, traditional cameras which suffer from motion blur. So uh, you can say, you can think about, okay, 
but we can cancel this effect by using a gimbal. Okay, yeah, that's right. But the thing is that putting a gimbal in a floppy robot with limited payload is not the best, the best idea if you want to have space for other sensors. Also, it increases the power consumption, and of course, it also can affect the stability of the platform. So in this presentation, what I'm, I'm proposing is a um, stabilization uh, method for the rotation of the camera using event cameras. So uh, let me uh, explain, well, I guess Araniva already talked about the Griffin project, but my role in the Griffin project is to use event cameras or analyze event cameras for plugging robots. And of course, these cameras offer uh, really special uh, features, such so like a microsecond resolution, high dynamic range, and low power consumption. But especially what I want to point out here is that event cameras are really robust to motion blur. And here you can see an example of uh, this that is rotating really fast. And on the top, we have a standard camera, which is Capture, capturing frames with motion blur due to the effect to the fast motion of the dot on the disk. And on the bottom, we have the events. And those events are not suffering from motion blur. And indeed, they are just produced by the changes of uh, lighting conditions on I mean, change of the intensity on the image. And basically, those pixels here are just representing the motion of the dot on the on the diagram. So on the equation project, I have analyzed the suitability of using traditional cameras and event cameras on uh, flapping robots. And it turns out that we found that in, by increasing the flapping frequency of the of the robot, of course, the number of blur images increases, right? And this is particularly hard for computer vision algorithms. But still, event cameras don't know suffer from, from motion blur. And this makes them particularly interested for this type of problems with uh, flapping robots. Moreover, I guess that Aniva already mentioned this. So in this in this case, we were tackling the problem of visual guidance with uh, a flapping wheel robot. But we, uh, for the perception side, we were tracking some features of the of the space uh, with uh, event data that, uh, uh, let's say, fit the controller at really high frequencies to. <clears throat> Control the robot uh, and guide it towards the goal towards the goal position. And just to run, I, I present uh, our sense and avoid method for dynamic obstacles um, based on event based vision. And we use the event camera to recognize uh, dynamic obstacles and guide the robots towards a safe direction in which it avoids the collision to the, with the with the obstacle. So coming back to all our approach about event stabilization, here we have the event camera. Which is providing events in this format here. And many of the event cameras also include an IMU. So we're using the IMU information, uh, the linear acceleration and the angular velocity to stabilize and motion compensate them. These uh, blocks can be interchanged depending on the problem that we that we are going to solve. But uh, in general, the stabilizing the stabilization block is letting it is um avoiding or is canceling the rotation of the camera such that the events are not moving with respect to the changes of orientation of the camera. And the motion compensation part is aligning all the events such that when we put them in an image, we have like image with, uh, we have sharp image with high contrast. And then uh, we are gonna use these images to compute optical flow and then the near velocity of the, of the camera or the robot, uh, given by the fact that the stabilizer already canceled the rotational part of the motion. So here we have some examples. Here are the raw events in which uh, we see that they are moving with the rotational part of the of the rotational motion of the camera. And here we have the stabilized one. And you can see that the the objects in the in the scene they are not rotating as the camera is rotating. And in the motion compensated part, we are obtaining like sharp images. Here I have two different snapshots of the video that I presented before, in which we have the raw events that are describing the rotational motion of the camera. The stabilized ones that are stabilized with respect to these rotations, and the motion compensating that ones in which you can see that we, let's say, uh, obtain a sharp representation of the on the on the event image. So uh, to compute the linear velocity of the camera, we're using uh, the expected residual likelihood method, and we adapted for event information, which is uh, receiving a simple optical flow. And by using the optical flow and minimizing this function, we can compute the linear velocity of the camera. However, we say that our method is simpler because indeed, by using the stabilizer, we are almost canceling the angular, the angular velocity of the, of the camera. So that's an important thing here too. So uh, the method is receiving a input optical flow. And here I'm just showing two examples of uh, the optical flow that we can obtain from frames. Here is this additional frame from the Kiri data set. It's a grayscale image. And here is a time surface, which is a two-day representation of the events. 
from the NBC uh, data set, which is recorded uh, with different robotic platforms. And here we have some resources of the velocity estimation that we have here, that we obtain. So uh, we can see that our um, estimation is really close to the ground truth. Uh, still, we have still we have some uh, errors, but um, that's mainly to we, we think that is mainly to the fact of the resolution of the camera and the complexity of the motion. But I wanted to point out that if we compare our, our results with the result that we obtain with grayscale images, our um, result is as good as the ones obtained with the grayscale images, or even better. And here is the, there is an example in which we have <clears throat> frames against events. And this is a particular example of the NBC data set in which the camera is moving forward, but it's also suffering from some uh, bumping effect on the camera. And by computing the optical flow on the grayscale frames, we're having a lot of noise because the optical flow is suffer, suffer from this motion. And of course, it affects the linear velocity estimation. While here, by using our stabilization and the red data, we have a cleaner, uh, a cleaner approximation which is way better to compute the linear velocity of the cameras as we are proposing since the beginning. So uh, going back to IFLAB, which uh, is the robot that we're using to test this, we're using the Griffin Perception data set, which is a data set that we recorded a couple of years ago by mounting a event camera and a traditional camera in, an, uh, yeah, a traditional camera in, in a platform robot along with uh, other sensors, and we captured uh, different information from different scenes. And you can see here two examples of the different uh, scenes that we recorded is a soccer scenario in, and this one, the desperate one, in which we are showing like event, accumulated events in in frames. And now I'm gonna show you the, the result that we are obtaining with the, the I mean, our latest result on, on this one, because it's a support and ongoing project, and ongoing work on stabilizing the events on the flaps. So here on the left, you can see that uh, the frames that we're obtaining, the events that we're obtaining with the, with the event camera, in which they are being produced by the lateral motion of the robot, uh, the rotational part of the robot, and also these like changes in, on the roll angle due to the fact that the robot is like making a circular trajectory, which is one a complex trajectory for a flopping robot. Here on the right, you can see the stabilization. And in the stabilization, we can see that we are able to stabilize the events with respect to a desired uh, orientation. However, we are still dealing with the motion compensation part because, as I mentioned since the beginning, we are compensating the rotation of the of the of the events. However, in this part, we also take have to take into account the lateral motion that the camera is is, is having because uh, the flapping motion not only generates changes on the orientation but also on the translation. So this is like an open an open problem that we are dealing with right now. Uh, so. To conclude my presentation, well, I will present a method for stabilizing and motion compensate events using rotational information. Uh, I showed that using events produce a result as good or even better than using uh, grayscale frames, especially on very, very conditions. But still, we have open challenges. And it is the fact that we are pushing, I mean, so far we have developed a method to compensate and stabilize the rotational part, but we need more complex motion compensation solutions which are suitable for flapping with robots. And that's all from my presentation. If you have any question, I'm here for answering. And thanks for the invitation to this nice workshop. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Very, very nice project, very nice presentation. One small question. Alexander. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, Thank, you. Wondering Thank you. You show videos with a lot of features. Is, is that your algorithm work equally well for high amount of features or videos with low amount of features? Can you repeat? Sorry, is the audio is you have a lot of people uh, in there. And, and I have some issues with the audio here. Okay, so so okay, does great. your algorithm work equally well for videos with low amount of features and videos with high number of features? So far it is. So far on the test that we have been performing, uh, the algorithm is going almost in real time. So all the videos that I am showing, I of, co of course put in a slow mode just to show the effect of the flapping uh, motion, but uh, it is almost going, uh, it is not being affected by the number of features that we're having on the, on the scene because uh, that's, that's what is happening. Okay, thanks. Thanks again, Juan Pablo. Thank you, bye-bye. Next speaker is King Zhu. I invite him to connect.
Okay, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Tintin, a graduate, a graduate student from Memorial University of Newfoundland, and thank you for having me presenting this workshop. And my presentation is about optimum design of a novel bell-inspired battle robot. And uh, compared with the conventional UAV, the bell-inspired flying robot has a flexible flapping wing to achieve more complex motions. And thanks to this, it has so many advantages like high agility and maneuverability, high flying efficiency, low energy consumption, and low noise. And the reason why I choose bite inspired robot rather than bird inspired or insect inspired is that bite has a highly flexible wing. And if you check this video, you can see during bite flight, uh, the it has a highly it has a high deformation of this wing shape and thanks to this uh thanks to this characteristic the bat in spare flying robot can generate active thrust with lower wing loading and higher maneuverability and here uh here you can see the picture about the bite wing and during the bite flight, the bite can fold their wing during the upstroke and extend their wing during the downstroke. And there are three main parts uh, in this bite wing. And, oh, sorry. Okay. And this part generates most of the thrust and this two part generates the most of the lift. And the morphology of the bite wing with the highly of flexible membrane cause the dimensional complexity of bite flight reach more than 40 degrees of freedom. So how to mimic bite morphology should be the top consideration in our novel bell inspired bite robot. And here is my bite robot design. It has a four DC motors and two of them control the folding and unfolding motion for each wing and the other two control the flapping motion for each wing. And there's a warm gear mechanism which can regulate wing folding during the upstroke and unfolding during the downstroke. It also uses the scissor kinematic to control the shoulder, elbow, and wrist angle by only one degree of freedom. And here in this picture, you can see there's a translucent part that's a silicon based membrane which shares the similar properties with the real bite skin. And this picture shows the comparison of the wing structure between the biological bite and the bite robot. And in our robot, uh, it has two four bar linkages. And the first one, A, B, C, D here represents the humerus here. And the second one, E, F, G, B represents the radius. And the three digits in our robot is one part E, F. And this is the optimization overview. And our optimization goal is to let our bat robot mimic the real bat morphology. And during this whole process, I uh, curve fitted the uh, fly pin angle as a fifth order polynomial and then fixed them during this uh, whole optimization. And first I start optimizing the folding angles and uh, I choose the parameters for folding angles randomly like a1 a2 a3 a4 a5 a6 to determine the initial folding angles and then with the fixed fly pin angles and fixed structure dimensions uh, i use the homogeneous transformation to calculate forward kinematics to get the cartesian positions for the seven reverend joint pa to pg and then use these uh, cartesian positions i uh, conduct the principal component analysis. First, I assemble these positions into data, uh, data matrix I'm hat, and then assemble the, uh, the corresponding biological data into another data matrix I'm, and then go through this uh, process and reconstruct the, reconstruct the data matrix by the first two principal components and then I can get MR and MR hat. Here, the reason why I choose the first two principal components is that based on current research, the first two uh, components can represent over five, over 50% of byte kinematics. So on this type, I designed the cost function via the weighted sum method. And here, F1 is the difference between these two data matrices. And 
here F2 is the difference of uh, between the elbow angle of the bite robot and the biological bite. And then I use the MATLAB optimization function I've maintained to get the optimal uh, optimal folding angles parameters AFO and then I use this one to optimize the structural parameters. So here is pretty similar the process and then I can get the optimal the optimal structural parameters and then I go back to optimize uh, new folding angles. So uh, basically what I did is just uh, optimize these two values, folding angles and the structural dimensions uh, iteratively until both of them stay unchanged. So here you can, oh, sorry. So here you can check the uh, sim, uh, optimization result. And this is a simulation in the uh, SOLIDWORKS. And from this video, you can see the this Bite robot extend their wing during the downstroke and fold their wing during the upstroke. And uh, here there are two trajectories, and this one is for the elbow, and this one is for the wrist. And this is uh, you can also check the result from these two figures. And the left one shows the comparison of the elbow and wrist trajectories between the robot and biological bat. And you can share, uh, you can see they share the pretty similar features, but there are still some differences between uh, these trajectories. And the reason why there are some different, uh, there are some differences, and is that our robot simplify the mechanism of the real robot. And you can find more detail in the paper. And here, the right figure shows the comparison of the elbow angle between the robot and the biological bat. And from these two curves, you can see uh, they have a similar a similar mean and the range. And uh, currently, I'm conducting the Vintano uh, experiment to get some aerodynamic uh, properties for my robot because uh, because it has a uh, highly flexible wings and it, and it has a strong fluid structure interaction so there's no uh, there's no CFT software available for me to just simulate the aerodynamic properties. Okay, that's all. That's pretty everything. Thank you. Thank you, Ting, for the nice project and the nice speak. Um, we are we are a bit late, so if there are any questions, I invite you to post them to Ting directly on the Zoom chat. chat if, if this is okay, I would like to to switch to next speak. So Kevin Chen from MIT. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Uh, let me share a screen. I'm good. Can you see my screen? Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'm a new faculty at MIT, and our groups work on agile and robust microaerial robot powered by soft artificial muscles. So first, I just want to give you a high-level picture of what we want to create in the longer term. We want to create a swarm of ubiquitous and multifunctional micro robot that can operate in a realistic environment. Now, I've worked in this field for about 10 years, and uh, up until now, a lot of the micro-scale flying robots we see are very precise, capable of doing multiple things in multiple environments. My colleagues are solving key problems in uh, creating sensors and actuators. They're also thinking about putting uh, small batteries on board. I would argue that we still have something that we haven't thought too hard about, which is how to make a lot of them effectively, and also how to teach them to interact with, uh, uh, to, to interact with their surroundings, just like insects. Um, what I have proposed to do is we look into a similar field, soft robotics. For the past five to 10 years, people know how to make soft robots very effectively. And those soft robots are robust against collisions. Um, there are different challenges in soft robotics in terms of control and sensing. And in terms of power, there are also pneumatic and chemical sources. But soft robots also face key challenges. Specifically, a lot of them operate at a low frequency and they're not as precise. And that's exactly uh, very troublesome for aerial robot because we need high power and we need very precise control. So what our lab focuses on is merging those two fields and create a new direction of what I call hybrid soft rigid microscale robot. 
The idea is to create a microscale robot that's powered by a soft actuator shown here. That's a dielectric elastomer actuator. We spend a lot of time optimizing the soft actuator, and we compare this with a state-of-the-art piezoelectric actuator and show that we can achieve a reasonable high bandwidth of on the order of 500 hertz, whereas we can have very large motion on the order of 10% strain. And because it is soft, it's tolerant to assembly error, so we can make a lot of them very effective. So putting this soft actuator into our robot, we can show a flapping wing motion at 300 hertz. In this case, this robot can generate sufficient force that it can achieve takeoff. So about three years ago, we incorporated the soft actuator into a flapping wing robot, and we demonstrated the first uh, takeoff flight. As you can see in a high-speed video, those soft actuators really look like biological muscles. They elongate and contract. But from a roboticist perspective, right, this doesn't look very interesting yet because the robot itself is intrinsically unstable. So it flips over within 0.1 seconds, and without stability, really, the robot flips over and can't do much. Our next goal is to stabilize the robot. And for, for those of you who can't see the video clearly, this is a composite image showing the same flight. So to stabilize the robot, we put two units together and we used a phenomenon called precession. And the idea is that the robot is going to rotate relative to its yaw axis very fast and leverage the precession to passively stabilize itself during ascending flight. And again, I'm not going to the mathematical details, but let me say that in both experiment and simulation, we're able to show passively stable ascending flight. And this is quite remarkable because again, without tails, without any sensing or feedback control, a insect scale robot is able to just fly upward without um, any sensing needs. And this is again shown in both experiments and simulation. Again, I'm showing a composite image showing the same experiment for those of you who can't see this clearly. So now I've shown you with one unit of this robot, we can demonstrate takeoff flight. With two units, we can demonstrate passively stable ascending flight. The ultimate question is, are four unit robot controllable? Can we achieve controlled hovering flight in soft aero robot? And my team has been working on the controller for the past few years. Now I'm showing you a hovering flight played in real time. So this is a 20 second hovering flight. And as you can see, the robot is quite stable. It hovers around the set point for 20 seconds. The maximum position error is about two centimeter and the maximum attitude error is about two degree. So arguably, this is the longest and best performing flight performed by any of the sub-brand uh, robots. So now I'm showing you that soft robot can achieve a lot of the flight capabilities that rigid robot can do. Let's think about additional functions. The first one that comes to mind is the actuator is robust, so you can repeatedly run the wing into an obstacle and the robot sees no damage. In fact, we can measure the instantaneous current to detect collisions. What I also want to show you is you can drive the actuator really hard and you can demonstrate somersault, which is very difficult to achieve in similarly scaled rigid robots. And also, very recently, we enabled the robot to shine out light um, when it flies, and that turns out to be a very effective way for tracking. Okay, so first, inspired by a very famous MIT robot, the MIT Cheetah Mini, we want to demonstrate two things. We want the robot to be able to recover from collisions, and we want the robot to be able to do a somersault. So let me show you the first collision recovery flight. So first, you know, we can gently push down on the robot when it flies, and the robot recovers to the hovering set point. Now, this is not very surprising. I think most of the quad rotors can do that as well. What is quite remarkable is because of the very tiny inertia, you can now hit other places of the robot. For example, how about if I hit the robot actuators? Or better yet, how about if I hit the robot wings? Imagine hitting the propeller of a quad rotor. That would be very challenging for the quad rotor to recover. Or I can hit the robot really hard, right? Uh, and because the robot has very small inertia, even if it recover, even if it cannot recover, it can just try to bounce on the floor and recovers, right? Just a matter of fact, because the inertia of the system is so small. Again, for those of you who can't see the same videos, I'm showing composite and then showing the three experiments again. Gentle collision can recover to the set point, a collision with the actuator and wings, and also a very harsh collision in which it has to bounce on the floor and recover. 
Okay, so next we want to demonstrate somersault. Uh, in simulation, we show that the time scale of the somersault is only 0.15 seconds. This is among the fastest uh, aerial robot that can complete a somersault. So let me show you the demonstration in real time. Okay. So in real time, you will see that um, the somersault happens very quickly, right? It, it's even hard to detect this naked eye. So let me play the same video again at a slower down rate. You will see that the robot first hovers, uh, fly to a position, hover for about two seconds, and then it accelerates upward, try to do a somersault. After it completes the somersault, it's trying to recover attitude, but just because our flight arena was tiny, it's not being able to quite recover attitude, but it bounces on the floor and eventually returns to the hovering set point. Okay, and something very challenging for tiny scale robot powered by rigid actuators. Okay, so again, showing the same composite image that demonstrates similar things, and this is a very repeatable process. The last thing I want to mention is that very recently we enabled electroluminescence, and that's inspired by fireflies in nature. We put electroluminescent particle in the soft actuator, and then the uh, robot flies, as you can see, turns on different colors and different patterns. So here we have MIT being lit up. And this turns out to be a very effective way for tracking. So we can use three iPhone cameras just to observe the flight from different perspectives. Okay, And using uh, some computer vision algorithms, we can track the position and orientation of the robot and compare it with Micron tracking. As you will see, the maximum position error is only two millimeter. Okay, so again, both attitude and position tracking are very good. In summary, we have created a soft actuated micro scale robot that is robust and agile. By robust, we mean they can recover from in flight collisions, and by agile, we mean that they can fly at a speed up to 70 centimeters per second, making it one of the fastest uh, soft robots. And finally, don't want to take too much time, just want to mention that we are very quickly improving our soft actuators and soft flies. Two months ago, we published a paper in which we got similar power density and lift to weight ratio compared to the state of our rigid power micro scale robots, and the actuation voltage is substantially reduced. And we are now working on thinking about new control method and also new power electronics. So, hopefully, one day we can build a swarm of power and sensing autonomous microscale soft aero robot. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for the impressive uh, work and the great presentation. As for Ting, I, I, uh, I wish that you pose the question directly on the Zoom so we can keep the schedule. Thanks, thank sure. you. thanks a lot. Thank you. So next uh, speaker, Fan Jian Liu. I invite you to connect again. Uh, hi, I'm Fang Yun Liu. Uh, now I'm a, a PhD candidate from Beihang University, China. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a motor driven flapping wing rotorcraft with two uh, mechanically decoupled wings, uh, and I will show the demonstration of its takeoff. Flapping wing rotorcraft is a distinct design from flapping wing robots. Uh, it combines flapping and rotating motion into one element. Uh, thus, it integrates the high efficiency character of rotors and high lift character of flapping wing with, uh, under low Reynolds number. Uh, a variety of validation ex experiments about flapping wing rotorcraft have been conducted, uh, which helped to prove the feasibility and advantages of flapping wing rotorcraft. Uh, however, there still remain many challenges in the existing flapping wing rotorcrafts. Uh, one is the fixed wing trajectory, uh, driven by linkage mechanism, uh, and uh, such kind of actuating system also makes the uh, design of flapping wing rotors complex and heavy. Uh, the other challenge is the large control surfaces, which are actuated by extra servos to control the attitude of FWR. To solve the above challenges, we designed a self-rotating FWR uh, with two mechanically decoupled wings, which is inspired by those wind diaspora seeds and the mo motor direct driven technique. The proper type of FWR weighs about 
12-point foregrams, and it flaps between 25 to 35 hertz with a wind spine of 185 millimeters. Each wind is directly driven by a single brushless motor, and each wind can change its flapping frequency, mid-stroke angle, flapping amplitude, depending on the signal added. For their uh, for its control strategy, because the two wings can be separately controlled, they can generate control tug uh, by changing their flapping motion as uh, as symmetrically real time. Uh, the direct driven actuator can be modeled as a torsion spring resonance system. Thus, the aerodynamic lift and power efficiency can be maximized by finding the natural frequency of this system. And this value can be estimate, estimated by a theoretical model firstly. Then uh, we conducted a series of experiments to find the proper work point uh, of the prop proposed FWR uh, in the experimental part, a high-speed camera is used to gain the deformation and the kinematics of the beam. Besides, we use a load sail to measure its average lift force. According to the results, the single wing can achieve about uh, 4 grams lift at the natural frequency with a uh, 20 voltage input. Uh, with the increase of the voltage, it can have a maximum of uh, 7 grams at 28 voltage added. Uh, in the end, we conducted a lift-off demonstration. The designed prototype can take off stably, and it has a maximum weight of 16 grams considering the power wires. Uh, that's all about our work. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Fang Yeo. Thank you very much, Fang Yeo. Uh, since you have uh, made a pretty good time, you have time for one small question. Is there anyone in the audience? It appears not. Uh, then uh, I invite everyone to pose their questions in the chat if they have one. And then I would like to welcome Sawyer Fuller, uh, our next speaker. Um, Mr. Fuller, you have the floor is yours. Um, my name is Sawyer Fuller, um, and I uh, am an assistant professor at the University of Washington uh, in mechanical engineering. Um, and this talk is about taking um, inspiration from the intelligence of insects to create small uh, and really tiny flying insect-sized robots. So uh, my goal is to create things that are as capable and intelligent as this fly here. Um, it performs these amazing maneuvers entirely using onboard um, power control uh, and actuation systems. Um, and it powers itself using its sense of smell actually to uh, find its way to energy sources like food. So uh, we wanna make something yeah, you know, as amazing as this, um, but we have a ways to go. Uh, the challenges here are basically that so far we have a pretty good um, actuation system uh, with piezo actuators and laser based uh, composite, smart composite microfabrication also known as SCM. Um, but really, if you look into it, uh, there's, there's, there's hints of where to go, but basically uh, nothing else um, is done on the side of um, energy systems for very tiny insect-sized robots, um, control systems, or um, uh, sensing systems to make them fly on their own. So um, uh, the reasons are twofold, I claim. Uh, the first is that we have um, just kind of classic miniaturization problems. Uh, we have constrained size, speed, weight, uh, and power. And normally you hear swap, and I've added an extra S in there because of speed. Um, the, uh, the, the speed, because as the things get smaller, they, they go faster. So we have speed constraints as well. We need a very fast system. Um, and the second one is um, uh, uh, phase transitions in the governing physical scaling laws. Um, as you go down and scale, different effects begin to dominate, as you, as you well know. Um, this leads to, in many cases, uh, so-called phase transitions, where uh, maybe a traditional uh, approach um, for aerial flight or power or something like that doesn't apply. Um, and, you know, kind of the 
maybe the canonical example of this is small animals. If you look at them, they, um, as you know, flap their wings continuously rather than glide because the uh, increased uh, viscosity of small scale. Um, so my claim, um, and this is um, kind of inspired a lot by a, a paper written by myself and uh, Hito and colleagues uh, recently got accepted into science robotics, um, is that we need um, kind of an insect inspired approach that uh, really takes thinks about closely thinks about two in, uh, key ideas. Uh, the first is this notion of parsimony, uh, which is very simple and efficient systems. Um, and the other one is to um, uh, this, this often will manifest itself as a reliance on uh, in, 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 instead of a sensor actuator feedback loop, trying to build in the intelligence uh, into the mechanics of the system. So we call that mechanical intelligence. Uh, so this is how I think we're going to kind of under overcome these problems. And in many cases, we're going to need to use different approaches um, than uh, our, um, our, what we see in larger robots. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to next uh, spend the next few minutes talking about some uh, recent recent uh, uh, research vignettes from uh, my research group, the Autonomous Insect Robotics Lab, uh, kind of aiming to tackle these problems. Uh, we operate at the beautiful University of Washington in Seattle, uh, which is a, a super great, amazing university uh, surrounded by a, kind of a thriving tech scene. Uh, okay, so let's go through this. Okay, so we'll start with power. Start with a power story here. So uh, when it comes to power, I think probably our most promising power source for small insect-sized robots is solar. Um, and um, uh, when it comes to power, if you bear in mind that solar cells are now getting thin and light enough to float on a bubble, uh, that means that their weight can almost be neglected, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but what can't be neglected is the surface area they exposed to wind on a flying robot. Um, and so uh, this is an opportunity for small scale, and that's because uh, you have this favorable um, surface area. Oh, that is not supposed to play yet. I'll do this first. I'll pause, see if I can pause that. Pause this. Okay, so um, ignore that for now. So you have this, let's see if I can go backwards here. Yep. Okay, so um, you have this, um, Scaling effect, which is this uh, this um, power needed, goes roughly as the um, kind of cross section, the, the size 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 length of the robot raised to the third. Uh, but the power you get from solar power goes as size squared because it's an area dependent effect. Uh, and what this means is you have uh, better and better kind of more and more power from your solar cells relative to the power you need as scale reduces if you keep everything else constant, which turns out to be a you know like the density of your robot. That's that's a, uh, and aerodynamics, um, and that's a reasonably good assumption. Um, so what this means is that uh, as you as you look across scales of, of aircraft, um, you you can plot kind of the, the the size of the aircraft on this orange line and the size of the so, so, solar photovoltaic you need on this blue line here. Uh, and at some point, the as you go to smaller and smaller scale, you, the the size length of your photovoltaic, which is the size the side of its um, uh, the the L of the cross, the, if it was a square array, the size would be the L, the, the width of the solar array. That length gets smaller and smaller, and you have a, a cross crossing point somewhere around about a gram where it starts being the case that the solar array is smaller than the, um, than the aircraft itself. Uh, and this has pretty good impl implications for meaning that, uh, and, and this, I should say, this plot shows um, that uh, where, uh, how big of an array you would need to fly continuously in one sun. And so what, what it says is down about a gram, you can have a array that is uh, below a gram that is smaller than the, cross, the, the size of the aircraft itself and still be able to fly continuously in one sun. Uh, so this is a pretty promising, I think, uh, potential way to power small robots um, if you have a lot of sun. And if you don't have that much sun, you can still maybe charge batteries and fly intermittently. Anyway, the point being, below about a gram, you can have a solar array smaller than the aircraft and still fly continuously. Uh, so a couple of vignettes uh, that we've been um, thinking about to exploit this idea as, we're, as we move toward fully functional robots. Um, 
down here is a video where we've been equipping a, a drone with a solar array. Um, in the spirit of minimizing air drag, it folds its uh, arrays down to uh, minimize wind. And then we use a mechanically intelligent system to actually um, fold the arrays back out when it lands just by using um, a ground effect uh, to, to blow them out when you land. Uh, this drone also uh, uses a rangefinder to detect where the ground is flat below it and actually uses a bacteria inspired search strategy to move to brighter areas to, to maximize the power it gets. Okay, moving along because we're uh, tight on time. Uh, next look let's look at um, let's look at uh, flight control on board. Um, here on the left is the first wireless takeoff of a robotic insect uh, from out of our lab back in 2018. Um, we created a tiny high voltage signal generator on board the robot and powered it with a laser. Um, but uh, this is this flight was an open loop. So kind of uh, more recently um, on the right, we've created a, the next generation of this. It's got two channels for both wings uh, to give you a sense of how truly small it is. This is a, a tip of a real normal pencil. So it's really small. Um, and what's new about this is this is a switched supply. And uh, instead of a high, high gain, high bandwidth linear controller, um, we actually use a microcontroller built on built in it. There's a little microcontroller here to learn that the sequence of pulses to uh, generate a controllable waveform of different amplitudes. And with this, we were actually able to generate the first uh, um, ability to precisely modulate the thrust coming out of the wings. Um, and this is kind of a, uh, an important step toward uh, doing full flight control. Uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? Maybe a couple minutes, something like that. You've got two more minutes, sir. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, okay, sensor autonomy, okay, moving on. Um, this is a paper that I'm not gonna talk too much about that uh, Yash, who I believe may be in the audience, a uh, grad student uh, working with me, uh, just presented at ICRA earlier, earlier uh, I think yesterday, um, where he's thinking about the uh, full sensor, uh, sensor suite for the RoboFly. Um, and this guy weighs uh, about 226, so also ultra light. Um, and uh, one of the ways it's a little bit simpler is that it um, it uh, doesn't estimate position, it only estimates velocity and altitude. Um, and so it only weighs uh, uh, a couple of toothpicks and it uses uh, about 21 milliwatts. Um, we're working on a follow-on. Uh, so one of the things we found is that gyroscope actually uses a fair amount of power. Um, we, we have a paper just submitted that maybe it will uh, might be possible to skip that power hungry gyro and use just an accelerometer, which is uh, much smaller and lighter. Uh, more news to come in that area. Um, let's see, and lastly, moving up the sensor autonomy hierarchy. So that, that sensor suite is for hovering. Uh, suppose you have hovering. Uh, here's a nearly complete solution for finding odor plumes uh, on a larger um, palm size robot. Um, it's, uh, it, it's notable both in that it uses a moth antenna for higher speed response. Um, but the other thing that's um, quite um, cool about it is it uses these wind vanes to automatically steer itself into the wind um, so that it's always in this kind of rotated um, coordinate frame where um, it, uh, it it's always steered into the wind. So instead of a sensor to sense the direction of wind, it just uses a so-called mechanical intelligent system to to always be in the rotated reference frame of the wind. Um, in this way, it's able to find its way to an odor source. Uh, there's an odor source here, uh, and actually avoid obstacles as well using some laser range finders. Uh, we call this the, the smell copter. Okay, so that is it for uh, the research vignettes. Um, the, so inclusion and conclusion, um, I want to espouse again, uh, there's, we have big challenges for creating really tiny autonomous robots. Uh, they're significant and we have a long ways to go. Um, but uh, in many cases, we can use these ideas of uh, uh, parsimonious and mechanically intelligent systems to uh, to solve problems related to miniaturization that um, maybe are unique to this small scale. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, we have maybe time for one small question. Otherwise, you can also pose the question on Zoom. Okay, this was the last talk before the lunch, so, uh, right?
Yes. Yeah, so we declare lunch break and we reconvene at time uh, 1 20 p.m. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Let's start with the second part of our workshop uh, challenges of uh, plumbing pipe robots. I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker of this afternoon session, Guido de Kron, which is a full professor at TU Delft and then head of the laboratory of peer inspired micro air vacuums. That's, uh, that's the lab where the Delft fly was, uh, was developed. So um, the job that Guido is going to, to present is called Be Inspire Artificial Intelligence for Flapping Wing Drones. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, so welcome. Uh, today, uh, oh yeah, let me start sharing one second. <laughs> Okay, so that went uh, smoothly. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm Gilles de Kroon, and uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of super interesting work uh, this morning. So uh, it was very nice. Uh, as a bit of a complimentary talk, I want to talk a bit more about uh, how can we make these flapping wing drones uh, autonomous. And I fully agree with uh, what David Lenting said. It's not only a matter of the mind; it's also a matter of the body and. Uh, you know, tuning these uh, things uh, to each other. Um, yeah, so it's not an overview of all the Delphi work, uh, but uh, we're going to talk about autonomy. So when uh, people think about autonomous drones, then they typically think about uh, this kind of drone. So this is actually an autonomous drone racing competition uh, organized by Monkey Martin and Drone Racing Week. And this is our winning run of uh, 12 seconds uh, with that drone. Uh, and uh, that drone, uh, I'm going to show to you in detail afterwards, had a, a lot of uh, computation on board and a lot of sensing. That was pretty heavy drone. Now, flipping wing drones, of course, they hold the promise to, you know, uh, scale down very nicely to, to very small sizes. And, and uh, what I'm going to show you now is the Delphi Nimble. And so where the first uh, model was developed by David Lentink and just off the Wachter, Rick Reisig, and this model here, it was developed by Maciej Karasek in our lab, together with others. And the special thing about the Delphi Nimble, you can see here, is that it can actuate uh, the two uh, wing pairs uh, separately. And so by doing this, for example, you can get roll motion. And by uh, doing this, you can get thrust vectoring for uh, yaw motion. And this makes it super agile, so it can, make, uh, it can do very fast flight. Uh, and it is so agile that we were able to mimic uh, fruit fly escape be uh, behaviors, maneuvers. Uh, so closely that we could explain uh, some of the physical effects going on during such quick turns. And here you see in the video uh, this kind of quick turn. We slow it down, by the way. We don't say the exact slow, slow motion factor, but this is slower than uh, the reality. And so I think it's very nice to talk about this. And we've been talking a lot about uh, uh, flapping wing drones today, but I actually brought one to the States. Uh, and uh, I want to just uh, fly it uh, for you if you if you would like that. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. <laughs> so I have to stay in the camera image, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, what I'm going to fly is the. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The microphone. Am I audible online? What I'm going to fly is a flapper drone. And it's a, a drone developed by uh, uh, Maciej Karasek and Rick Heising in their startup. And so they, they started making these uh, more robust. And so now I'm going to connect to it. And um, it's also bigger than the, uh, than the nimble that you just saw. So I'll hold in my hand here, uh, and I'll, uh, yeah, I don't know, if, if I'm out of the image, you tell me. Uh, no, I'll, I'll make sure you're in the image. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, it's just to test the flapping. If I try to rotate it, it's counteracting uh, with the uh, thrust vector. Uh, and I can also uh, make wrong maneuver, quick maneuver. And so, now that I know that this is working, I can, I can fly it. And so there's always exciting light demos have tendency to go wrong. 
But I can assure you, if it goes wrong, it's really the fault of the pilot and not the drone. <laughs> and because I'm one of the worst pilots uh, in our lab. Luckily, this is quite a large space. So I limit a bit the uh, agility of the vehicle by uh, giving some maximal uh, bank angle, uh, which for these kind of demos I put uh, uh, quite low. Also because I'm not the best pilot, to be honest. But uh, uh, yeah, so if you would see uh, others flying with this with higher bank angles, you can get like super aggressive uh, maneuvers. And we have no problems to fly this uh, in front of audience or even over audience. Because uh, yeah, it's still a very lightweight vehicle, 100 grams, soft wings. So even if everything fails, you know, and it falls, then it doesn't hurt anybody. I don't mind to fly it longer later, but uh, if we do it too long, then uh, then we go over time with the presentation. So I would say an applause for the flapper drone. I mean, not me, but the flapper drone. <laughs> Before, when we used to travel with the Delphi, then you were never sure that it would survive the trip. You know, you took it in the plane, you arrive, and there's like a wing broken off, and this is this is very very robust. So, um, yeah, I'm not involved in this company, by the way, <laughs> in any financial way. But uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, Mache uh, and Flapper drones they're selling this also for research labs. So uh, then it's like uh, it works with uh, Bitgrace autopilot. So. Yeah, I hope that uh, you know more uh, labs will start working on autonomous flapping wing drones. Okay, so that was the most scary part of my talk <laughs> for me, at least. <laughs> I don't know for you. <laughs> and uh, then we go on to oh, wrong network. Yeah, then we go on to uh, to what I was going to say. So uh, the main challenge with drones you always hear is that uh, they have restrictions in size, weight, and power. And this is the case already for the racing drone, uh, which you see there. It has a 70 centimeter diameter, it weighs three kilos and uses 600 watts to fly. And it has an NVIDIA Jetson Xavier on board, which uh, also is, yeah, in my eyes, a bit heavy, 280 grams and consumes 30 watts. Now, it can run like very deep nets with that. So you see lots of GPUs, 42 gigabytes of memory. But let's have a look now at uh, the Delphi Nimble. So the one you saw flying is a bit heavier, but the Delphi Nimble is 33 centimeters in wingspan, and it weighs uh, 29 grams. So it uses six watts to fly, which is much less. It can still carry a processor, which in our case is a microcontroller, an STM 32F4, which has 168 megahertz, and it has 192 kilobytes of memory. And so, uh, yeah, that's not so much, I can tell you. Uh, and you may wonder, like, yeah, can we, you know, use uh, this kind of computing power to achieve autonomous flight? And, and uh, let's let's see if that's possible. Now, the first thing that uh, people typically think about is to use SLAM, so simultaneous localization and mapping. But uh, for example, on the right, I show an example of uh, visual SLAM. It takes hundreds to thousands of megabytes of memory. And that's obviously yeah, no, much too much for the memory that we that we have on board. So already from a, a memory uh, standpoint, we cannot uh, do this on our vehicle. Of course, you may say, okay, Dino, but, uh, you know, SLAM is so 2005, you know, let's use uh, deep nets, right? So uh, deep nets are, of course, very cool. Uh, and then you have these embedded uh, processors like the NVIDIA Jetson. And uh, this one is, uh, it weighs 85 grams and have like uh, seven and a half uh, watts of power. And that's also much too much for the vehicle. It's like almost three times as heavy as the vehicle. So that's a pretty uh, grim picture, I would say. So it means like, okay, is this now impossible, Guido? No, it's not impossible. No, we can actually do this. And the only thing we need to do is draw inspiration from nature. And so here we, uh, we zoom in on a fruit fly. It's actually much smaller in reality for the non-biologists. <laughs> and uh, it can fly, avoid obstacles. It can find food and shelter. It can interact socially with other fruit flies. It can learn. And it does all these things yeah, much more successfully than, than drones and uh, in only 100,000 neurons. Uh, if you think about the fact that yeah, we have like 80 billion neuro neurons in our head, that's very, very impressive. So it's very little processing power, still allowing these fruit flies to do all these tasks. Now, what is the secret of nature? Uh, one secret is 
that they tackle complex tasks often with simple behaviors. And Antonio Bicchi said it during his keynote speech, simple doesn't mean, you know, easy. It's very difficult to make simple solutions to complex problems. Now, nature, uh, nature is very good at that. On the left, I show a dragonfly. It's very good at hunting its prey. It catches around 95% of its prey and compared to the lion, which uh, catches around 75%. And so the dragonfly basically laughs at the lion. And uh, the thing is that uh, when it catches its prey, it's going straight towards the position where, uh, where, for example, the fly is going. How does it do that? Well, it does it by keeping uh, the fly in the same place in its image and then trying to make it bigger in its image. And by doing that, it's a very simple behavioral rule, but it brings the dragonfly to where the fly is going. And uh, that's, that's quite a you know, difficult task. On the right, I show a picture of a honeybee. They land uh, on flowers by using optic flow. And biologists have found that they do this by keeping uh, the optic flow divergence constant. And so if you go towards something, it becomes bigger in your field of view. And the rate of expansion of this image, if you keep it constant, then as you go uh, closer, you go slower. And we'll go come back to this later, but it's also you know, a very you know, simple uh, behavior that you know, solves a very difficult task because, yeah, this thing may be moving in the wind, there's disturbances, and it's only using uh, yeah, its tiny vision sensors to do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there may be even more complex tasks, uh, you may say. So can we solve everything with one simple behavior? Uh, I don't think so, but what you also see in nature is that they link this, these behaviors together in a very smart way. And so we have a picture here made by uh, Floris van Breugel, and they were studying how fruit flies uh, use uh, odor, and so smell, to find uh, food. And you see the trajectory of the fruit fly, and it actually alternates two behaviors. So if it doesn't smell anything yet, and there's a draft coming uh, from the right, it will cast, so it will go orthogonal to the, to the draft. If it smells something, then it's going to go upwind, because yeah, that's where the smell comes from, right? So, but then when it loses it again, it will start casting again. You see that in this image. And just by following these behaviors, it can, it can find uh, this odor source, which is a huge problem in robotics. So, and, and many complex methods are applied to it. Now, we uh, learned from uh, these kind of things. And on the left, uh, you see now uh, the Delphi Explorer. So in 2008, I went to Delft. And in 2013, we made the Delphi Explorer. So it took us five years to make the Delphi completely autonomous. So we speed it up because it turns out if you do obstacle avoidance and it doesn't crash, it's just less interesting. <laughs> but uh, so this is 20 times the speed. It's flying around. It has a stereo vision system on board, a three gram stereo vision system uh, with onboard processing. Uh, the processor is the STM you saw before. And uh, yeah, so with stereo vision, like using the two cameras, it can triangulate and see distances in this space. And uh, on the right, uh, we have a swarm of crazy flies. So I'm also going to show you quadrotors today because uh, if you go to very small quadrotors, they're also extremely limited. Now, this swarm is pretty cool, I think, because it can take off, spread out in an unknown environment, explore it, avoid obstacles, avoid each other, as you're seeing on the video now there. They do that with the help of radio signals. And, uh, and even when, uh, and when they're exploring such a space, we can also put onboard cameras on them. We're not transmitting these images. These images are stored because uh, when uh, they notice that their battery is getting almost half empty, then they're going to go back to the starting point, which you see here. And they do all of this without maps. And so, so they do all of this with simple behaviors. And I'm going to show them to you now. So the completely self-flying Delphi, which was able to fly in generic spaces, like we were also demonstrating it during meetings like this before. Uh, it had a finite state machine with four states, and each state represents a behavior. And then we had transitions between these behaviors. The main problem we had to solve there is that the old Delphi, uh, it was not able to hover. So it could not see an obstacle and just stop. Yeah? So it had to keep flying. So what we did is it had an area in front of it that was empty and big enough to turn in a circle in front of the obstacle. And uh, so if there's an obstacle coming into this zone, it would fly on, circle in front of the obstacle and find a new direction. And this is what you receive. On the right, you have the finite state machine of these uh, swarm drones. 
And uh, yeah, it's actually an implementation of a bug algorithm. And so in bug algorithms, what you do is you travel in a desired direction. And if you find an obstacle, you follow the contours. And we call that wall form. And so they're doing that. And when they fly out, they all have a different desired direction. So they spread out over the environment. But when they come back, they try to uh, maximize the signal strength of one beacon at the ground station. And so a bit like uh, also how small animals uh, find uh, food. So uh, last year, we went for an even more complex task. So the swarm of tiny drones, the crazy flies, able to localize gas leaks in complex indoor environments. And so we uh, show a picture here. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, you see some of the mechanisms going on, but yeah, just to say to you, it's the same thing as before, more or less. So they're flying out, spreading out, avoiding walls, avoiding each other. But this time, uh, we also, we actually changed the hardware a little bit because they were, should be able to smell gas. So we put a CO2 sensor on board. Uh, it could also smell alcohol. I don't know, the students made it, so I don't know what their actual goal was with this, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, so they smell the gas. Um, and then they can communicate with each other. And they use ultra wideband to find out where the other ones are uh, in relative loca localization. So you know that the other one is like plus five meters, plus three meters. And he's smelling more gas than I am. So probably I should, you know, adjust my path a bit. And we use a particle swarm optimization algorithm, yeah, but with the physical robots. So each robot is a particle. Yeah, and then they communicate together. They go through the space and they find uh, the gas. So what I'm going to show you now is an, yet uh, another sped up version of uh, the experimental video. We'll be looking from the top and what you have to look for is the, the, the small blue lights. Like the drones are very small, so it's actually pretty hard to see them in these videos. But uh, you, oh, other laptop. <laughs> I don't know, I need more than three times to learn. So uh, yeah, here yeah, you see these uh, online, it's hardly visible. But so you see the, the, the blue lights there. There's a little table with a glass over it, and that's uh, like a, a beaker with uh, alcohol. And now it's in the corner there. You see these little lights going everywhere. But at the end, you see them, you know, converging to this location with uh, the beaker. I'm going to uh, repeat that one time because it's a bit much to look at. So what you see here is that yeah, often in these robotic applications with gas finding, it's actually a small open space. And what we did is we put walls. And this makes it very complex because the, the concentration of gas it can be on one side of the wall and not the other. And this is why we leverage the swarm uh, to find uh, these, uh, these gas sources. Now, because we're talking about flapping wings, I also wanted to present uh, this work. And we recently uh, generalized this ultra wideband scheme uh, to also flapping wings. And uh, so I, I said to my students, yeah, we solved this, you know, it should be easy on flapping wings, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know why I said that, because I should know better. But, uh, um, you know, if we look at it, uh, what happens with this ultra wideband? Well, at the bottom, you see distance between robot I and J. We measure that with the ultra wideband. Yeah, so uh, the ultra wideband gives you this distance between two drones. Um, we measure the yaw rate with a gyroscope. And the Drone I and J, so the two robots are communicating this to each other. I'm turning now uh, into this direction. And, uh, and we have the body velocity. So I know how fast I'm flying to the front and to the left, and I tell that to my neighbor. And so they're exchanging that. Now on the crazy fly, we used ultra wideband, gyroscope, and the optic flow sensor, you know, to do that. And the uh, crazy flies, yeah, you know, they fly then relatively low. It, it was okay. Uh, what we did here, by the way, is we wanted to do this now in 3D. So we wanted to also know if they're higher or lower. But on the flapper, the flapper drone, and we're actually using uh, this model for that study. Um, yeah, the velocity measurement is problematic because uh, I can put uh, like an optic flow sensor on the bottom. But yeah, as soon as you start flying under a slightly larger angle, you get uh, basically the, the laser doesn't measure anything anymore. And also the optic flow is not going to work very well. So we needed to make a better model. And in the end, we chose for a modeling-based approach to, uh, and so we knew that if you pitch, for example, you get a certain acceleration. And we were using this to estimate also the velocity over time. And I'll show you some uh, uh, results. So we have, uh, and Sven Feifel was the uh, PhD that developed this, but uh, Sunny Wang uh, 
is the one uh, that is uh, walking the Delphi, so she has a little wire, but it's just for safety. She's not pulling it or anything. And uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration with Politecnico di Torino, by the way, with uh, Alessandro Rizzo. But uh, what you see is uh, there's one leader drone on the top there. It's being manually flown. And the, uh, the bottom drone is fully autonomous, and it's trying to keep the same uh, distances to the, to the leader drone. As you see, as the leader drone uh, moves around, the follower drone is also moving. It's not perfect. It's also a little bit delayed, but uh, you know you can already do quite some uh, coordination with this. And for this, they need no external infrastructure. So they have, all the videos I show, everything is on board, no external uh, infrastructure. So really autonomous uh, flight. Now. You may be wondering, Guido, is there anything you cannot do with the STM microcontroller? Yeah, because we're using the same processor. I think so, unfortunately. <laughs> I would love to do everything with uh, the microcontroller, but uh, I think that if you go to complex pattern recognition, uh, visual processing, high dimensional inputs, uh, learning, then at some point you want uh, something like uh, deep neural networks. And uh, yeah, we cannot put, like I said, a video on here. But there's a new kind of uh, processing uh, on the horizon, and it's called neuromorphic uh, sensing and processing. And so uh, we're working a lot on that with the hope to apply it to the Delphi. So uh, on the eye side, we have uh, event-based cameras, like I also saw on Anibal's talk. They're also working with this. Very useful for flapping wings, I think. Uh, in the middle, what you see is a, a kind of simulation of a spiking neural network. And so the differences with the normal neural network is that there is neural dynamics and that these neurons spike and then only a bit basically is uh, is sent and this can be implemented in hardware much more efficiently than uh, the typical uh, yeah, gpus for deep neural networks and so we're heavily looking at that and uh, i don't know how much time i have left Can you tell me if we still have a... five minutes okay i'll, I'll go a bit quickly so we, we we did a case study with this. Um, honeybees they land by keeping optic flow divergence constant. We talked about this a little bit. This is what it looks like from the drone's perspective. So it's looking down, and if you go down, and then things become bigger, so you get this diverging uh, optic flow field. And uh, the divergence is the d. And if you look at it, the physical equations, it's equal to the vertical velocity divided by the height. You can imagine that if you keep that constant, then the lower you go, the slower you go. Yeah, and uh, to show that, like at 10 meters, you'll be going 2 meters per second, at 5 meters, 1 meter per second, and at 1 meter, 20 centimeters per second. So you're slowing down uh, with this very elegant strategy. And you may wonder, is this difficult? Uh, and uh, the first approach, uh, called the naive approach, but it was also the pioneering uh, research in this area, used this control law. It just used the proportional gain times the error in the divergence. Uh, there's a certain divergence you want to have. There's one that you measure. And you multiply this error with the gain, and you set your thrust accordingly. And then that results in the following landing. So uh, you see the drone here. It's going down. It's looking good, actually, all of this. Um, but um, there's one thing that happens towards the end. And uh, that's this. Yeah, I, I I don't often see honeybees doing this when they want to land on a flower. <laughs> Actually, so uh, I first saw this as quite a big problem. Uh, there's a whole theory behind this why this is not a problem, and my honeybees actually do do this, but uh, that is too long to go into now. But um, to tell you why this is difficult, well, the difficulty comes from this equation. Actually, it's very easy to see if your height gets lower. The set goes to zero, and then you get like infinite minus infinite. You get very large uh, inputs. Okay. Now, uh, the drone you just saw used a completely traditional pipeline, normal camera, images, corners, corner tracking for flow, fitting of the flow field, and that gives you the slope, gives you the divergence. And this goes into that controller. This is a completely traditional pipeline. Uh, but uh, we did many experiments, and I'm only going to show the last of them. And we replaced the control with uh, a small spiking neural network that we actually ran on such a new uh, neuromorphic processor. And it was the first free flying drone that used uh, this spiking net uh, processor to be controlled. And it's the Intel uh, Low EE chip. And uh, so, what did we do? We used the traditional vision pipeline to get divergence. 
we encoded this in spikes that are sent to this chip and this uh, spits out <laughs> spikes as well but then encoding the thrust command and this is this is how it works and um, yeah, the way in which we did this is we evolved a spiking neural network in simulation if there's questions on that uh, i can answer later how we did this and how we covered the reality yet and, and after training we applied it to this drone so for us this is like a super heavy drone and that's just to interface with the intel Luigi chip yeah, but uh, this is the uh, yeah zero shot uh, sim to real transfer you see landing uh, perfectly actually with this network and I'm a bit sad to say it's landing almost better than uh, the algorithms I developed for uh, for optic flow landing. So this is uh, this is very smooth. And the promise of all this is that it can actually go on these tiny flapping wings. Now to wrap up, what are the flapping wing challenges? I talked a lot about the lightweight today and how you can make the intelligence light enough. But there's other challenges that I didn't go into. There's the vibrations from the flapping. Uh, because yeah, the flapping induces vibrations. Yeah, we, we used to have rolling shutter cameras. That was horrible. Event-based vision, I think, is better, but it poses a challenge yeah, because yeah, a rotational flow, for example, then uh, drowns the translational flow. Varying vehicle orientation, like I said, you quickly have big angles, so you cannot use the same tools we use on these uh, quad rotors. Fragile hardware. So when we work with the normal Delphi Nimble, the ones that we create ourselves. You know, yeah, something breaks a bit easier because it's a prototype. And so I hope that this will be a solution uh, and effect of disturbances. So already flying under uh, air conditioning is a huge disturbance. And uh, for the organizers, this is the last slide. <laughs> and so what's next? We want to go to insect based, uh, vision based uh, navigation uh, to be able to better navigate fully neuromorphic autopilots, more complex tasks and faster autonomous flight. And I end with this slide with a huge number of people. I do want to mention Christophe Lachter, Lachter Lenswick, Isaac, who also worked on the Delphi 2. David Lentink, of course, also working on the Delphi 1. And there's many, many people involved in all these studies, also from other institutes. So I thank everybody there, and I thank you for your attention. Ido, thanks a lot for this lovely presentation and also for the demonstration. I think everyone appreciated. Um, we have maybe time for one small question. I have also one more. Yeah, sure. So, the question I get online is from Tom Pablo Kiss. And his question is uh, more of curiosity. Are you planning to use event based data to figure out your model? processes from yes yes so we uh, yeah we were actually also we used also event based camera on a drone uh, for optic flow landing and then we had you know the vision pipeline being uh, neuromorphic but uh, what we're now trying to do is put this together so event based camera neuromorphic chip it's super challenging because these chips are uh, you know very uh, much in development so they can have very few neurons actually. So yeah, you cannot just say, okay, let's put some network that works and we'll just upload it with the, yeah, TensorFlow that uploads or something. <laughs> that would be beautiful. But that, that is of course a future idea, but we're trying to do that uh, right now. So yes, yeah. Thanks again, Guido. Sorry, may I have another question? I'm still from Paolo. Uh, I think do or we really the question on Zoom and then I think Hilo can, can, can yeah. reply to it. Yeah, you will. I would like to introduce the uh, next speaker. We are very happy to, to have here um, an engineer and zoologist, Christina Arbe, from uh, who is assistant professor from the UC Davis, the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Um, her talk is, is called the evolution of gliding bird pitch stability. We are very curious, so um, I invite you to connect. I see you already. Uh, you share the screen already. Then I will say the floor is yours. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, perfect. 
Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me here to speak today. Um, I, uh, my name is Christina Harvey. I just recently graduated uh, from my PhD um, and I will be starting as an assistant professor at UC Davis July 1st. Um, so this is kind of a background of some of the work in my PhD um, and maybe some hints at where I'm going in the future. But in particular, I study how birds fly and looking specifically at maneuvering and maneuvering in gliding flight. So I do apologize. It's going to be more of a focus on the morphing wing aspects than the flapping wing aspects. But if we consider the fulmar, which is here gliding off of the edge of the cliff, you can see it changing the shape of its wing in flight, controlling this position and adjusting in this really gusty environment. And this is very advantageous for some of our UAVs, and we want to better understand how birds are able to do this. So birds are able to change the shape of their wings or morph their wings because their wings are homologous to all other tetrapod forelimbs, including the human arm. They have the humerus, a radius and ulna, and a carpal metacarpus, which is the fusing of our palm bones. And by activating their muscles, they gain control over an elbow angle and the wrist angle, which really are um, largely in control of a lot of the different wing shapes that we see these birds use in flight. To better understand the range of motion and the associated wing shapes, what we did in previous work is we took wings from gull cadavers moving through their full range of flexion and extension of the elbow and the wrist while tracking key points with uh, three cameras. And that's what you can see here with these green outlines. We can then for each frame pull out the specific elbow and wrist angle and then plot these on um, a graph to look at the full range of motion where we have elbow angle in the X, wrist angle in the Y, and each of those dots represents one of those frames of the videos. And you can see this kind of range of motion that is available to the skull wing uh, that these birds can actually use in gliding flight. But to get at maneuverability, which is really where we're trying to go with morphing, I wanted to begin by uh, providing some definitions. And that's because maneuverability is kind of a broad topic. And in general, we can define it as a capacity to change the direction and or the magnitude of your velocity vector. Uh, this is, of course, many different things, but instead of getting into quantifying it, I want to provide a second definition, and that's that of stability, which is the tendency to return towards an initial condition after perturbation. And it's these two highlighted words where maneuverability is the capacity to change and stability is a tendency return, which really act in opposition to each other and lead to a general trade-off that we see in a lot of uh, locomotions uh, where we have this trade-off between maneuverability and stability. So for my work, what I really tend to do is focus in on a stability-based analysis to let us start to move towards uh, maneuverability in this kind of proxy-based way. And in particular for this work, I'm going to be focusing in on longitudinal stability, which is as if we've taken the bird and trapped it within this frame. So they have the two translational degrees of freedom, as well as the rotation about their center of gravity. And not only this, I'm going to further narrow the focus down into longitudinal static stability, where static stability is if we imagine the bird flying at some equilibrium, if this bird is hit with a gust and develops a pitching moment, which tends to move it even further away from that equilibrium position, that's an unstable response. However, if instead the uh, position tends to return the bird back nose down towards that equilibrium, that would be a statically stable configuration. Sex stability is a necessary but insufficient condition for full stability, um, but it gives us really some nice foundations to understand the way that birds are actually controlling their flight. And to get at really the main question and the work that I'll be talking about here, it's really driven by the question of, is bird flight unstable? Many people have kind of said this and thought this, and it kind of makes sense if we consider traditional aircraft as well as what we see birds doing. For example, a planned form of a traditional aircraft has this horizontal tail backwards from the center of gravity, and the lift that it's producing tends to stabilize this aircraft. If we instead look at something like a flying wing, this design is gonna be much less stable than the traditional aircraft, and designers actually sweep those wings backwards so you have a larger portion of the lift acting behind your center of gravity to stabilize this aircraft. If you then compare just qualitatively these two outlines to something like a gull, it actually falls a little bit more closely to something like a flying wing in terms of its span to length um, than the traditional aircraft. And combined with the fact that they perform these really impressive maneuvers, it's just led to this belief that birds are entirely unstable while they're flying. Not only this, it's been believed that birds are actually evolving to be unstable in flight. And that's because if we consider the first ever bird, the Archaeopteryx, which evolved about 150 million years ago, this bird had this long and bony tail, which extended quite a ways back from the center of gravity and would have provided a great lifting surface that would stabilize their flight. As birds have evolved, this tail is shortened and actually fused into something called a pygostyle, such that the modern bird tail 
um, is actually quite short and fused. And the majority of bird tails that you see are really just the feather components. So this tr transition from this long bony tail down to be shorter has really led people to believe that birds are largely unstable um, and evolving to be that way. But this is not something that had actually been quantified. So in this talk, what I'll show is that we found that the majority of the species that we looked at had the capacity to shift between stable and unstable flight configurations, and that evolution actually selects towards this capacity to shift. So I brought up the idea of longitudinal stability, and now I want to provide a way that we can actually quantify this, and that's through uh, something called the static margin. The static margin is the relative distance between the center of gravity and the neutral point where the neutral point um, is the location where the forces uh, can be modeled, where the pitching moment is independent of your angle of attack. If that neutral point is behind your center of gravity, an increase of lift at, due to something like a gust would create a nose down pitching moment, and that would be a stable response or a positive static margin. Instead, if that neutral point shifts in front of your center of gravity, an uh, increase of the lift there creates a nose up pitching moment, which is an unstable response, and that's a negative static margin. For birds, because they have the capability to morph the shape of their wings in flight, we expect both movements in that neutral point as well as their center of gravity. So there's going to be some minimum static margin and some maximum static margin range. To estimate where that neutral point is and how that changed with the morphing, we actually leveraged some of our previous um, aerodynamic work on gull wings. We had gone from real gull wing cadavers and developed a numerical simulation uh, that was validated with wind tunnel experiments that allowed us to estimate the uh, uh, neutral point location of these wings. And we were then able to develop a method to uh, pull the wing shapes and relate that to the neutral point. So what we then had was a way to estimate where the neutral point would be based on the wing shape of birds and how it changed uh, with wing morphing. So we knew this information. And interestingly, the thing that we thought might be a little more straightforward um, was the center of gravity. But there wasn't a lot of data in the literature on where bird center of gravity was, nor how it changed with wing morphing. And so that was our focus for the next part of this work. And what we did is developed a method to estimate bird inertia, where I leveraged just classical mechanics methods where you can model the bird as a composite structure of a bunch of simple shapes. We had the head as a cone, the neck as a cylinder, and the body as ellipsoid elements. The tail was in a flat plate and the legs were two point masses. Because we also had a way to determine the uh, positioning of the wings that I showed really at the top front of this talk, uh, we could lay in the joints uh, in the bones and the muscles as cylindrical elements as well as the peripheral points and then the primary and secondary feathers, which they themselves were composites of five more simple shapes. Now the advantage to this method of using lots of simple shapes is say we take and we look in at the pigeon range of motion, which is really small on the bottom of the screen here. We have the elbow angle on the X, wrist angle on the Y, that complete range is that range of motion of the pigeon wing. If we pull out one of the configurations, we can now look at a head on view and a dorsal view of the center of gravity of each of the components that we measured. So we can back out the center of gravity and the moment of inertia for each of these more simple components and combine them using traditional techniques um, to get our final center of gravity. The great thing about this is then we can pull out a different position and say as we pull these wings in or we fold this first angle, how does the center of gravity of all those components and their moment of inertia change? And then we can recalculate uh, the complete bird center of gravity and moment of inertia. This is developed as an open source code uh, which is available online. However, we haven't yet gone to the point where we could actually look at something and comment on evolution. So what we did is we used a comparative approach. We looked at 22 species, which span the avian phylogeny. And here I need to give a huge shout out to Dr. Wong and Dr. Baliga, uh, my two colleagues who took all of this data. They looked at over uh, 36 different, uh, they looked at 36 individuals and took over 50 measurements per individual. They took over 70,000 different wing configurations to get this complete range of motion of these wings, which was over 2,000 shapes for each of these birds. And that's what you can see here for 21 out of 22 species. Again, that elbow angles on the X, the wrist angles on the Y, and each of the blobs represents the range of motion of these bird wings. Vikram has this really great paper that uh, in Science Advances that talks about some of the um, relationships between um, these ranges of motion and birds' flight style. Um, but for the purposes of this work, what we were using this for was to really define the complete range of motion that um, would let us back out that location in the center of gravity. So with that goal, we can now look and zoom in on a pigeon where we have 20% of the body length on the x-axis, 10% of the body length on the y, but now that's the z direction. And we can see the little orange dots, which represent the complete 
range of the center of gravity due to morphing the elbow and wrist through that full range of motion. You'll notice there are two different dots, and this is because of expected inter-individual variation that happens in biological research. And now if we zoom out and we consider that same um, uh, gray rectangle, you can see this result for all of the different birds in our, species, in our study. And maybe the first thing that you'll notice is, wow, those are some really small points. And that is kind of the point here, which is that the center of gravity is relatively constant across morphing the elbow and the wrist. The largest shift we saw was only about 3% of the body length of the birds. So morphing that elbow and the wrist doesn't have a huge effect. But now we knew where that center of gravity was and allows us to now come back to that idea of calculating the static margin. However, before I get there, I do want to highlight that modern birds are on very different scales. The largest bird in our study was the American white pelican, which is about six kilograms whereas the smallest bird in the study was only about 19 grams. And this is a difference of over 100 times. And it's really important to keep this difference in mind as we compare differences across um, these flight techniques. So for that reason, body mass is on the x-axis of this plot. And now on the y-axis is that static margin as a percentage of their maximum root cord. And each of these lines represents an individual and the colors of the species. So that we have the petrel on the far left-hand side up to the pelican on the far right-hand side. And we have plotted both the maximum value and the minimum value of that static margin range, where the positive will be a stable and the negative is unstable. And one of the first things that you can just see from this graph is that most of our species had that capacity to shift between stable and unstable flight within that elbow and the wrist range of motion. In fact, it was 77% of the species we looked at had that capacity to shift. And on top of this, we found a statistically significant relationship where the range of that stack margin actually reduced as the body mass increased so that something like a pelican had a reduced ability to shift that static margin compared to the petrol. Now, I do want to take a little aside before I move on um, really focusing on that stack margin to pull out some of our um, moment of inertia results. So we also looked at that moment of inertia and how it changed with the wing morphing. So what you see here on the X axis is the maximum moment of inertia divided by the minimum moment of inertia. All of the species are listed on the uh, Y axis. And the first thing you'll notice is we're looking just at the moment of inertia about the pitching axis of this bird. And you'll see that they all hang out around one, which means the maximum is almost the same as the minimum. There wasn't a large effect of morphing the elbow and the wrist on changing that moment of inertia. And this makes sense logically, because if we consider the contribution of each of the body components to the overall moment of inertia, that's shown here now on the X axis, and each of those blocks represents the um, different components um, in the visualization, where the wing components are the more colorful ones. You'll see that the wing has a much smaller contribution to the overall moment of inertia. However, if we now consider the moment inertia about the yawing axis, so the heading axis, we can see that this wing plays a larger role. And if you look over at the left-hand side, you'll see that we start to see over a three times difference in that moment of inertia through wing morphing alone. And finally, if we look at the rolling axis, we of course find the largest effect of this wing uh, morphing on the overall moment of inertia, where something like a heron has over an 11 times difference between that roll moment due to morphing their elbow and their wrist. And now with this information, we really want to get at um, being able to quantify or move towards a true quantification of maneuverability. So what we did is we took maybe a subset of what maneuverability is, which is the agility uh, component and specifically pitch agility. So what we did is we derived a metric, uh, which really can be defined as the change in the pitch angular acceleration. So that's the delta Q dot for a change in the angle of attack, so delta alpha is going to be proportional to your static margin, the mass of the bird, the wing area, as well as that pitching moment of inertia. Because we now had all of this information, we could back out a relationship to estimate the differences between these birds in terms of their uh, pitch agility. And that's what you see here plotted on the y-axis. We still have body mass on the x. And you can see going from the petrol down to the pelican, we have a strong relationship um, between body mass and pitch agility. So just these smaller birds um, actually are much more agile than something like a pelican. And this makes sense just intuitively and as well if we consider aircraft. Um, larger aircraft are not going to be as agile as our smaller aircraft. Um, and so even though we found um, this re uh, relationship, the other thing we wanted to do was actually normalize these results as if these birds are now the same length and flying at the same speed. So even with this normalized result where we backed out all of the dimensional metrics, we find a statistically significant relationship where uh, the normalized agility still reduces with body mass such that larger birds tend to actually just be uh, less agile than some of these smaller birds. Now I 
want to summarize this first section by highlighting that the key takeaway and the thing that I'd like you all to remember from this work is that we found that the majority of our investigated species had that capacity to shift between stable and unstable flight. But I haven't yet gotten at this idea of evolution, which I've brought up in the beginning. And what we now need to ask is, is there a model that best explains the traits that modern birds exhibit now? So what we're seeing on the left hand side is the phylogeny of all of the birds that we um, investigated in the study where we have time in millions of years ago on the X axis from 80 million years to modern day. And you can see how each of these branches will now represent a modern day species where we have the mallards and the silver pheasants, the pigeons and the nighthawks or the kingfishers and the stellar's jay. And with this uh, relationship, what we can now see is which um, models best explain the traits that we see birds using. So we considered first Brownian motion, which is just a random walk over time. And the second model we considered is the ornstein ullen beck model, which is again a stochastic process, but now there's this rubber band-like constraint acting on this um, process, pulling it towards some phenotypic optimum, which I do wanna highlight is not like an engineering optimum, but perhaps just the value that is actually being pulled towards in this time series. Um, and with this model, the power of it is that it's one of the most simple models that shows evidence for selection within evolution. So by using statistical techniques, we can fit these two models to this phylogeny and see which um, has the best support. And first, what we looked at is the maximum static margin um, for each of these birds. And fitting these two models, we found evidence that the OU model was preferred over the Brownian motion model and that the value being selected towards was the stable positive value. In addition, when we did this on our minimum stack margin, we again found that the OU model was preferred over the Brownian motion model and that the value being selected towards was this negative or this unstable static margin. And so these results provide the first evidence that evolution is actually selecting towards both stable and unstable flight. And this really shifts our understanding both of how modern birds fly and how evolution um, perhaps is being, has evolved, it implies that perhaps there's some functional benefit. This is, of course needs to be investigated in detail um, to having this capability of shifting between stable and unstable flight. So in summary for these parts, we can show that the majority of the investigated bird species could shift between stable and unstable flight and that evolution is actually selecting towards this capacity to shift. Now, although we were very excited and um, happy to share these results, there's a lot of work that needs to come next to really move this forward and, of course, move it into the area of how do we incorporate this into um, designing more avian-like flying vehicles. The next steps that I foresee is that we need to continue to pursue um, aerodynamic studies to gain a more general picture of avian aerodynamic characteristics. We estimate that neutral point based on um, some of our previous skull wing studies. Um, and although that does, has accounted for differences in the wing shapes, it can't yet account for differences in say the airfoil differences between these different types of birds or the more nuanced uh, differences between avian wing shapes. So um, this is something that I think needs a lot of focus uh, moving forward. And the next bit that um, is actually in review for myself right now is taking this inertial data and coupling it with aerodynamic outputs to evaluate a complete dynamic response. So I told you that that static response is a necessary but insufficient condition for full stability. Uh, what we can do is couple this inertial characteristics with aerodynamics to build this complete flight model of open loop flight to see what uh, that dynamic response looks like. And last, but perhaps most importantly, we also need to ask, if and when birds are actually shifting between these stability modes during flight. This work shows the capacity to shift and that evolution is selecting towards that capacity, but I can't tell you exactly when or why these birds are shifting. And I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, nuances that could be then pulled out um, to improve our UAV design in the future. So on that note, thank you so much for the invitation to be here to speak and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Christina, a lot for the very nice talk. Uh, conclusions which, uh, which I find uh, very original and interesting. I, I, I think we have time for, for some questions. If there are no questions, I have a question myself. Okay, I, I would like to ask, maybe you, you already replied in the what's ne next slide. I'm wondering the, 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 the model that you use and the conclusion that you drew. So you confirmed that you never basically used any kind of aerodynamic model to, to draw those conclusions, but only using basically uh, the knowledge of kinematic motions of, uh, 
of the birth. No, I'm sorry. Um, so we did. So to get that neutral point, um, I had taken uh, gull wings and moved through the full range. We had thousands of different wings run through a lifting line model that was validated with um, wind tunnel results. So what that allowed us to do is develop a um, a relationship between um, the shape of the wing and the neutral point. So usually you can make the assumption for a planar uh, rectangular wing that the neutral point of this, these wings uh, is going to be basically at the quarter cord. Um, I think that there are a lot of complexities in bird wing shapes that make that relationship a little challenging. So what we did is we basically um, looked at a couple different cord metrics to find that there was a there was a statistically significant link between the standard mean cord, um, which is there's so many different ways to define a mean cord, um, and we were able to then um, find this relationship between that. So there was aerodynamic uh, results that went into calculating the static margin um, in terms of estimating that neutral point location. I see, I see. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. So, um, yeah, we have a question. Oh, I was wondering if you think that this work um, for, if you were able to do the analysis across that two weeks, if it look similar and would that kind of form with the evolution of the hurricane? Yeah, just to make sure I understood, did you say bat species? Yes, bat species. Yeah, I think that would be so cool. I have really focused my whole work on birds, um, and that's because of kind of, you know, uh, you start going down one path and all of a sudden you know only about birds. Um, but I think that in terms of pulling out things that we can develop for improving unmanned aerial vehicles, I think bats show such impressive types of um maneuvering that birds don't really do. I think comparing the two and then getting at some of the evolutionary questions about flight, because you know, like even though their wings are also homologous to bird wings, they've instead extended those feather, those, sorry, not the feathers, uh, their fingers. So they have totally different methods of controlling the flight. So I think that this could extend and would be really interesting to, to see the results. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And that's the piece that um, is basically that I tried to end on was this was just their full range of motion. Like if you take a cadaver and you move it through its entire range, that's what they're using. Of course, bird wings also need to be able to fold so that they can land and sit in their nests. And there are different constraints acting on these wings. So this is just the pure capacity of these wings. Um, in previous work um, in uh, 2019 paper that we published, we developed a method to pull out um, identify which wing shapes gulls were actually using in gliding flight. So they tended to use these higher elbow angle ranges and across the full wrist angle, um, but it really did extend it up into the other range. And I think that's where I think that there's going to be a lot of interesting work to figure out how these different species use these different ranges of motion and what that means in terms of their actual um, in-flight agility capacity. Because like I said, this is just the pure capacity is there, like our birds using it still still needs a lot of, of work. Thanks again, uh, Christina, for replying to the questions and for the talk. Then I would like to switch to the next speaker, which is Nicholas Grebisch, Assistant Professor at UC San Diego at Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And um, his talk is called Autonomous Actuation of Flapping Wing Robots Inspired by Synchronous in Insect Muscles. Great. Okay. Um, th thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I, I was just at ICRA for the last uh, five days. I had to come home uh, early, unfortunately. So um, thank you for, for having me here virtually. Um, and what I want to talk about today is um, uh, largely focus on the paper that uh, that uh, we have published in ICRA this year. Um, and I saw in the video, James Lynch, the lead author, I believe he's out in the audience right now. So um, maybe when we get to the questions, I can ask him, he, he can take some of these uh, in person as well, because he'll, he'll be able to answer them uh, far more in depth than me, uh, probably. Um, this is a, just a scattershot of an outline, but I really want to um, 
uh, talk about in this paper um, how we uh, identify two methods of wing beat generation in insects um, and how we tried to develop a dynamical model of uh, the asynchronous version of wing beat generation that many insects such as uh, flies and bees use to uh, generate wing beats. Um, and we think that these have nice adaptive properties for uh, flapping wing robots. Um, and so we implemented these uh, on a larger scale flapping wing robot as well as a smaller scale, um, a centimeter scale flapping robot. Um, this has been a, a long ongoing collaboration with uh, the Sponberg lab at Georgia Tech. Um, Simon Sponberg is a, a neuroscientist and biomechanician um, who studies insect flight. Um, and then in my lab, we uh, study insect flight as well as work with um, flat and wing robots. Um, so this really truly is a, a interdisciplinary um, a combination of these different worlds of biology and robotics. Um, and you know, I want to point out um, uh, that uh, the, the wing beats of many flapping wing insects um, from bumblebees, mosquitoes, uh, flies um, are effectively adaptive. Um, and we can look at this in the, the following framework. Um, if we look at just the a um, simple spring mass like model of uh, flapping wing motion, uh, where the variable phi here might represent the, um, the joint angle at the wing hinge, um, then we have uh, uh, several different um, uh, forces and torques that are acting on the wing, um, including inertial torques uh, that are acting through the wing hinge, uh, aerodynamic torques, uh, which have been studied um, quite extensively, uh, internal elastic torques, um, which have been less uh, studied and, and we think are starting to gain more appreciation uh, recently in, in um, the biological literature. Um, there's two terms here. There's basically just a, a simple um, elastic spring term. Um, and then there's also this uh, structural damping term. We, we found through experiments on hawk moth thorax that uh, the insects have a particular type of damping within their um, thorax that is uh, rate independent. Um, and so there's just some, some general uh, frictional losses or they're kind of frictional uh, um, because they're rate independent through the thorax. Um, and then lastly, um, this system is driven through muscle torques, um, but in uh, indirect insects, uh, the muscle torques are acting through the deformable exoskeleton um, that are then causing the wing hinge to, uh, to, to oscillate back and forth. Um, and it's really this, this area where the generation of muscle torques um, is happening that, that um, we wanted to, to focus on um, because the, the sort of left sides of these equations, the inertial torques, aerodynamic torques, um, and elasticity um, have been studied uh, quite a bit. Um, and the application of muscle uh, forces that then generate the flapping wing torques um, we, we thought was uh, interesting. And in particular, there's two different ways that uh, insects generate these periodic forcing. So insects such as moths, butterflies, locusts, uh, dragonflies use what's called synchronous forcing, where there's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between a um, neural activation, or muscle action potential, um, and motion of the wing. And so you'll see that um, the muscles that are driving the wing motion are experiencing one-to-one -one, um, activation from the neural system that then drive this periodic uh, motion of the wing itself. Um, so this is called synchronous forcing um, or synchronous uh, actuation. Um, and it's it's basically analogous to a time-dependent uh, uh, forcing of the system. So you send in your, your actuator torques that are a sine omega t, for instance. Um, however, um, a, insects such as uh, such as like I've said, flies, moths. Uh, sorry, flies, uh, mosquitoes. These um, insects that have uh, higher uh, wing beat frequencies than more uh, basal insects um, had to evolve a strategy to uh, to generate um, fast wing motion um, uh, that uh, could respond um, faster than say the neural system could activate the muscle itself. Um, and so this uh, asynchronous method of generating wing beats um, is a uh, derived uh, uh, method, uh, many that is evolved from the synchronous uh, forcing. Um, and it's a method in which uh, the muscle itself um, has evolved a specific delayed stretch activated response um, where the wings can oscillate many, many oscillations um, while there's no input from the nervous system to the muscle itself. The muscle just has a, a particular um, stretch response that we'll examine in a little bit um, that causes the generation of these uh, sustained oscillations. So for, for large portions of time, um, insects that are, that are asynchronously actuated um, are undergoing basically just a closed loop feedback limit cycle oscillations um, from the properties of their muscle and the properties of the spring mass damper system that comprise their body. Um, and uh, so we thought this was a, you know, a really interesting um, uh, uh, method of generating or possible method of generating uh, wing beat oscillations uh, for flapping wing robots um, that might have some adaptive properties. Um, and so we wanted to, to understand what the kind of uh, dynamical rules of asynchronous actuation are. Um, 
uh, despite many people um, studying the, the muscle physiology and the, the force responses of delayed stretch activated muscle or asynchronous muscle, um, nobody's written down an actual um, dynamics framework for uh, these insects that are flapping through this asynchronous process. And so that was really the first goal of, uh, of this paper was, um, can we identify um, a, a dynamical system that represents a flapping wing asynchronous insect? Um, so we already have um, an effective governing equation for the motion of wings. Um, this is your sort of modified spring mass damper equation. Um, and the question uh, that we first wanted to address is what is the appropriate muscle model or what is the appropriate um, dynamical equation that describes the asynchronous muscle? Um, to do this, we, we looked at the literature um, and uh, there's um, several papers from, from uh, uh, Pringle, um, from Malloy, from sort of these uh, uh, people who, who um, uh, first investigated delayed stretch activation. Um, and they've all identified a very common response uh, to these delayed stretch activated uh, muscles, which is where it gets its name, by the way. Um, this is an example of a delayed stretch activation experiment where you would uh, remove the muscle from an insect, put it between a displacement um, stage and a force sensor, and then apply a very quick displacement to it, so a very quick stretch. And what you see is that the force response, the tension in the muscle, um, has an initial transient response, but then after some um, time delay or time lag, there's an increase in that tension and then eventually a fall back down. So this is this process of delayed stretch activation where um, there's a time delayed uh, response of the muscle to generate tension. Um, and it's thought that this time delayed, uh, this time delayed rise in tension um, might be able to, or might be, be, be is the root cause of uh, these asynchronous oscillations or wing beats effectively. So we recast this problem, um, just recognizing that uh, a, a step response in, in uh, length is basically just a um, step response of a dynamical system. Um, the uh, biological literature um, has many um, experiments where people have fit uh, a particular rate model um, to the stretch response of delayed stretch activation. Um, and so we reduced this to a, a, just a simple two-term rate model where there's a, um, there's a rise, fall, rise time and a fall time associated with this uh, delayed stretch activated process. Um, and then we can just recast this um, using very simple um, tools from linear systems to, uh, to a second order differential equation, which describes the um, fundamental behavior of this delayed stretch activated force. Um, you can see it as uh, the, the um, excitation of this delayed stretch activated response is coming from uh, a velocity term. Uh, so as, as the muscle is excited um, through a um, impulse in velocity, then there's a second order response of the, the forcing. Um, and the, the um, terms here are such that this is basically just a second order low pass filter, if you want to think about it that way. So you take in velocity. Um, apply a sort of second order uh, filter to that input velocity and then apply a force that is dependent on that, um, on that, that dynamics of that second order uh, system. And so um, I wanna introduce now um, how we close the loop and start to analyze these, um, these systems uh, together. Um, and so, oops, I'm sorry, here. Um, having established those equations now, um, we can do a couple of things just to, to check whether they uh, make sense. Um, so uh, having gone from uh, rate constants uh, to now a dynamical systems um, expression of the system, um, we can just examine um, from some fundamental experiments that are done on uh, insects themselves or on the uh, asynchronous muscle from insects, um, just see if this, uh, if this model makes sense and predicts similar type responses. Um, a very common experiment that people will do with muscle is to uh, extract it, apply a sinusoidal oscillation to it, and then measure the uh, force and ultimately measure the work that is done by the, uh, the actuator, the muscle, um, under these kinds of work loops. So you're basically oscillating the muscle at different frequencies, measuring power output, and um, so some uh, experiments here are shown from uh, uh, different um, asynchronous muscles of, of different insects. Um, and what we're seeing on the right-hand side here is that uh, the predictions, just the simple calculation of the work output um, or the power output from uh, this second order model um, qualitatively looks, looks the same as the experimental data. You have a, um, a frequency at which this muscle uh, produces maximum power output. Um, and then if the muscle is excited at a frequency that is too high, um, it actually um, uh, consumes energy. It, it um, breaks the system rather than um, activates the system. Um, and these rate constants, R3, um, just determine where this maximum power output occurs. So this allowed us to 
um, write out a closed loop expression for the uh, delayed stretch activated process, um, coupled to the resonant body mechanics of the, the um, what we call a spring wing system itself. And so the next question is, uh, do spontaneous oscillations emerge from this system, right? Uh, we, we think that uh, that wing beats are effectively the self-excitation of this delayed stretch activated process coupled to the body mechanics. And we want to just um, uh, demonstrate that uh, that uh, the self-excited wing beats will occur uh, in the appropriate parameter range of the system. So in the paper, um, you know, we do the, the most basic thing you could. Um, we just linearize the system. Um, these, these two coupled equations, remember the first one is just spring mass dynamics of the, the wing. The second one is second order um, dynamics of the, the muscle. Um, and the only nonlinear term is just the aerodynamic term in this simple model. Um, so uh, we can uh, uh, we can linearize. Um, uh, we can then uh, study the stability of the, the linearized system to see if um, perturbations will grow or decay, just you know, looking at the eigenvalues. Um, so we compute the max eigenvalue of the system. Um, and we see that. Uh, as a function of both the, the, the rate constant of the delayed stretch activated process, where R3 defines how uh, fast the, uh, the, the delayed stretch activated process is. A large R3 means you have a very fast response of the muscle. A low R3 means you have a, a slow response to the muscle. And then on the vertical axis here is the, the magnitude of the, the feedback forcing. So how hard does the muscle um, actively pull when it's been excited through uh, a stretch response? And we see that there's this, um, uh, eigenvalue, uh, the, the eigenvalues of the linearized system partition into two different uh, regimes, one in which no, os no oscillations will occur if the system is stable, one in which um, oscillations will occur and wing beats will get excited. Um, and, and eventually, as the system um, excites past the linear regime, a limit cycle is set up where you have a balance between the um, energy loss through aerodynamic losses um, and the energy input from the actuator. Um, so this basically um, is our first example um, showing that uh, that this simple dynamical system um, is sufficient to excite uh, steady state uh, limit cycle oscillations of, of wing beats. Um, likely, this is what's occurring uh, in insects, as I showed you before. Um, for large portions of, of uh, time, many, many wing beats, there's no neural input. Instead, you can really think about these asynchronous insects as just a, um, a very low dimensional um, closed loop system that has a limit cycle. Um, and so the next question that we wanted to, to address was how could asynchrony um, possibly help flapping wing robots? Um, and, and also could this help us understand or, or maybe ask better questions from the biological systems as well? Um, and there's you know, two observations that we wanted to focus on from uh, derived from uh, experiments on insects. Uh, and we wanted to see how they might help um, flapping wing robots that use this asynchronous um, response. Uh, the first observation is that uh, insects uh, uh, change in body mechanics over their lifespan. Um, this, uh, one of the most common ways they do this is just by uh, by having wing degradation uh, over their lifespan. Um, so uh, one of the ways that, uh, that uh, uh, entomologists will characterize um, the age of say a, a bumblebee is by to, to look at their wings and look at how tattered their wings are, uh, how, uh, how much area loss there has been um, because that area loss occurs over, over their lifespan quite a bit. Um, and so, you know, as wings degrade um, and deform, uh, we thought that that um, having uh, closed loop uh, uh, self-excited dynamics um, that generate wing beats might be um, useful for adapting to these slow changes in physical responses. Um, in the second example uh, that we'll look at, um, we wanted to look at how uh, a delayed stretch activated um, actuation system uh, might enable really rapid responses to um, interactions with the environment. Um, I'll show this video again later on, but what's, what's kind of hard to see is that there's a little um, thread here, a little guide wire. So we're flying these bees um, into a little arena that has these um, imperceptible um, objects that they're going to collide with. And you can see this bee was able to, uh, uh, its wing collided with this object. Uh, the wing beats halted almost instantaneously within about three wing beats. Um, and then as the bee clears this object, it, it starts flapping its wings again. So we're going to examine both of these um, phenomena in the context of delayed stretch activated um, actuation. Uh, to do this, we, we use um, two platforms. The first platform is a, a larger dynamically scaled uh, robot. Um, it's dynamically scaled to, to match the um, approximate Reynolds number uh, um, of uh, flapping wing flies. Um, the Reynolds number is approximately 10,000. Again, I say approximately because um, in this system, uh, what's, what's very important to consider is that we're not prescribing um, kinematics of the wing. Uh, we are uh, applying torques uh, to a motor that 
uh, is it coupled to a silicone torsional element that models the um, spring mass dynamics of the, uh, the insect itself. And so we're, um, we're getting emergent kinematics from applying torques to the system, uh, meaning that the, the output frequencies and output amplitudes actually vary um, quite a bit. So, so um, there's some, some variation in the overall um, fluid like uh, Reynolds like Reynolds number properties of the system. But for the most part, it's been all parameters have been chosen to, um, to get us right in the near the regime of flapping wing insects and the, and the robots that we work with. Um, so this is a, a larger scale, dynamically scaled um, system. Um, we can apply exactly um, the, the torques that we want. We can then um, measure uh, position of the wing and we can apply the kind of feedback um, dynamics that uh, stretch activated responses um, require. Um, and so uh, we use Simulink desktop real time um, to, uh, to uh, emulate the delayed stretch actor to response. Um, and so we set up basically just this simple feedback loop between um, encoder measurements from the motor and uh, torque that we're sending to the um, motor. Um, we have closed loop torque control um, that uh, is acting through the motor driver. Um, the flapping wing frequencies of the system are typically around um, two to three hertz. Um, and so all this is, you know, kind of a bit overkill for, for needing to um, uh, emulate this response. Everything is happening relatively slowly, um, but it just provides a nice system where we can easily tune and change parameters. Um, the first thing that we wanted to see is, can we generate uh, lumen cycle uh, emergent oscillations from this system? Um, and so we varied this um, parameter mu, the, the magnitude of the, uh, the feedback forcing. Um, and we found that for um, low mu, um, when you perturb the system, uh, these perturbations die out quite quickly. So this is indicative of the, the regime where your um, eigenvalue is negative, largest eigenvalue is negative, and you're, you're in the stable regime. But as you, as you increase mu, you're effectively going vertically across that parameter space. And at some point, you'll cross over um, into the unstable regime. Um, and eventually, as we get closer to this unstable regime, you can see that the perturbations uh, persist for longer, um, and eventually um, the perturbations uh, grow until you reach a stable amplitude um, that, again, is in this nonlinear regime where you're balancing aerodynamic losses and, and energy input from the delayed stretch activated actuation. We characterize the um, emergent amplitude and the emergent frequency of the system as a function of this uh, feedback magnitude mu. Um, and just saw that the amplitude is um, is governed by this mu in, in a roughly linear range, um, and that there is um, some regime where the amplitude is effectively zero um, because you haven't crossed over this uh, this instability boundary. Um, the frequency is modestly affected by mu, um, and that's that's also shown in the paper through uh, through looking at the eigenvalue spec eigenvalue spectrum and looking at the the frequency. Um, um, uh, regime uh, as well. Um, it looks like the um, the system tends to um, not be that affected in frequency by the delayed stretch activated forcing, um, and instead this frequency is is um, sort of selected by the dynamics um, to be uh, near the resonant frequency of the system itself. Um, so this is kind of a nice way also, if you want to think about it, as um, generating actuation that pretty much immediately selects for the resonant frequency of your spring mass damper. Um, we wanted to um, emulate a, um, a change in mechanical properties uh, of, of your robot or of your insect. Um, so we did this by um, changing the inertia dynamically. So we added a inertia plate that we put on the system at some time. So we would set up experiments where um, the wing beat is oscillating, say, over a plus minus 60 degree am um, amplitude. And at some point, um, we'll apply a inertial change uh, to the system and then observe uh, the transient response as well as the um, steady state response. So here we've added um, a higher inertia and the system is, uh, has moved to a higher amplitude and a lower frequency. Um, and we can characterize uh, the amplitude and frequency changes across several different um, system inertias. Um, and if we recast this um, in a slightly different way, plotting the uh, wing inertia on the x-axis here and um, one over the frequency squared, the emergent frequency. Um, what you see is that there's a nice linear relationship here. This is just um, saying what I said before, that the, the system is basically always uh, reselecting whatever the resonant frequency of the system is. Um, this, this line here is just um, your prediction from the, the uh, resonant frequency of the spring mass um, dynamics. Um, and this is actually quite consistent with um, experiments that people have done back in the 60s where uh, they've clipped insect wings and, and looked at the change in resonant frequency or change in emergent wing beat frequency um, of these insects. Um, and this is the same form of, of plotting here, one over frequency squared on the y-axis and moment of inertia on the x-axis. 
The second experiment that we wanted to do was look at this collision process, where um, really what we think is going on here is that um, it, instead of using, say, active sensing to um, detect wing beats and, and respond to them, um, the mechanical system with delayed stretch activated feedback can, can instantaneously respond to collisions because if you halt the stretch of the muscle, then you're going to halt the, um, the, the force applied from the muscle itself. Um, and so we emulated this by doing a wing collision experiment where we collide the wing at a certain time and we see that um, when the wing, uh, where, when our robophysical system collides, um, the wing beats halt and then wing beats can be started up again uh, pretty much instantaneously. And we wanted to verify this um, on a smaller scale robot. Um, and so we worked with um, uh, the RoboV here, uh, which is a centimeter scale flapping wing robot um, fabricated from uh, laser cutting or laser machining, carbon fiber and other um, composites um, and uses a piezoelectric actuator. This is a, um, a, a sort of tethered form of it uh, where basically we've got the robot uh, attached to a, um, a fixed base. We're using a fiber optic sensor here to um, measure feedback from the, uh, the actuator, measure the displacement of the actuator. And we set up the same feedback loop um, so that we wanted to see if we could generate um, delayed stretch activated uh, actuation in this robot itself. Um, what you'll see in a second here is we're going to use a vortex gun to uh, trigger the um, instability and cause wing needs to, to um, start oscillating. And you kind of see this going and it's, it's maybe not that impressive when you see it in, in real time because it's just a blur. Um, but I can show you from above here um, what this video looks like and what you'll see is that a little vortex ring is going to come in. Uh, it's going to excite uh, this wing to start moving. I hope this is playing okay. Um, and the wing will start oscillating back and forth. And here are two plots where um, either our uh, feedback uh, strength of the delayed stretch activation is too small, in which case the perturbations die out. And if it's large enough, then you excite your um, wing beat uh, oscillations. The amplitude is quite low here. Um, and the, there's some issues with the wing pitch um, that uh, we're working to resolve. But we thought this was um, you know, sort of first proof of principle that uh, this simple um, emulated delayed stretch activating response emulated DSA um, is enough to provide um, uh, actuation for flapping wing robots. Um, and so in summary, uh, we think that these kinds of um, uh, DSA based um, actuation or, or asynchronous actuation of flapping wing robots has some nice adaptive re responses, um, either ch to changing changes of the body mechanics uh, over time or um, responses through collisions or changes in the kind of environmental physics uh, that the, the wings are interacting with. And looking forward, um, you know, there's a couple things that we want to do. Um, the, the first is this delayed stretch activated response that we're emulating through Simulink. Um, it, it's actually incredibly simple as a second order low pass filter and, and should just um, be able to be realized completely through just discrete components, just, uh, you know, resistors and capacitors um, set up as a, as a filter system. And so this, this very simple, um, this very simple electrical circuit might be enough when coupled back to the piezoelectric actuation um, to generate oscillations without any of the um, without any of the sort of microcontrollers that are typically used um, to generate either sinusoidal um, oscillations or, or even these kind of signaling driven feedback oscillations that we explored through our experiments. Um, so we think this is kind of a, a nice avenue for um, for moving forward with these uh, asynchronous uh, robots. Um, and the second is is um, how better to integrate strain sensing into um, into the actuators. Um, Previously, we explored putting um, strain sensors um, on the side of the piezoelectric actuators, these passive um, PZT plates that can sense strain. Um, that, that it's, it's kind of problematic because then you, you carry around a little bit of extra weight. Um, fabricating these things is, is a little bit challenging. Um, more recently, we've been working with called um, concomitant uh, strain rate sensing. Um, this is from a, a paper published back in 2018. Um, effectively, you just measure the, the back EMF, the self-generated voltage from uh, from PZT. It's not a real back EMF, but it's sort of analogous to it. It's, it's a velocity dependent uh, voltage. And here are some um, observations here showing that we can do really good um, uh, measurement of the strain through this concomitant sensing, which is pink here. Um, blue is comparing with the fiber optic um, sensing. So at different frequencies, we can actually do a pretty good job of measuring this uh, uh, concomitant sensing. Um, when we actually do this on a, on a robot, it works a little bit worse. This, the blue and pink are comparing it um, when we have uh, wings that are oscillating back and forth. Um, but um, overall, what we have demonstrated is that we can generate um, 
concomitant based delayed stretch activation. These are um, just plots uh, showing R3 on the X axis here and the, the feedback strength mu showing that as you go up in the space, um, the, the plots here are just the position and velocity, so the limit cycle of the um, emergent oscillations. Um, so looking forward, uh, you know, we're very interested in questions of control and stability uh, for these systems. Um, there's lots of uh, challenges associated with how do you actually control a flapping wing that is now being driven through this, this um, DSA process. Um, and um, how do we integrate synchronous and asynchronous modes of control through these systems? Um, looking at the clock, I think I'm just about at time. So I want to just um, stop and say um, th thank you to uh, uh, my collaborators and, uh, and to my group. Um, and I think James might be in the audience who uh, I'm sure can answer questions, but I'm also happy to answer questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for this very nice talk. So I would like to introduce the, the last speaker of today, um, Kumar Gupta uh, of University of Southern California in the Department and Mechanical uh, Department, uh, Aerospace and Mechanical Department, sorry. So the title of the talk is called Increasing Maneuver Maneuverability of Flapping Wing Aerial Vehicles. I see you already shared the screen. So thank you for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, great. Just want to confirm that you can hear me OK. We uh, try again, sorry. Uh, just want to confirm that you can hear me OK. Yeah, we do hear you. OK. Uh, it sounds good, so I'm going to get going then. Uh, so, so thank you for inviting me uh, to this workshop. This has been a really fascinating day with so many interesting and exciting presentations. So my presentation is going to mostly focus on bird scale flapping wing uh, platforms. And I will largely talk about maneuverability type of issues. And I also a little bit touch upon energy harvesting part of it. So the work uh, is collaborative work with Professor Hugh Brook. Uh, and the student who worked on it is John Gerdes, Alex Holness, uh, Ariel uh, Perez Rosado, and Luke Roberts. This work was done when I was at University of Maryland. I moved to University of Southern California a few years ago. So we started working in the field of uh, flapping wing uh, platforms in 2005. And 2007, we had built a, uh, basically the first platform, which was 9.7 gram, excluding batteries, which had a wing span of about 34.3 centimeter. And the key there was that rather than using a Two crank type of mechanism. We had a single compliant mechanism which was able to move both the wings. Then we got into exploring basically passive wing folding using the same slightly scaled up version of that platform and that weighed 29.9 gram. And we demonstrated uh, in 2008 that uh, passive wing folding indeed offers uh, benefits. And after that, we, we scaled uh, to slightly larger platform and which weighed 38 uh, gram, and that had capability of taking 33 gram payload. And in that case, uh, we basically created a multi-material uh, compliant drive mechanism where we were using basically soft and hard material combination to create this entire drive mechanism as a monolithic piece. And we were able to fly with that in 2010. So all of these explorations that we had basically had limitations that wings were driven basically by a single motor. And that meant that you could control the flapping frequency, but you could not, you know, basically control uh, each wing's amplitude or, or drive them independently. So in around 2010, 2011, we decided to go in a different direction. So we decided at that time to start exploring 
how can we drive each wings independently as opposed to uh, driving them using a single motor? And I'm going to show you a video of a five generation of platform that I we have built. And these platform series is called Robo Raven because these are Raven scale uh, platforms. And after this video, I will dig deeper into each of these platforms and tell you a little bit about what happened for those platforms. So the first platform that we had was called Robo Raven. This was our first platform. Each wing was driven by independent uh, servo motor. And, uh, and that way we could do interesting things with it. And then we did a lot of modeling and simulation work to optimize uh, that platform. And we were able to do interesting things. Then we got into energy harvesting by integrating solar cell wings uh, into the wings. And that enabled us to basically harvest energy and uh, fly with that. Uh, after our exploration in basically energy harvesting, we started some effort in autonomous flight where we were basically flying with autopilot and we were able to do interesting type of dive maneuvers, backflips. So I will discuss those things in a few minutes. And uh, finally, we were interested in exploring uh, how can we provide performance boost to these platforms because, because of you know uh, limitations of our ability to convert energy into flapping motion by you know the type of actuator we can actually use in flight today. There are inherent limitations. So if you want to give your perform you know a boost to your platform, then there are certain other tricks that you may want to think about using. So let's begin with the Robo Raven 1 platform. So in this case, we were driving each wing by a servo, which was directly driving each of the wings. And that meant that we could you know, basically control the position and velocity of each wing independently. Uh, vehicle weight in this case was you know, 291 grams that we flew, it could fly for four minutes, 45 seconds. We had first flight in April uh, 2013 with that platform, and we used lots of 3D printing technology to create complex lightweight structural member, which enabled us to basically do interesting things. Now, when you compare this platform with the Raven, it roughly matches uh, the size. Uh, of course, weight wise, we are significantly uh, smaller, but we flap at the same roughly the same frequency, our size scales are similar, but our wings are fundamentally different. Our body weight is uh, quite different. Now, with, with this platform, then we could start exploring lots of new things that we now could do, uh, which included very aggressive uh, aerobatics maneuvers, including diving, uh, you know, backflips, button hook turns, all, all kind of exciting things. So let's begin our story there. So first, what we did was that in order for us to start studying what can be done with this particular platform, we decided to basically build a modeling and simulation infrastructure so that we could uh, look at different components, see how they interact, and what kind of performance uh, these things can produce. So we begin with basically modeling and simulation work. Now, obviously, if you're doing design space exploration, high fidelity simulation for every component and studying their interaction is not possible. So our intention in this case was try to use as simple as possible basically modeling and simulation infrastructure, and then try to see what kind of thing can be replicated, what can we predict using that. So idea here was to look at servo motor, see how they behave, because again, we are using lightweight servo motor uh, often when you start pushing the limits of performance, then you know, you start having all sorts of unexpected behavior. 
batteries themselves once you start drawing too much you know current from them all kind of things start happening and then wings themselves since we were using membrane wings they exhibit significant twists and turns so all of these complex interactions in the end affect the performance and that uh, tells you what design is feasible what design is not feasible and also how long can you fly with that particular platform so we began basically by servo motor model because we were using servo motors to drive each of the wings so we began with the steady state uh, characterization as to what happens with that particular servo motor as you start loading it up and as you start pushing the limits of uh, this particular performance and then you start looking into you know dynamic characterization because in this case because of flapping motion you know there's a lot of dynamics involved and uh, there will be you know significant acceleration deceleration the gear train is going to face so again now we have to build the model try to see how much power will be needed to get this thing done and also in this case uh, you would have significant losses in your uh, gear train of the motor and if you don't account for it uh, then obviously you're going to be uh, undersizing your platform and you're not going to get the performance out of it and you will not be able to even get the amplitude or, or flapping that you are looking for it. So we found that we were used, losing about 17.7% you know, type of performance. So our modeling revealed that and we were able to then account for it. Then we got into modeling in detail the battery, what, what is happening with the battery. So again, voltage drops due to high discharge rates. We had to account for you know charge capacity derating as we were you know using this battery open circuit voltage changes happening you know what the battery's transient behavior was both at the, the smaller time scale and the very fast time scale so all of it then tells you what battery can do what battery can support and after how many cycles servo motor behavior will be fundamentally different because if you want to have a sustained flight, you want to make sure that your battery can also, uh, you know, behave up to that time. Because after that, you know, once the battery is not behaving, you're not going to have a good flight. So then we got into coupled wing and motor modeling. So now you have to see, you understand how motor is going to behave. And based upon this motor characteristic, you want to see what kind of motion the wings can produce if you have that particular mo motor. Now, if you assume a, that motor is doing sinusoidal uh, motion, uh, you're going to get dramatic errors. So once you start accounting for what motor is capable of, then you can do much, much better prediction of what wings actually are going to do, what kind of motion wings are going to perform. So again, by accounting for all the motor coupling with the wings, we were able to significantly improve our prediction. And then you can see that as motors start being saturated, we were able to very accurately track what the wing motions were actually uh, versus what we were predicting. So our prediction were very good compared to basically commanded motion uh, to the motor. Now, wings themselves are going through a significant deformation in this case. So we have to then start accounting for that, you know, how wings themselves are going to be uh, bending and twisting. So we had to build a model for that. We have to see how all this is going to happen. So once we accounted for all those phenomena of how wings themselves are going to be deforming and therefore what kind of impact it's going to have in terms of uh, force generation, then we were able to use relatively simple models to calibrate them appropriately by accounting for all the wing deformations. And using that, then we were able to you know, do a significantly better job uh, in terms of predicting lift, thrust, uh, power consumption, uh, what torque we'll need average, what the wing uh, plunge velocity would be. So, Basically, our coupled model, once we accounted for the motor, the battery characteristics, and uh, what kind of deformations wings were having, 
then we manage to produce results with our relatively simple models, uh, which were matching well with what we were seeing actually in flight. So that then enabled us to start, you know, trying out different system configurations, certain rings with certain uh, batteries, uh, and then just try to see what's feasible. So in this case, everything above that line is feasible. Then we could predict what the endurance. So this is actual endurance. Now, if you don't account for things correctly, you will significantly poorly predict the endurance, but we were able to do a you know, pretty good job in predicting the endurance. And this allows you to then, you know, basically screen different wing designs and select the one which are going to work. So using all that tool, we were able to then, you know, figure it out what battery, motor, wing combination perform best. Then we moved on to basically integrating solar cells. These are all flexible solar cells. So on the membrane wings, you are basically uh, putting these solar, flexible solar cells on. And we were interested in putting solar cells on the wings, the body, and the tail. So there's a benefit of putting, you know, solar cells onto the body because that's where, uh, you know, you're not moving it and therefore you consistently see the solar light. And of course, tail itself, you can, by integrating wing, I mean, solar cells on it, uh, you can make it a little bit stiffer. You can remove some spots. So there are different configurations we tried. And in the end, there were certain configurations which performed significantly better than the others. And this was the uh, winning design in the end. I'm going to just quickly show a slide uh, of that particular uh, design. So let me just see if I can speed it up a little bit. Okay. So we were able to uh, fly that with that configuration. Now, remember, we were just harvesting energy. So this platform needs about 37 watts to fly. We could produce with those solar cells in the condition in Maryland in the middle of day about 10.8 watts. But the solar cell that we were using is 5 to 6% efficient. Now, if you were using a 20% efficient solar cell, then we could fly so what we were doing is that we were just charging the battery with the solar cells and then flying. Now we have done some experiments with other highly efficient solar cells, but we have not done any flights with that. We have done bench tests, but those solar cells tend to be quite expensive. And we didn't want to risk them flying and crashing the platform. So then moving on to basically our work on autonomous uh, flight and aerobatics, uh, so let's begin with dive maneuver. So in this case, we are interested in uh, basically demonstrating that these platforms can do controlled dives. So the idea is that you basically flap, then you hold a particular dihedral angle. And by holding the dihedral angle, you can basically control the rate of descent for the platform. Uh, again, we begin with some relatively simple model because this is not flapping during flight. And then we conducted a whole bunch of tests uh, by you know, performing manually triggered dives. And from that, we saw that how the data fitted the very simple model versus what we were observing in flight. We were getting reasonable performance. Uh, and then we built a complete system to perform autonomous dives. So we were able to then, you know, use different dihedral angle and perform uh, dives with that. And this is just showing you trace of uh, different uh, dives that we managed to do. And then we were able to basically do some interesting experiment where if you found something interesting and you had an onboard camera on the platform, so you could figure it out at what point I need to initiate the dive at what dihedral angle so I can take, you know, reasonably good quality image uh, from uh, that location. So we did a whole variety of interesting experiments. Another thing that we can do, considering that we are driving each wing uh, with the servo motors, we can also initiate basically backflips. Uh, so in this case, we have to augment the, our tail 
to make it two degree of freedom. Most of our flight tests are done with the one degree of freedom uh, tail. So in this case, we had to attach a little rudder or to the tail to stabilize the performance. And then we were able to actually go ahead and uh, you know, basically uh, trigger uh, backflips in this, in this platform. Now, final thing that I want to quickly cover is this idea about uh, incorporating more traditional uh, way of flight. Now, those of you who are physically at Ikra, you are seeing some interesting legged platform where people are doing rugged, uh, you know, basically navigation with legged platform, but then they have also augmented them with the wheel. So we had a similar idea, you know, basically in 2015, where we wanted to basically do a prop assist. So the here the idea was that can we augment the bio-inspired uh, flapping propulsion by just providing a very small prop at the back so they can do some momentary thrust boost when we needed it. So we took two props, we put them on basically, you know, uh, adjustable arms. So you can arm again, driven by servos, you can position the prop, prop location. Now the question was that would the flapping and uh, this uh, thrust generation by propellers will start creating cross effects or not? So we measured individual components and overall their combined performance, it turns out, we were losing about 7% of thrust generation capabilities. The interaction was not at all uh, severe. Now, as long as you, you position those props correctly with respect to the body, you get very, very good and uh, you know, reasonably steady performance. Uh, so now Rover even one basically, uh, you know, doesn't have a short payload capacity, but Rover even five, if you operate nonstop at 80% propeller power, you can actually, you know, uh, have a significant amount of payload capacity. So in this case, we demonstrated that coupling is not happening. Uh, there is not significant sensitivity to prop locations and we were having a significant gains. Uh, so this is just a that flight footage which shows you this platform in action, uh, whereby putting this tiny prop at the back, uh, you know, performance of this platform is, you know, dramatically uh, boosted, basically. So you could generate those burst of thrust and then you can basically do fairly interesting and aggressive maneuvering, you know, using this type of platform. Right, and you can fly with the payload. So this was just a fun experiment where they put the entire search light on it and they wanted to take the search light and the light time fly with that just to show all the extra payload capacity that we were having. Another interesting thing that we were able to do is that, uh, you know, take off. So in this case, thrust boost, you know, gives you an ability to do, uh, you know, take off uh, from a vehicle, basically. So that's another interesting thing we were able to demonstrate. And finally, we started exploring inertial control. So here the idea is that if you can put the battery uh, on a linear, using a linear actuator, can you break this platform during flight? And we had some very interesting uh, results with that. And we were able to actually uh, break uh, very, very effectively doing this inertial control by changing the center of gravity. So, so in uh, conclusion, we have developed unique capabilities to combine design, modeling, and simulation, and manufacturing to realize novel bio-inspired robot concept. We used all kind of 3D printing and deposit processing to make our uh, different parts for our platform. Uh, independent wing flapping and control enables new capabilities. We have demonstrated that in dive, backflips, and other type of maneuvers. 
Simplified simulation models can provide useful insight during design. And bio-inspired platform, unlike let's say quad rotor, since we have large surfaces, they offer an opportunity to harvest energy and we should exploit that. And I believe that hybrid propulsion where we can you know, exploit traditional mode of flight or flapping wing flight uh, offers new capability and, and worth exploring more. <coughs> So here's a list of our papers. If you want to see any of these work, I'll be happy to share it with you. And here are videos also, lots of all the things that I demonstrated. I'd like to thank, you know, uh, Army, uh, Air Force, and NSF for funding part of this work. So I would like to conclude there and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Kumar, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, is there time for a question? <laughs> a very small question. Yeah, Anibal, please. Yeah. Okay, I hope that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you well now. Okay, thank you. So, first, I would like to thank for your nice talk, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Now, my question is related to the, to the hybrid, the Robo Raven 5. Mm -hmm. So, I was wondering if, um, if I understood well in the paper, you are using both. At the same time, so that means the flapping and the propeller activated together with the flapping. Or that's correct. You, that's correct. Yeah, or you are using alternatively one and the other. So we have been using basically uh, flapping and prop together during most of our flight. When we do some aerobatics maneuvers such as dive, or we do you know, let's say backflip, that's the time when we are only relying on props. That's where we're not using wings in the current configuration right now, where we are not flapping. We stop flat flapping and we just use the prop. This is what is what I understood from your paper. Now my question is we did alternatively use of the flapping and the and the propeller in the same platform. Uh, I hope to find better uh, results with the propellers. But uh, we have in the same platform significantly more power consumption. Is the same in your case? So, yeah, I mean, of course, if you're going to use both mode, it significantly increases power. But uh, so the way we designed our system, props alone will not be able to fly the platform. So we have on purpose selected props which are significantly underpowered. Yeah. Yeah, understood because you use both in combination. Okay, I just was wondering about the comparison of the flapping with the with the propeller, but uh, yeah, so it's just to confirm some prediction, some some data that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And if you have more details, we can chat offline. We can set up a call and we can go over. Okay. Thanks again. Hey, then in this afternoon we we make a break now we align with the with the break the drinks and the food outside and we reconvene in, in half an hour at 45 for a for a brief uh, final discussion all together so welcome back let's conclude uh, this workshop with a with a very last part uh, which will be this uh, hybrid fun discussion 50% virtual, 50% uh, physical. Yeah, precisely, actually. Three, three. We have, uh, we have uh, Stefano and Vito uh, here present uh, physically, and then uh, we have also 45 connected. Uh, David Benton, Christina Arbe, and Mario Gupta. So uh, that's, uh, I would say, that's one way to discussion uh, with respect to the stamina of this is left in this, uh, this very firm. Late afternoon of the, this last day of this conference. Um, so, we, I really enjoyed uh, the workshop. We had some, some really amazing talks. I really think that if someone was wondering where we are in, in the in understanding the challenges of, of loving flight and the, uh, and the models that are being used to, to develop novel designs in this respect, this was the place to be today. So, 
Uh, I'd like to hear some uh, some discussion and some opinion. For the moment, I I would like to start with the with general question and uh, and hope in another evolution of the discussion. Uh, what I'm wondering uh, is that uh, one recurrent theme that came out of the of, of the talks was was for sure this, um, the role of uh, of biology, you know, of observing nature uh, and taking inspiration in design of of, uh, of new mechanisms. For example, in, in animal talks, I, I was uh, I was impressed by the number of different designs that uh, that you that you came up with in your lab. And I'm wondering what is the primal driving force when you when you come up with a new design? What is, is it uh, is it pure intuition? Does it come from experience? Does it come from observing? Uh, nature, or is it like uh, more driven by uh, making some simplified models by simulation? If we could elaborate on this aspect. Okay, uh, I would say that in a broad sense, we have science and engineering. Science means that you want to know, you observe and you want to know deeper, you want to observe this observation, you want to extract conclusions, but from the engineering point of view, you want to apply these concepts in such a way that if you have new machines, this machine eventually you can apply this machine. But we have both. We have the science because we want to know, we want to know how is how is the behavior, and then from this behavior we would like to, to have some kind of machines that are inspired by this observation independently that the application of this uh, but secondly if we consider the engineering side we would like to have this machine applied so eventually you are motivated or inspired by the application we have that but we can say right now that we are more oriented to one thing this is my first later we can elaborate A uh, question uh, for David, perhaps. So, uh, really great uh, presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, yeah, at least in your presentation, it seems as if you pose a biological question, answer that, and then you, you know, implement it in a robotic system. Uh, do you think uh, that there is also, does it also happen to you? Is it such a linear process or does it also happen to you that you work with a robotic system and then get new questions on biology or perhaps insights? So yeah, that's my question. Yeah, muted, David. You're muted. <laughs> now I'm unmuted. Thanks, Guido. Uh, and also for the terrific presentation, I really enjoyed seeing what we can do with artificial intelligence these days on the wing. So um, really impressive. And uh, to try to answer your question, um, I do think in most cases, I do start with uh, understanding the biology, uh, just because I think that's a really great way of uh, thinking outside of the box. Now, when you build a robot, you always get new questions. And I, I'm quite sure you experience the same on your end. So um, yeah, I can also testify that that is a equally valid way of getting really good new ideas. But yeah, I yeah, it's probably also just partly my passion. I'm really interested in understanding how animals fly. And I think there are many aspects that we don't understand very well. So you're bound to find something. Um, yeah, and that then inspires a robot. Yeah, just just my a reflection on, on the biology issue. Of course, it's a good, uh, you know, biology, of course, inspire all the people that are in are thinking session. Uh, of course, it's the work uh, on the basis of the inspiration of the nature. But, uh, it's, it's funny because, you know, nature, I think, is, is, of course, has millions of years of evolution. So it has optimized certain tasks in certain ways. That's why you actually already look at the kind of search from a good starting point in your search for, for optimization, if you wish. And, and the question, you know, uh, you can go further and look why certain things happen and to try 
And then, so basically what I'm trying to say is you have a starting point, I think nature gives you a starting point, but then if you understand the physics well, you can from that starting point find the direction of the gradient to make it even better. That's this one, one thought to do this. Great way. Yeah. Yeah, and we also want to make a few contacts for me. Understanding is uh, essential means some kind of uh, physics. That means that we have those types to apply to learn physics to and then the certain issues. So that means that for us the physical model and I thought I might. Oh, yeah, I thought I would chime in there. I think something that is really cool about biology and is interesting to kind of keep in mind is that there are other kind of constraints acting on it, such as like runaway sexual selection, like the black widow bird, where this tail just grows to unreasonable lengths and it loses a lot of its flight performance. So I think that there are lots of interesting things to keep in mind when looking to biology for inspiration is not only kind of like a starting point, but also ways that like you've kind of gone off the path. So I think there are kind of two different aspects to look at it in that respect. I have a question for uh, for example, if you're not a biologist, but with people here uh, who know a lot, I was just wondering, you know, there are different way morphology for flying. You know, if you go from very small insects to bigger uh, um, birds, the, the morphology changes the way the, 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 the slumping is changing. And, and this, of course, relates to the mass, but bigger. A bigger uh, flying uh, animal, if you wish, has, has a bigger brain. It's, you know, I'm just puzzles about the complexity. Is there, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of literature in that. Can anybody of you comment on, on this relation? What is the difficulty versus uh, complexity of, of the mechanism or things like that? Between, uh, between uh, let's say, insects like uh, the size, the size of object that fly, you know, from small to big, so to speak. So, it could, uh, is there any biological? I think that's a great question. Um, it's also very difficult to answer, honestly. Uh, but having studied uh, both insects, birds, bats, seeds, uh, so there's also spending seeds and so on. I would say that every organism uh, is solving uh, sort of a unique challenge when it's trying to fly. There are some physical similarities, but as you're pointing to, there are differences in brain capacity. And I think what's uh, really amazing is that, you know, you might have seen this uh, recent nature paper on the smallest beetles that can fly. So they're smaller than a millimeter. You know, and they have, uh, yeah, very limited brains compared to a fruit fly, I would say. Um, and there are also parasitic wasps that are actually even smaller, so about 0.3 millimeters, and they have reduced cell sizes. So their cells are even small for what typical cell sizes are. And I think that sort of shows that along the whole scale of small insects to bigger animals, all the way up to um, the biggest birds, so to say, um, there is a gradient of complexity. And uh, yeah, I don't have a perfect answer for you. I could just say that um, there's a lot of more, a lot more research needed to really understand it. Like for the smallest insects, we know almost nothing about how they fly. If you think about the number of species, it's very large, right? So about a million species of insects have been counted, but there's estimated 10 million species. There are 10,000 bird species. So to really sort of capture the complexity out there, I think it's hard. But I do like um, this whole idea of how robotics can help us with this as well. Um, and just to get back to uh, the robotics side of things, I have a question uh, for Guido uh, regarding um, how the new payload capacity, I really liked to hear, or really enjoyed hearing that the new uh, Delphi Nimble and then the Flapper robot has even a larger payload. Like, how, how are you thinking about computational power and scaling it down to smaller and smaller masses and how is the um, new uh, available payloads um, you know perhaps enabling you to do more i think we could learn from that uh, also on the biological side yeah 
Ben, so uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so uh, we're happy with the increased uh, payload capability of, for example, this bigger drone. It makes our lives slightly more easier. Uh, in the same time, uh, I think that yeah, if you look at insects, like you said, this this example of this extremely tiny uh, uh, wasp, I think, right, parasitic wasp. Uh, that is, uh, I think, amazing, and I think there, um, yeah, you know, uh, it's like a, a body a brain co-design, and, and uh, this is going to be very hard to reach because it's like uh, even to make a custom PCB or something, it's it's very expensive, um, and so uh, in the direction in which we're working, I talked a little bit about that during the presentation, is to go to neuromorphic sensing processing. We're also looking at, uh, because of, although these small insects have small brains, they actually have many sensors. And so they have actually many hairs and uh, things like that. So this is also the direction we're working towards to, uh, yeah, we would like to cover the, the bodies of our flapping wings also with hairs. Um, this is a bit ugly, but uh, perhaps uh, it, it is very useful. I'm going to take the handbook and zoom in. Yeah, uh, just Done with yeah, no, they're still there. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, you're still there. Sorry, on our end, it seemed to be stopped. But uh, in any case, so yeah, um, we would like to uh, get very close to nature, but we have technological limitations. So that's a little bit, I think, my story here uh, towards you. So, uh, and then, for example, the first Delphi flight that flew autonomously used stereo vision. We know that insects, of course, uh, insect eyes, and these facet eyes are very different from the kinds of cameras we were using. And so we always have to be a bit in between uh, yeah, our technological limitations and, uh, yeah, and what we see in nature. I have a question. Thank you. Uh, in light of your comments about the evolution of the remote thing that was Christina that started with the with the dinosaurs, right? The thing that uh, we discussed it also. I was wondering about the evolution of the manipulation capabilities of the birds. Not flying, but manipulation capability. You study this, how was the evolution of the manipulation capability? Because I have read in some places that dinosaurs have significant manipulation capabilities are available. Yeah, um, I have not studied any other evolution outside of that specific study that I've looked at. I think that there are lots to be done. It wasn't until I started working with an evolutionary biologist who kind of pushed us in that direction and it kind of changed my outlook on how useful that could be for engineering. Um, so I, I guess my unsatisfying answer is I don't know um, anything about it, but I uh, would love to kind of keep moving in that direction. I think that there are lots of things that we could learn from how things have changed. Evolution is a little challenging because one of the things to know about birds is that the fossil record is quite poor because their bones are hollow and they get crushed so that we don't have a very strong fossil record. So it's kind of challenging to check how things have changed over time. So we can start at our final trait and say, okay, now we're seeing this, this selection at this point, but we can't say about how those selections have changed over time yet. Um, and there's definitely going to be different, you know, changes in the environment that'll shape those and how things are needed to be done. Uh, so I think there are lots of things that uh, can come together, but long story short, I don't think I actually have a good answer um, for that specific question. Thank you. In terms of evolutionary constraints, uh, one other question, because uh, uh, there's also sometimes people critical of flipping news, it's incredible, true. And then they say like, yeah, nature didn't uh, evolve the wheel or neither the propeller. And that it would be like uh, almost impossible or something. So yeah, so of course organisms, animals need to grow from single cells. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, yeah, it's perhaps a question to, to everybody. Like, is there some kind of hard evidence already that flapping wing is uh, fundamentally better than, for example, propellers uh, at, at smaller scales or you know, practical evidence? Uh, I don't know which. Are, yeah, if anybody knows. Uh, I think I can give an answer for the small scales because I've uh, studied this. At the smallest scales, um, so if you purely look aerodynamically, 
then uh, I believe propellers are more efficient. Um, what's interesting is that uh, as soon as you uh, add mechatronics into the equation, and specifically the inertia and the, and the motor, and also friction challenges, uh, then it turns out that there's a crossover point. Uh, if you're getting at the scale of a fruit fly, then actually uh, flapping as a complete solution, so looking at the aeromechanics, not just the aerodynamics, uh, turns out to be more efficient. Um, and that just has to do with friction, uh, for example, uh, for example, really limiting uh, uh, small motors and also the high RPM you're going to get for small uh, motors uh, that, yeah, basically make uh, spinning uh, less and less effective. But if you purely look at the aerodynamics at the smallest scale for hovering flight, um, yeah, I basically measured that flapping is going to be less effective. There's other benefits to it. Um, I would say we don't know as well for uh, flight at larger scales. I, I would like to see more research before I would say anything definite on it. And well, <clears throat> hooking up to this question, because it's something that's puzzled me since related to what I asked before. You know, uh, it looks like uh, small insects, uh, you know, they create this draft and, you know, and they try to create a lift by a draft and they don't use the Kind of transition to the fact that you have bigger wings and you can glide somehow partially. So it looks to me, you know, that the bird, uh, uh, you know, creates the thrust in a certain way and then uses it, the big wings to compensate the lift, right? So and, and it looks like that there is a, 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 there must be a kind of tipping point from size, and I think it's related to what you said, David from small uh, uh, organisms to bigger organisms when that takes place. Um, is that a relation between when that happens, mass-like or, or volume-like, related to the muscle structure of, of the organism? Is there research in that respect? Because do you see what I'm saying, uh, Christina or David? Yeah, from the uh, robotics perspective, I think the answer is pretty clear. I think from the uh, sort of biomechanical or biological perspective, it's more difficult to answer because, um, for example, the efficiency of uh, skeletal muscles like those are, that are used in flight, the way that is estimated, uh, and I'm using the word estimated here, um, it is so indirect and has so many issues that I think we still struggle a little bit with really truly understanding the overall efficiency. Um, also, if you look at, for example, at oxygen measurements in flying birds, um, if you want to back calculate that into aerodynamic efficiency, it's difficult. If you would like to measure it directly, it's quite challenging. You could use flow measurements. That's what people have been using uh, and trying to get at it. But still, just because there's so much going on with wing inertia, with the aer complex aerodynamics and um, lots of losses that you have in experimental settings with motors, etc., I think it's, it's not entirely clear. And, and on the animal side, it's really hard. And on the robotic side, I feel we are closer to answering it, but still challenging. I really like the experiment where flapping was compared to propeller-driven flights. Uh, <laughs> that was that was a great experiment, um, and that's what I can add to it. And you know, maybe someone else can add something to it as well. After that, I would like to say a little bit about the manipulation because I think there uh, is a nice answer to that question. Um, I was going to pop in just quick then before the manipulation is um, one of the things my focus so far has been in gliding flight. So I feel a little bit like an imposter here. I don't actually know too much about flapping flight, but when I was starting to look into kind of comparing UAVs and uh, birds, a lot of things that in the aerospace industry, people would say things like, oh, birds are so much more efficient. And I just felt like, did anyone ever show that? Was that ever actually something we checked that they are so clearly aerodynamically more efficient? Um, and I did this whole review and basically found that at the larger scales, um, the reliable bird measurements, because there are some um, ways to estimate um, using some, some pretty basic drag measurements that easily um, under predict drag, um, 
basically the reliable bird measurements at best say that birds are about equivalent to some of our best UAVs. And we actually had UAVs that were outperforming the aerodynamic efficiency in gliding flight. But as you cross over into some kind of the subcritical uh, Reynolds number ranges, um, we started to see that there were just not as many fixed wing UAVs because we start to transition into kind of the flat wing flight. So I think that there are these like interesting crossover points where like biology can answer and extend ranges that we traditionally work within. But um, yeah, I definitely would be interested to hear what David has to say about the, the manipulation given I don't know too much about it. Okay, yeah, thanks. Well, um, one thing to add is that if you look at the overall efficiency, the aerodynamic part, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I've also read your paper with great interest. Um, so if you look at the overall efficiency, the interesting thing is that uh, it's really difficult to get a good engine and energy source to work well. And then if you look at the entire system, I, it's surprising how good muscles are, um, and especially at the scales of birds, bats, and insects. So I think that's one remarkable, you know, observation uh, to keep in mind there. But aerodynamically, yes, I would say there exist point designs uh, that are super efficient in engineering. And uh, yeah, I think your review very nicely highlights that. And then on the manipulation, I wanted to quickly say that it would be worthwhile looking into the literature um, of uh, New Caledonian crows because they actually evolved a big a shape that has been specifically adapted for manipulation. You might know that they're uh, the most advanced avian tool users out there, equivalent to uh, chimpanzees in terms of like, you know, if you think about what they can do with their tools, the manufacturing of tools. So they actually, you know, they um, uh, uh, start off with twigs and then they can fabricate hooks uh, to get, uh, uh, yeah, small worm-like, uh, uh, foods, protein food sources. Uh, and you've probably seen this online, but it turns out that the big shape has evolved for this. So the new Caledonian crow and the Hawaiian crow, which is also suspected to be able to do this uh, because of observations in San Diego Zoo, um, they both have super straight beaks for manipulation, but all the other crow species, for example, have more curved beaks. And that's just one example where I think uh, there's really good research on the evolution of, um, yeah, adaptations that enable manipulation, very sophisticated manipulation. So that's my recommendation to look into the literature. So one comment that I would like to make about, you know, uh, comparing, uh, you know, propellers versus flapping wing, the wing shape also matter quite a bit and, and clearly, if we are going to do membrane style wings and then we are going to put props on it, I mean, they are not going to perform very well because in that case, you know, basically, uh, if you just stop flapping and if you have membrane style wing, I mean, your performance is going to be really, really lousy. I mean, in order for you to get better performance out of prop, you got to keep flapping the wing because the dynamic wing shape basically you know, kind of enhances your aerodynamic flip. So, so it's very difficult for that experiment to be done where you can fairly compare for a given set of wings, basically performance of, you know, either keeping the propellers on or off or just flapping alone. I mean, so it just becomes a little bit tricky and fairly to compare the two things basically. Now, if you are looking at wings where wing themselves as a result of flapping, their shape is not changing at all, which seems kind of difficult <laughs> to, to find that. Then such a fair comparison can be done, but then props will win, hands down, because if you're going to be now, wings are not optimized for flapping, then it's just going to be not useful at that point, right? So that's where the trick comes in, basically, right? So doing a fair comparison is, is hard. Yes, I agree. And I also think still some research is needed because of that well, to really show it. Absolutely. No, no, I mean, definitely topic worth exploring. I was just pointing out challenges because when we were doing this hybrid propulsion kind of flight, those were the challenges, right? Where propellers will perform much better if you keep flapping the wings. Propellers performance is not going to be that good if you stop flapping, basically, right? So, so there, there is a, you know, kind of, I think this can be pretty long easily. Well, it's, it's, it's I mean, can be calculated because I mean, the, 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 if you do an energy balance about the energy you put in, 
the, the, the sheer dissipation of the ambient fluid, the, the inflow and outflow, I mean, that can be, can be calculated. Is there any study on, uh, on this? To, to, to be, should be pretty clear that in certain size, I would say that, you know, fuck the fly in general is much more efficient than propellers because the sheer, it seems to me that there would be much more dissipation on, on, on the propeller, but that has never been, there's no study that does that analytically. Well, uh, for flying animals, the best study on this, I think, comes from, comes from Brown in terms of aerodynamics and uh, also some uh, in Lunds. But uh, so on the animal side, it's hard. Uh, now on the robotic side, you could, of course, do a lot more. And I do believe there are a couple of studies that compare this. But I think the fair point that we heard early in discussion is how do you make a really good comparison? And I think that is sort of the challenge that people yeah. make uh, claims. But I don't think it's very easy to be convinced either way before a really good comparison has been made. So may, yeah, maybe maybe it's something we could do. Would be for even you know certain uh, uh, mass and surface maybe to you know they have to equalize things to be comparing others, right? So you could say you know you take two, two, two um, a way of locomotion, constant same inflow, flow, uh, same mass, same surface moving. And then you define how the surface should be moving in order to optimize the the propulsion to compensate the lift, the, the, the lift, and, and then the thrust to move forward. I mean, that, that should could be done and would be interesting. Yeah. Just to complete my information about the experiment with the flapping and, and the fish wing with the propeller, I would like to repeat that originally the idea was to uh, like the hybrid. I mentioned before, so the combination, but uh, because we really had a very well tuned flapping, uh, then just putting the propeller, I agree that this is not a very fair comparison, but then should be taken carefully. But in any case, a strong difference between the flapping and the, and the propeller just uh, surprised me because I think that was not so evident, and then it's just a comment. But in any case, I would like to say that for me, it's not just because we obtain this number, it's the, it can be demonstrated that this is more efficient because the design, of course, the design, it was designed as a flap, and then you put the propeller. Imagine that you have, imagine that you have a fixed wing and you want to flap, no way. So, I mean, it's not a fair comparison. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That was the point I was trying to make. That wing designs are optimized differently for a different kind of propulsion mode, basically. Right? So the small edition that was the science robotics article by from Singapore, where they also did a direct comparison between their flapping and you know, different types of propellers. So it's, yeah, there. I mean, I think one of the main questions is yeah, how do you make the comparison be fair, basically, what you already said. Yeah, but I, I think you could do that, right? Because you could. Yeah. Suppose you, you consider, uh, so you, have a, you, you could consider the same mass, for example, the same inflow, a defined surface of the, of, the, uh, of the surface which moves in the flow in order to create propulsion. In that case, it would be a propeller, it would be a wing, right? You could consider, in principle, uh, a certain deformability that you can give to the surface. And that is a power balance. You say, okay, then this surface can change by applying a certain power to this, and then you will see how much of this power is dissipated, and how much of this power is basically creating uh, uh, an effective work for for the for the propulsion. I mean, it can be done, I think, and uh, something that it's never been done. Something certainly is think about. Yeah, I do and think people have made the. It will depend, you know, this constant mass, constant volume of things. Of course, there will be uh, the results will be different depending uh, uh, what the value of that constant thing is, and that is actually related again to this insect versus birds, because I think that there is something there that that could give you the kind of interesting. Yes, and finally, the way to make this a fair comparison. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's a key aspect of it.
with our models, we can then use a supercomputer and do the search space of this. It makes me wonder, though, as someone who isn't as familiar with flopping flight, if if you're doing this kind of comparison one to one, if you were to instead just optimize for the best possible propeller with for that mass compared to the best possible flapping design for that mass, is then that the you know the, the an interesting comparison there to say like as you could of the best of the best, which would kind of do better. So I I don't know if that's even a relevant thought, but. <laughs> Yeah, but then you, you see it, you have again, you have again the issue related to how flapping is, is you know, what is flapping? You know, flapping is moving periodic motion, and you could do it as inside do, or you could do it as bird do. It's very different how you you you, you move it from it. And, and, and so, and what is a propeller? Well, you know, it's a periodic motion, you kind of turn around. I'm exaggerating, of course, we, we see the difference between the propeller and the flapping wing, but uh, you know, to get the points through, it's, it's how you define the, 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 the range space you actually can look in the two classes. It's kind of, it's not so clear. Mm -hmm. Would like to find the optimal. Yeah, exactly. I really would like to compare the optimal uh, designs, but I think one of the problems we have for this, uh, I mean, not for the theory, I think that would be very interesting, but for the practical systems is that yeah, flapping wing mechanisms are much less developed as well than uh, you know the, the yeah motors and propellers. So uh, that's where yeah you know you also get into trouble. Let's say, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, I think it's super interesting. So yeah. I think Federico wanted to. <laughs> no, no. I, actually, I uh, <laughs> I wanted to do another question, but uh, but maybe we are all tired. Uh, yeah, well, there are questions. Perhaps in the audience, yeah, so as well. Yeah. Old, but, uh, it is on its own. Yeah. Thanks. So, thanks for all the nice presentations today. Uh, I think you've all shown very nice parts of, of robotic flight. We've seen morphing wings, flapping wings, uh, uh, perching, landing, stability. Um, what's, in your opinion, required to bring all these things together in one platform, like one robotic platform which combines all the separate aspects that you're all studying? And this is the objective of this. We should do. <laughs> uh, I, I think Griffin could work because it's a little bigger platform. Uh, on a small scale, like uh, I was saying, in the break, we're working on airflow sensors, which uh, hopefully will be some items. But you know, adding that airflow sensor. And, and we had added a few other things to the nimble, it gets so heavy. And so there's really many challenges also in terms of design. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, how could you incorporate all these things in the body so that it's like multifunctional? Uh, and, you know, that's what you would love, right? So that uh, you don't yeah, add a gripper and add this and add that, and then your system becomes heavier. So I think at a very small scale, there's a huge challenge there. I think Griffin, I think you could do it to, to, to integrate it. And this may lead the way also for the smaller systems. Yeah, so for example, repeat, please repeat. Yeah, the question was uh, multifunctionality. So the way to go could be to have elements serving multiple purposes. Yes, it's a little bit that I think, as for example, now the body of the downfire is a car and bronze. It's basically that way, and it's only there for structure. But uh, what if you know uh, and the body also serves for lift or for sensing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have all the answers, but uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, one way to go. Let's say. But, uh, yeah. Before going to the next question, just just comment. My opinion, I think the, the biggest challenge in, in, in general for robotics, not just for, for flapping flight. Is, is the actuation technology. So sensing, we can do sensing very small, but we cannot convert power in a very efficient way in the proper uh, dimensions and ways to the power ratio. I think that is the biggest challenge in robotics in general. And, and you know, we, we see it in every, every device. Once we, we, we need to make a, a step uh, completely different to go out, even if they're like, you know, mechanical stuff, uh, but I think that we'll need a step at a certain point to get out of this. But I, I don't know. Next. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's the course. Is this one working now? Can you hear the speaker and able to put that? No, no, that just yeah, that does does make the question here. Yeah. Yeah, um, earlier in the discussion, we were talking about how we uh, have a difference between scientists and engineers, where scientists are trying to discover what is out there, and engineers are trying to find applications. And my mind was wondering, was wondering for the context of this, for us to do good science, we need to get the measurements. And for measuring birds, I guess my question is if you could have any wish in terms of being able to instrument birds and birds in the wind tunnel. Or having some kind of a UAV that can follow birds around with a high definition pair of cameras to record. What, what would that look like for you if we're trying to capture data? As to my question to Christina earlier, um, we don't know exactly how the birds use their wings, so we do know the actual weirder space with them. What would that look like in the future? Or what would be your dream for being able to truly instrument some of those things in the future? Um, yeah, if I'm to hop in here, um, I think there's some really cool work going on, not to mention just the people around here in terms of the robotics. A lot of panelists are people I look up to a lot, but there is a lot of cool work going on, especially in the UK. So Richard Bonfrey's lab, they have this amazing setup where they fly these birds through this photogrammetry system and can recreate their shapes. And I think that that's something that's just it's taken them so long to get going and I know they're still kind of playing with it and there's going to be a lot of cool findings that come out of that kind of technology. Um, I think that also like Graham Taylor out at Oxford has some really cool work going on. And I think that's more and more as this field kind of, you know, there's more and more people in it that we're going to be able to develop technologies that allow us to understand what birds are doing um, in the natural environment, because a lot of it is still a very, um, lab-based environment. Um, and I think that there's so much that we can learn from these different levels. Personally, um, I really like the way that photogrammetry is going. And I think that there's some really cool things. I would love to hear more from like some computer vision people about how we can really, you know, when you're looking, watching a bird fly with your own eyes, you're like, okay, it's doing that thing, obviously. But then you tell a computer to do that. It's much more challenging to back out whether or not it was rolling or what it was doing. It's hard to programmatically back that kind of information out. Um, I think that there are just so many different tools and that they all kind of need to come together. I also really like to highlight that we there doesn't need to be this clear divide between the scientist and the engineer. And I think David is someone that I've looked up to from the start of my career, because I don't think that that needs to be like this hard divide. Um, and I think that there is a lot that we can learn by making sure that we're asking kind of hypothesis driven questions to kind of get at these questions together. Um, so I don't know, that's kind of my rambling response to that. I'd like to add something to that. So what we define for science, eh? because that's a, you know, science, experimental science is about experiments. So you can do very good science without the measurement. You have to validate the science by the measurements. So I think that at what level do you want to work? Because if you want to, to measure from nature, you need to be able to measure. If you want to study the physics, you know the law of physics, you can use it in order to predict the things. Okay, so it's, it depends on what level you would like to try to, to, to tackle the problem, right? And, and one will lead the other eventually. But you can, you know, the science in this field can go from uh, the very basic physics of fluid dynamics up to the you know, very experimental measurements of biology. biology. So it's very promising. One small comment related to the experimentation of the animals yes be careful because there is, there is also the robot ethics you cannot test with animal as you would like to test there's another question from the audience please I think you are. Uh, so my question would be like uh, from the science perspective, uh, it's more like a guidance for the engineer. So um, in your case, what would be your perspective of optimizing like, the design of the frequency of, for example, like flipping the wings or in the shape of the wings? Because from the engineering side, like we would love to do the you know, testing of these experiments all the time and to collect all the data. But from like, science, we like to get some like, guidance. Um, with the optimization, without 
too many troubles to take care of this. If you want to optimize the really model, okay, the question is how precise you want to model. If your model is precise, you will get better results in the search. Well, of course, the, the search will not be complex most of the time, so that's another problem, obviously. So it's a trade off, right? So the precise, more precise the model will be, the longer it will take to optimize. Uh, but you will need the model. And I think that the level of details of the model will dictate your, your results. You might be used. So I want to add something. Yeah, I, I can add something. I think uh, a real challenge uh, is that the search space is so large that it's difficult to prove you've uh, obtained a, a sort of like an optimum or something. Uh, if you wouldn't, yeah, basically um, uh, not apply any principles that are more analytical, for example. So it's very difficult to just have a purely experimental approach. Uh, I think it's difficult to really understand how it works. Um, and I also think that it's very difficult, for example, to just have a purely engineering approach because then we would still be stuck. Um, yeah, basically with what we found works well from an engineering perspective, which is very stiff wings. It's like a fuselage that looks like a tube, right? Um, and highly optimized wings for transonic flight, for example. Uh, you know, like I think the aerospace engineering is super advanced in terms of what we can do with flight, but it also locks us in because basically, um, yeah, I remember when I um, uh, did my master's in Delft um, and I was the first person in the aerodynamics lab really doing unsteady aerodynamics of, of wings where they were flapping and stuff like with CFD and unsteady was considered really new at that time. Whereas, like, if you want to understand anything flying in nature, you know, and study is really important, and study flow. And it turns out, when I was reading into all of this, uh, it was the biologists who were much further ahead of the curve. So they were doing more complicated problems because they were trying to really understand how animals fly. So I think, like, this, like, division, especially in this field, but in general, the division between science and engineering is quite dangerous because it can get you pigeonholed in. Whereas if you just consider it all research, you know, and it's, you can learn from all sides. And also keep in mind that all the biologists who are making measurements will need engineering techniques. But also if you develop engineering techniques without understanding any science, um, yeah, what is the guarantee that you're going to come up with the right technique to answer really interesting questions? You're going to let it a little bit more of a gamble, you know, over time where people pick up the technology and figure things out. I think when there's a better integration, um, it's easier to make an advance. But that's sort of my perspective. Uh, I, I like that. And then going back to what you said before, I think what, what you say is, of course, the problem, the search space I mentioned, right? It's very big, but I think... It's really, infinite in theory. Say, uh, what? In theory, it's infinite. Yeah, of course, it's infinite. There's other fields, and this one is even more complicated. This is uh, where I have mentioned. So, but I think... I believe that biology in this search space will give you the point to start searching from. And if you get a good models of the physics, then you can look around that point. Because that's you know what, what happens, I think, correctly in evolution, right? So you have a certain situation, the change will not very likely be drastical from one moment to the other. And the search will evolve sometimes a bit farther than the points you are, but in that way, at least you can confine the search space. So it would be a really synergy between the biology and, and the physics and the engineering. Yeah, I, I think also one challenge that. is the other. Oh, go ahead, Christina, please. Sorry, David. Um, I, I think you should probably finish, and then I have a no, slightly no. side thought. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, I think one of the cool things that you brought up that aerospace engineering has been very stuck in this, you know, too. Maybe we have a double bubble. That's kind of fun in the blended wing. That's getting exciting. Um, but I think that something that flapping wing and this whole field can bring into aerospace engineering as a whole is this focus on maneuverability because we haven't really designed our aircraft to be as maneuverable as possible. That's not a goal. The goal is to reduce our efficiency. I mean, <laughs> the exact opposite, increase our efficiency and reduce the cost of these aircraft. So I think that that's why they've kind of, you know, 
come to some optimum that's really working and can has developed that thing. But I think that this field has so much potential because now there's this this goal of the constraint of improving our maneuverability. And I think that that's going to lead to some of these really unique designs that you guys are already making. So I think that there's a lot of potential in that respect as well. We'll go to an iPhone one day with a floppy pen. <laughs> <laughs> Halo, Halo. <laughs> Okay, um, are there other comments or questions? Otherwise, I think the situation is mature enough to, to close this, uh, this kind of discussion. And um, I really wish to thank all the speakers again. <laughs> It's been a very nice day, a long day, and uh, we hope that uh, that maybe next year we can do a separate workshop on flooding light with the uh, with new uh, with new advancement. But yeah, we have the uh, comments. Uh, no? Just a comment. I think I, I really enjoyed the workshop. I think we should try to keep the the community uh, uh, together, uh, and maybe next year also reorganize it. And let's keep in touch because I think that you know it's a small community, but they're, they're doing the, we're doing the coolest things. So <laughs> thanks again, and uh, have a nice uh, evening, night, whatever you are in the world. And uh, um, then uh, we will meet. Uh, we'll keep in touch and meet uh, hopefully next year for a new workshop. Thank you. Thank you.